Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Badger Dow has attracted some serious attention following a 16% spike in its price and volume gains of well over 60%. That is before it tanked even further. But first of all, what is Badger Dow and why has it fallen so far from its February high last year? Hey, and thanks for tuning in. Holly Shields here for Calcoin Media. Badger Dow aims to build products that simplify the use of Bitcoin as collateral across all other blockchains. Functioning primarily as a DAO, that is, decentralized autonomous organization, Badger gives users the ability to vote on the governance of the token. And through a basket of multiple DeFi products, it can make Bitcoin a usable asset throughout the blockchain network. Last year in November, Badger Dow was struck by hackers who made off with 120 million US dollars in cryptocurrency. And so many investors have lost their money in the process, which according to security company PeckShield, accounted for at least 2,100 bitcoins and 151 Ethereum tokens. So why is Badger Dow unique? Powered by the Ethereum blockchain network, it's driven by two main products. Set and Dig. As a community-driven project, SET or SEWT is primarily a DeFi aggregator which acts as a flash loan mitigator by tokening BTC. Through this, users can earn yield and token yield farmers can deposit their respective BTC in the SET vault and earn 0.5% profit to cover the transaction costs. Whereas DIG or DIGG is a non-custodial synthetic Bitcoin on Ethereum blockchain that's pegged to the price of BTC with a flexible supply and a rebase function. Its main goal is to remove centralized third parties. So is Badger Dow a good investment? Well, last week it enjoyed an impressive volume spike as it zoomed by 68%. However, it took another nosedive yet again not long after. This Dow has been on a downward trajectory since its all-time high in February of 2021, so it'll take more than a little spike to lift it back up. What's your take on Badger Dow? Let us know in the comments, and as always, check out some of our other videos to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Calcoin Media. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV.
Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV. Shares of global mega players like Apple, Microsoft and Tesla gave whopping returns in 2021. That's no mean feat at a time when every nation and its respective economy have been reeling from the pandemic. The S&P 500 index gave about 27% returns in 2021, while the S&P TSX Composite Index, which tracks large cap companies listed in Canada, gave nearly 22% in returns, its best in 12 years. But with the incessant waves of COVID variants and cases, investors have to wonder how will it affect the equity market in 2022. Hey, and thanks for tuning in. Holly Shields here for Calpain Media. First of all, it's important to note that the rise of retail investors across the globe from the US to Canada fueled the equity market rally. Thanks to online zero commission brokerages like Robinhood and Bitbuy, a small investor with just a few dollars can invest in stocks. And these few dollars make a handsome amount of money in the overall market. So COVID or no COVID, the retail investor class is bullish on stocks. And when they learn about the gains of the S&P 500 and TSX Composite plus individual stocks, they tend to only increase their bets. Second, several governments are doing all they can to infuse liquidity into the economy by policy actions like the CARES Act and the CEWS. Plus, central banks have supported them by keeping policy rates low to encourage borrowing and spending. There's a reason why the housing markets in all economies, including Canada, are so hot. Low mortgage rates and pandemic savings. So can a rate hike dent sentiments? Well, there might be a slight correction in the market, but in the broader perspective, the resurgence of COVID and sporadic lockdowns here and there may not upset the market. One, there is enough liquidity in the stock market thanks to the retail investor rush. And two, rate hikes, even if they come, would not be steep enough to dent investors' interests. Another thing to remember is that it's important to understand not all sectors rise or fall or have movements in the same proportion at any given time. The returns of even large cap companies can be in the negative territory over a given period. But all in all, considering the current trends and the way the global stock market quickly regained from the sudden pandemic shock in early 2020, our long-term outlook is optimistic. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other videos to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Calcain Media. Has your week hit you for six? Barely had time to breathe, let alone throw a flick pass? Well, don't worry, Cowkind has all your sporting action covered. Each episode, I'll bring you the biggest sports news of the week. Exclusive interviews with athletes, sports commentators, and journalists. Plus, we'll also look at the finances off the field from new broadcast deals, sports commercial partnerships, and more with sports business. So for a sports show that tackles all the big issues, ball and all, Join me, James Preston, for Game On, every Friday, exclusive to Calcine TV. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calcine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV.
Australia has begun a critical public discourse about its post-pandemic recovery regarding its immigration policies. The program was effectively paused for the last year and a half, which has now resulted in the need to double the skilled migration program. Since the pandemic, migration to Australia has fallen due to widespread strict travel bans and border closures. It's expected to loosen them up this year. A recent finding by the KPMG has suggested a massive increase in foreign workers could help boost Australia's economy, which raises the question of whether or not Australia needs more immigrants. Australian immigration has been at its lowest since World War II due to the pandemic restrictions. And in November last year, the federal government announced important visa changes in order to retain highly skilled migrants in critical sectors. These changes majorly prioritise skilled migrants and international students entering Australia. Businesses have been grappling with a severe shortage of workers. Due to this, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry is now calling to near double the skilled migration programme to secure the nation's economic pathway. They have been pushing for 200,000 skilled migrant visas to be issued each year. The step has been taken to return to the pre-pandemic average. However, experts have suggested that the nation will require at least 2 million new residents to meet labour shortages over the next five years. Many manufacturers and exporters are waiting for a definitive signal around borders and re-engaging with the world. The government is now planning to craft a long-term plan for immigration that will keep adding both the economic benefits and the positive social outcomes from diverse societies. So what do you think? Does Australia need more immigrants? You can comment here. You can also subscribe to our channel. You can press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel signing off for Kalki Media. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. Welcome to the Expert Talks by Kalkine TV. I'm Sage, and in today's episode, we have a special guest, Mr. Simon Harmer. He's a founder of Thursday. And Thursday for the Curious is a design studio that this creative entrepreneur has imagined, and Thursday is a multidisciplinary agency consisting of branding, digital, graphic designing, and much more, which aims to create clarity for brands and businesses from the strategizing right through to the digital implementation. So keep watching to find out more. And excited to bring you live today, Mr. Simon Harmer, founder of Thursday. Welcome to the show, Simon. Hey, Sage. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And it's only Tuesday, so we're in for a bonus treat here <laughs> to find out all about Thursday two days before. So, Simon, you've been in the creative industry for about 20 years. Your opinions are obviously going to be valuable for today's show. How has the branding and designing industry transformed throughout these two decades? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I suppose in, in many respects, not a lot has changed because fundamentally, good design, good branding um, will always be the same uh, and they'll always have value. Uh, I suppose when I look back, over those 20 years, you'd say the biggest change has been digitization. It's been the internet. It's, you know, when I talk to my kids now and tell them that 20 years ago, the internet wasn't really much, uh, mobile phones weren't really around, they find it hard to believe. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, so I, I guess fundamentally for us, from a design point of view, it's more about how audiences interact with the brand now. It's uh, everything is digital. So back in the day, 
uh, when we started, uh, we were designing not necessarily for screens or mobile phones, and that's changed dramatically. And I think the way audiences now uh, interact with brands, if you look at the biggest brands in the world, you know, the Facebooks, the Googles, the Amazons, they're digital first brands. So that's been the biggest change for us, I think, fundamentally. But at its heart, branding and design is, is you know, it, it will always be fundamentally the same. It's the reason that, you know, some brands have been around for, well, Coca-Cola is what, 125 years old now and it's still going strong. It's amazing, isn't it? It's just selling that idea to people that the brand will give you what you need. Thank you for sharing that, Simon. Yeah. And I think one of, the, one of the big changes was especially the ratio of a television. We're in 4K now, I think, and before it was 4x3 and all these sorts of changes have happened, including the internet as well. So running a business is, you know, not easy at the best of times. It's a 24-hour job, really, <laughs> getting something off the ground. So how can innovating and branding and strategizing help businesses to excel in a saturated market to optimally add value? Yeah, it's a good question. I, and I think that's probably what I've spent my entire career trying to convince people of is that um, fundamentally design and brand at its heart will add value. Um, and obviously, I'm going to say that as a creative and as a, a design studio founder. But luckily, there's lots of good research there to back me up. Uh, there's a wonderful company organization in the States called the DMI, the Design Management Institute. And they did this fantastic survey over a 10 year period. Uh, where they tracked what they call design-centric com uh, companies, companies that use design at their heart, and they, they monitored them against the, uh, the, 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 the top 500 companies in, in America. And they found they outperformed them by over 200% which is phenomenal. And uh, in, in this country, we, we have a wonderful organization called the Design Council, who are always championing design. And they'll tell you that for every uh, pound you spend on design, you'll get 20 pound back. So I'm always telling clients, if you've got 100,000 pounds to spend on design, we can guarantee we'll get 2 million back in revenue. <laughs> so we know that fundamentally at its heart, design adds real value. That That's the key thing, I think. And what you really want from brand particularly is something that's unique and it's compelling for your audience so i think by using trusting a process and understanding what your audience wants and needs and then making sure that your brand connects and resonates with that audience in a meaningful way will really add value so trust it at its heart that's fantastic to hear about the government incentivizing design like that that's great it really does give you purpose to do your job well and keep uh, England as a cutting edge leader in the design sector. So the B2B ecosystem is ever expanding as we know. Please share your insights on how one or a business can enhance their B2B marketing skills if you don't mind. Yeah, well, it's, it's really interesting, Sage, because um, the, the world of design and creativity that I've been in for 20 years gets ve is very closely aligned with marketing. Um, but I suppose the one thing I always talk to audiences about is that I'm not a marketing expert per se. I, I, I suppose my expertise is in creativity and design. But I, what I have known and what I've seen over the last 20 years is I've worked with marketers. They're, they're our key audience here. So we typically work with marketing directors, with marketing managers and brand managers. And I think what I've seen in those 20 years is some traits that um, I think really add value, if you like, to that person's role. So the people that seem to do really well in their roles are people that firstly, fundamentally, they understand their own brand, they understand how it works, and they understand their marketplace. So uh, the, the sector they're in, but also what their competitors are up to. And the key thing there is they really, really understand their audiences. So they've spoken to them, they, they connect with them regularly and they understand what they need. That's the first thing. The second thing we always think here is it's about trust. So developing a really strong relationship with your agency or your internal team. The best work that we ever produce is with marketers who really trust us as the experts in design and we trust them to know their marketplace. So that's the other thing. I think there's a, to have a real desire to grow and to learn is really important, probably in any industry or in any role. So people are always striving to learn more, to grow, to read, to watch wonderful shows like yours and, and connect with other people in that ecosphere so they're doing more. And finally, once they understand that, it's about sharing that knowledge with others and helping others to grow as well. So those, I think, are the kind of key principles if you're looking to do really well in marketing. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for breaking it down in a nutshell. Now, I understand you're in Winchester and that's close to London, but it's not exactly in London. Is that correct? 
Yeah, not too far, uh, less than an hour away. Lovely. And so coming from a city or a ge geographical location like that, how does branding and design um, change? Like, do you feel that to create value that you do need to find a way to link the future prospects with the traditions of a place and so people can have something to bond them to values and, and the creation of culture through branding? Yeah, I think um, place is really interesting. It's something that we've been thinking about a lot here from a brand point of view that a lot of people look to London as the, the as the kind of hub for finance, for design and creativity. Mm. Um, but we're one of the things that we're keen to do here at Thursday and have been for a long time is to, to really put Thursday on the map as a, a kind of centre for excellence for design, design thinking and creativity. Uh, so that's really important. And I think, you know, I suppose branding at its heart needs to do that uh, and it would be great if we could rebrand Winchester at some point and, uh, and put that on the map but yeah so um, I think place is important um, but yeah we're, we're a relatively small country compared to you guys so um, you know what's what's probably a trip up the road to London for you is it, it, it could be a bit of a trek for some people. Mm, true well thank you so much for sharing that question aside from the discussion back to the mainline discussion branding and design can be subjective at times so Thursday how do you ensure that meaning that you provide while branding for the clients whole significance for your target audience please yeah it's a great question Sage I, I, I think the thing I always come back to and this is quite hard for me because I'm a creative by heart I trained as an illustrator is is process that's the key thing uh, you've got to trust the process you've got to find a process that really works we use a very strong design thinking process here a kind of double diamond process and you know we always talk about the idea that creativity and creatives can kind of be a bit wacky and they go off and it's all right brain stuff and you know coming up with loads of ideas what process does is it kind of hones that in and it gives it real purpose particularly from an audience point of view so what you'll find is that a really strong branding process at its, at its beginning will do lots of insight and research. It will talk to the audiences, it will look at competitors, it will look at the marketplace and it will really understand that first before we then come in on a, on a position, a strong and unique positioning for that brand. So, you know, we might take Calkine and we'll say, okay, what is it about Calkine that's unique? What are all the competitors saying? We'll talk to your audiences and then we'll create this very unique positioning and it's not until that point that we then let the creatives go on it that's when they can do their magic so we know then that everything they're creating is founded in this insight and in this positioning so it has this really strong foundation really strong roots so then when you get to those areas around subjectivity which you can do you know inevitably and there'll be somebody in the boardroom who says but I don't even like orange why are we doing this orange and we can go back and say well at its heart, you know, th this brand is all about energy and warmth and, you know, connectivity. And, and so orange does feel like the right color in that incident, instant, instance. So as long as we have that really strong foundation of insight and discovery and then a really strong brand position, we know that we can kind of hone in that subjectivity and we know that it's relevant to the audience. That's, that's the key thing, I think, instead of just going straight into creative. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. So setting up your boundaries and limits, but based on evidential data and what your clients' needs and wants exactly. are, I suppose. Yeah, that's yeah, fantastic. Thank insight. you for breaking it down for us. So we have to wind up, unfortunately, although we're having a fantastic time having a chat to you today, Simon. Lastly, what are the plans for Thursday? What's in the pipeline for 2022? Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. We could uh, keep talking, but it, it's getting quite late here now, so they'll probably kick me out soon. <laughs> uh, 2022. Well, do you know, it's been a, it's been a strange couple of years uh, in the UK and, and everywhere, obviously, and the industry as well as a whole. Uh, I have regular uh, monthly meetings with lots of agency owners in the UK, and for some people, it's been very difficult. Um, and, and for some people, you know, particularly the digital agencies, they've really excelled. We do brand and digital here, so we've had a bit of both. I think for us, it's about um, one of the key things is, again, focusing on Winchester, putting Winchester on the map as a center of uh, creative excellence. It's about continuing to doing amazing work for brilliant clients. We have really strong relationships with our clients here. And it's about positivity, I think. I think, you know, we've come out of this pandemic now. Um, let's use design for good. It has uh, such wonderful ways of adding value. Let's see if we can do that all over the world and for all of our clients and all of our staff. And I think also what we're really keen to do is really start to think about key things like sustainability and what design can do to solve problems like that as well.
Fantastic. What a great way to close off the discussion. Thank you for your time today, Simon. Really appreciate it. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. And if you just joined us, we had an inspiring discussion with Mr. Simon Harmer, the founder of Thursday, a design studio in the UK. Catch the full interview via YouTube at Calkine Media. And keep watching Calkine for more live expert talks and market updates. Stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Hello, I'm James Preston and welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. And in this episode, I'll be shining a light on Palladium One Mining Incorporated, a company that is focused on discovering environmentally and socially conscious metals for green transportation. With projects across Europe and North America, Palladium One has a large breadth of operations and to take us through every part of the company's activities is the President and CEO of Palladium One, Derek Wayroach. Derek, welcome to Calkine. Oh, thank you very much. Good to be speaking with you, James. Likewise. Derek, let's start very simply. Palladium is perhaps not the most well-known metal. What is it used for and why is it considered to be a socially conscious metal? Well, currently it's used predominantly in the automotive sector to attenuate the harmful effects of uh, exhaust from internal combustion engines. So it's used in the, uh, the catalytic converter along with uh, uh, rhodium and some other PG elements, but mainly on the gas side of the engine, whereas uh, if you have a diesel engine, you predominantly have uh, platinum at play. Absolutely. Now let's focus on Palladium One itself. What is the company's overall goal? It's really to supply uh, metals to allow for uh, net zero emissions. So our metal suite includes the uh, platinum group metals, nickel, copper, as well as cobalt. And we hit every stream of the, uh, the clean transportation theme, whether that be the battery metal complex for the electric vehicle that we're familiar with, the, the emerging fuel cell vehicle, which we're seeing uh, increased traction on in the, uh, the commercial sector, mm -hmm. and obviously fundamentally the, uh, the internal combustion engine for the uh, current use of uh, palladium. Now, one big development recently in the U.S. is obviously President Joe Biden announcing the Build Back Better campaign and the bill being pushed through the Senate there. That's obviously opened up a lot of opportunities in terms of the green space and looking towards a, a much greener future with around about 50 percent of cars and emissions being uh, all electric vehicles by 2030 and then obviously 2050 looking to really cut through that net carbon neutrality proponent. Uh, does that present a really big opportunity for you at Palladium One? Well, it definitely does. Like palladium right now in the PGs are in, in strong demand and there's actually pre-COVID been a uh, quite a number of years, about eight years of deficit of, uh, of supply. And it's a market that is very constrained from increasing supply to meet the incremental demands from uh, tightening and tightening uh, air quality emission standards. But, um, you know, we see ourselves being very well positioned given, you know, we're not going to be snapping our finger and moving over to a fully electric vehicle for some period of time. There's going to be a transition mm -hmm. and we're already already seeing that in the market with the hybrid vehicles. So the, um, the, the long term play here, I think, is uh, is very good and the fundamentals are strong for the PGEs. And as we end up going to the pure electric vehicles, certainly the, the hybrids will roll off at some point in time, decades in the, in the future. 
but the PGEs, which is the dominant uh, commodity in terms of our metal suite right now, uh, naturally fit into the hydrogen uh, fuel cell vehicle. Let's so we think this is one of key projects, namely Cow Cow. Can you bring us up to date with the developments there? Well, our key project is the Latina Calisma or LK project in north central Finland. We have existing 2.2 million ounces of palladium equivalent resources, and that's made up of palladium, platinum, gold, nickel, copper, and uh, and some cobalt as well. We had a fairly significant discovery back in uh, August of 2020. We spent uh, the time since then uh, doing resource definition drilling and we anticipate uh, bringing out a new resource in Q1 of 2022, which ought to be uh, significantly uh, larger than we, what we have currently. The existing resource at the Kakua area covers about one kilometer of strike, and we have um, expanded the, uh, the drilling there to the south and then farther to the east with mineralization over a five kilometer strike length. But our focus in terms of the, uh, the upcoming resource will really be on an additional three kilometers of strike. And Derek, what about the Tyco Copper Nickel project in Canada? Oh yeah, that, that's gotten a lot of attention. We had a, a fantastic discovery there in mm -hmm. uh, December of last year, you know, award-winning uh, grades, basically 10% copper nickel at surface. We've just announced some results earlier this week. We've extended the mineralization over 430 meters of strike length from surface. And uh, we have number of new anomalies, multi-line electromagnetic anomalies that we uh, have also done uh, soil surveys over. And uh, those results came out this week and are showing some very elevated values of both uh, copper, cobalt and, uh, and nickel in these new zones. So not only do we have this you know, fantastically high grade discovery, we also have uh, you know, significant uh, potential to, uh, to add some other zones. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned there some of those anomalies that you're testing at the moment. How do you see those developing in the coming months? The, the first and foremost priority for us right now is actually getting drill permits. So we, <laughs> uh, when we had the discovery of the, uh, the anomalies, we applied for our permits. So we're in a bit of a waiting game there. But we are, we are anticipating having all our permits by the end of the year. And then we immediately look at uh, coordinating with the drill contractors to start uh, drilling as, as soon as, uh, as possible thereafter. And how likely do you because think it is that you will be able to obtain more permits before the year's end? Oh, we, we, we're quite comfortable that we should have it, but obviously, you know, you always hedge your bets. So instead of applying for one master permit to cover an absolutely huge uh, piece of property, <laughs> we broke it down into uh, four different applications. So as long as we get one of them by year end, we're good to get going. And, uh, you know, but we still believe we should have them all uh, by year end. Now, I know there's a lot of developments, obviously, under the Palladium uh, masthead, so to speak. But let's change gears a little here and take a look at the Smoke Lake development. Is there anything exciting happening in that space? Well, Smoke Lake is actually the zone where we have that, uh, that high grade discovery. So that is the uh, the focal point for uh, for everybody, and you know it, it's a difficult story to tell because we have had such great success there. We're building out the uh, the ounces, while we have this very early stage project. It's twenty five thousand hectares in size in total. We've got these additional zones that are incredibly compelling, especially supported by the the soils that we just uh, announced this week, and we have numerous single line anomalies to uh, to chase as well. So. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot going on in this project, but I, you know, I do caution, it is a little bit earlier stage, but you know, what we really like about this project is you know, we're not rehashing an old sulfide nickel project. This is new discovery, new territory, and um, that's part and parcel of what the, uh, the market, I think, appreciates with, uh, with what we're doing. Well, let's talk about the market overall then. How do you see the palladium market at present? And do you think the commodity prices will go up, go down? What's the short term and the long term viewpoint for palladium? Yeah, I think we're in a very volatile period. You know, since I got involved with this company, the palladium price went from about $1,200 per ounce up to $3,000 an ounce. It wow. remains more valuable than, uh, than gold. But what has happened is that uh, we've had this chip shortage globally that's affected auto sales, which therefore has affected uh, the material spot prices, which in turn is affecting exploration companies such as ourselves. So 
you know, our share price was uh, well outperforming uh, all of our peers on the market and uh, for the last four or five months has uh, slipped back as a result of this uh, decline in the spot price which you know although you know different timings it, it, it naturally affects uh, the optics of, uh, of an exploration stage company so uh, I, but I think long term fundamentally we're in a very good spot the uh, chip shortage is going to get rectified maybe it's the end of 2022 or so but because there is so little capacity for existing mines to add supply to the market, given that 90% of mine supply is as a byproduct of other mining activities, mm. um, you know, that bodes well. As soon as there's a rebound, I would anticipate seeing a, a very nice rebound in the spot price, which hopefully translates into uh, the underlying share price. Well, look, you mentioned a correction there in terms of the palladium market itself and having overperformed for a period of time. What can we expect in terms of performance from Palladium One over the coming months and where would you like the company to be in about a year from now? Well, obviously a lot higher in terms of share price than where we are now, but the uh, you know the, the real key here for us is in Finland is getting the, uh, the resource out. That's going to be a major catalyst that occurs in, in Q1 and it's going to be supported by a very advanced metallurgical program as well. So what we're really trying to do is de-risk the, uh, the project from a, um, from a technical perspective in order to uh, make it that much more compelling to uh, potential investors. But naturally with this new resource and if it ends up being what we, uh, we think it's going to be, internally at this point we will then be moving into a, a formalized a preliminary economic assessment in order to give the market uh, a better means to or another means to value the company as opposed to just ascribing a you know, fixed dollar value per in situ ounce that will be able to uh, present a, a DCF model. And um, you know, in Canada, it's just a matter of keep working at the, uh, the exploration, uh, doing the, uh, the drilling on these new zones and hopefully uh, you know, we had uh, two, uh, two very interesting discoveries um, over the course of the last 18 months and hopefully we get a couple more over the course of the next 18 months as well. Well, Derek, been great to chat with you so far. Is there any final thoughts you'd like to leave with our viewers and your investors? Well, I think, you know, just stay tuned to the, uh, to the space. You know, this is a, a di more difficult market to invest in because these polymetallic deposits are not as commonplace as, for example, uh, gold projects. But uh, we see lots of opportunity here given the structural complexities of the market, lack of supply and, and fundamental demand. Derek, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much. It was great talking to you, James. You too. That's Derek Wayroach, the President and CEO of Palladium One. And if you missed any part of that interview, all you have to do is head across to the YouTube channel, Kalkai Media, and also make sure you give us a subscription there so you can stay up to date with every single exclusive interview that we do conduct. I'm James Preston reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkai. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm speaking with Sophie Westlake. Sophie is the CEO of Verossal, Australia's first TGA approved COVID killing disinfectant. Here at Calkheim, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Hi there, Sophie. It's great to speak with you today. Lovely to speak with you. Thank you for having me. Good. Now, first of all, Sophie, could you tell me about the initial creation of Verosol and where the inspiration came from to produce such a product? 
Sure. So, look, I'm just a mum, uh, lives in the country, and I've got four kids and a husband who I wanted to try and keep safer during the pandemic. Uh, so in the beginning of 2020, when we first went into lockdown, I started researching frantically. I have a uh, background in science, and <laughs> like, like most people, I relied on Google quite heavily and um, was knee-deep night and day in research papers trying to understand what is a coronavirus and how do I keep kill it and, and what can I use, what sort of products can I use uh, to keep my family safer at home and uh, in the car and at work. Well, you've created such a fantastic business story and how did you discover mm -hmm. that it did work against COVID-19? Well, one of the things that I was adamant about was looking for ingredients that we had longevity in the marketplace that already had history uh, in di different markets. Uh, so our main ingredient, main active ingredient has been around for over 30 years. So I was confident that that would be able to be used um, as part of the unique formula that we created. Um, most importantly, uh, I needed to make sure that it was non-flammable and um, was safe to use in the home. So. With that um, intent, uh, after several months, I was able to um, find a formula that, that would work, that was unique, and we worked hand in hand with Eurofins uh, at Bio Laboratory up in Silverwater in Sydney to do extensive testing over many months uh, prior to getting TGA approval. Excellent. And you mentioned TGA approval there. How important was it to your business to get Therapeutic Goods Administration approval through? It's absolutely essential. Uh, the TGA pro provides a vital role here in Australia in creating confidence in the marketplace that if a product uh, makes a claim that it is genuine and that you can rely on that authenticity. So we were not able to, um, for example, create a disinfectant claim that it killed COVID without getting that tick of approval. And that tick of approval means a series of tests and processes and protocols to follow. It uh, normally takes around 12 months to get uh, approval from the TGA and then uh, subsequently listed on the ARTG. Uh, we managed to fast track that within several months, which uh, was no mean feat considering we weren't a, a large manufacturing company by far a pharmaceutical company or by a pharma company of any sort. So we were just uh, mum and dad and four kids who said, hey, let's just um, give this a go. Now, if we could just briefly talk about financials here, how much does it retail for? Where can you find it? And how are sales currently going? So we do our best to keep the price as low as possible. So it retails at $9.95 uh, with discounts for uh, six packs, etc. Um, we we were determined to make sure that our product um, fitted in well with people's everyday cleaning products. So it looks just like your standard spray bottle that you would use in your kitchen. It's the same size, it's a 750 mil size. So um, we tried very hard to make it easy to use as well. So I said to my husband, well, what would make you actually clean the house? And he said, uh, well, I just want to spray it, leave it and walk away. So that's the beauty of Virusol. Uh, it looks just like a typical cleaning product. It feels comfortable to people. That's one of the reasons why I think people love using it as well as um, is so easy to use just spray and walk away. And how important was it you, for you to keep the production of it in Australia? Oh, that's absolutely essential. So we were able to obtain um, Australian-made certification, both Australian-made and Australian-owned. So that's really important to us that we um, have a product that we're not reliant on the logistics and supply chains from other countries where we've all discovered that um, with lockdowns etc there, there can be disruptions in supply chains so we can our, all our manufacturing is done 100 kilometers from our warehouse and obviously with the pandemic people have become very germ aware how as a mother do you believe it is difficult to keep germs out of the family home particularly with a house with lots of children running around Look, 
every mother and father knows it is not easy. <laughs> so we've up to, uh, we always take our shoes off before going in the house. So that's just a form of my laziness because I don't like to clean too much. So <laughs> if people aren't bringing in mud, there's less for me to clean. But obviously now uh, we're all have we have a heightened awareness and a need to um, be a bit more aggressive with our cleanings habits. So obviously when the kids get out of the car and get inside, the first thing they do is take their shoes off, wash their hands, etc. Um, and we use Virusol within our home all the time. It's just second nature, just to spray bags down, to spray surfaces down, etc. So we just have that added layer of protection. And obviously COVID has changed a number of businesses. Some have done well, some have crumbled. How important has COVID been to your production and your business? Well, if someone has said to me in January 2020 that I would be running a, um, a manufacturing company and producing a disinfectant, I would have obviously laughed in their face. Uh, I had no intention of doing that. My husband and I have several uh, small businesses that we run. Um, but I, I think the pandemic has brought out um, some really fantastic opportunities. And those businesses and um, companies and, and people who are able to be a bit more flexible, perhaps more agile, have really thrived. And I, the, the perfect example, of course, is um, working in offices and I think there had been a reluctance prior to the pandemic for some employers to allow people uh, because of the lockdowns and people forced to be at home and with the advent of fantastic technology to enable us to do that. I think there's been a bit of a shift in mindset with employers. So instead in the old days where we would say your worth is your 40 hours or whatever it might be, uh, your worth now is um, your productivity and what you can produce. And if you can do that in 10 minutes sitting on a beach instead of 10 hours in an office, why not? Well, wouldn't that be wonderful? That would be great. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It's such an industrious business and it's great to hear from you. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Have a lovely day. Thank you. And with that, I will sign off for today. But watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Welcome to another edition of Expert Talks by Calkine TV. I'm Sage and today's guest is Mr. Kieran Burke. He's the CEO and co-founder of Swoop Funding. And the fintech industry, you may have noticed, is expanding at a significant rate. Traditional ways of lending and borrowing are transforming. And Swoop Funding simplifies and speeds up access to loans, grants and equity funding for businesses. Not only in the UK, they also are able to help people in Australia, Canada and Ireland who are pursuing businesses, ensuring the best through their exclusive partner network for funding. And I definitely want to find out more. So bringing you live today, we have Mr. Kieran Burke, the CEO and co-founder of Swoop Funding. Welcome to the show, Kieran. Thanks very much for having me, Sage. Well, to make the most of our time together, let's get started. So in your opinion, what are the significant issues that businesses face while borrowing money through conventional institutes? And how are these issues solved by SWIP funding, please? Um, yeah, I suppose the, the reason we started SWOOP was there isn't one type of funding. And traditionally, a lot of businesses have always gone to their bank manager when it comes to funding. And recently, a lot of banks have not provided 
the same infrastructure that they once did for small businesses, where you would always have that relationship approach, where you'd have a one-to-one -one relationship with your bank manager. What the bigger banks are doing in most uh, developed countries these days is scaling back their small business offering and offering more of a one-to-many approach. As a result, lots of small business owners don't necessarily know where to go or what product is right for them when it comes to funding. And that's essentially where Swoop comes in. Because I suppose the most important thing to say up front is not every business needs funding or should go for funding. And so the first thing we like to do is under help them understand their financial position, um, understand their cash flow. And then if they do want to go for funding, understanding what the right product is and um, naturally pink people will think of a business loan as the, the first option available to them. But actually, there's a wealth of different options out there. Um, so you might consider getting equity investment from an investor or because of where you're based in the country or what sector you're in, you might be able to get a local or a government grant, uh, which can often be a lot cheaper way of investing in your business. So from our side, it's understanding what the business is, what their aspirations are, and then from there, deciding whether there is a, a right funding path. That's very interesting to find out and I can see why things might have changed over the last few years for small businesses. I think lending policies have become a little bit more conservative. So can I ask before we continue with the mainstream discussion, when did Swoop come into corporation? When did you start trading? So we launched uh, Swoop in May 2018. So we'll be four years of age in a couple of months time. Uh, we first started off in the UK and the Irish market um, before launching into the Australian market and then most recently, uh, late last year, we launched in Canada. Uh, the backdrop has definitely changed quite a bit over the last years. Um, uh, obviously, there's been a lot of access to finance options for small businesses outside of traditional banking, you've got lots of alternative finance. But with COVID coming along, um, there's been a huge wave of funding from government institutions. Um, and that has really expanded the amount of lending that's been done in all markets that we've been operating in. Um, but it's also meant it's kind of stylized innovation in some respects within the lending market because all businesses have kind of gone to the government back lending schemes and um, so we're kind of coming out of that phase at the moment so it's really interesting to see how different countries and different companies are adapting to this kind of new lending market that we're now in. That's fantastic to hear. I've noticed that there's been some crowdfunding for businesses that's become more prevalent here in Australia as well and I think uh, Austrade, our government department is starting to link up more with the UK, which is really interesting to see uh, the changes after Brexit and how Australia and the UK mm -hmm. are linking up again. So do you have anything to share on that from your perspective? Yeah, I suppose just talking into the kind of uh, trade relationships, there's been a huge opportunity for Australian businesses um, because of that trade corridor and the um, trade relationships that sparked up post Brexit. It means obviously uh, there's a lot in the agricultural space with the UK committing to take a lot of Australian agricultural produce into the market. Therefore, there are a lot of banks and lenders looking at Australian businesses in the agricultural sectors that have uh, established business operations or some sort of operation in the UK market that can fund and trade, uh, fund those trades and fund the export finance. So it's definitely a, a big area and it's a big opportunity for Australian businesses to get funding um, because the, 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 the growth that they're going to experience because of the trade. The, uh, the first kind of part of the question was around crowdfunding and that is always an interesting one. We, we see a number of businesses in business to consumer space could end the crowdfunding route as, a, as an option. Uh, the reason being, if you have a B2C style business, you're going to naturally have lots of different customers. So putting your product out on a crowdfunding platform can be appealing. Um, the downsides to going with crowdfunding uh, as a young business, uh, you're putting out all your information about your business online, so your competitors can find out all about you. Uh, plus, it can be quite expensive, um, so crowdfunding platforms will traditionally charge you kind of between six to eight percent on all the business, all, all the money that you're raising on a crowdfunding platform, and you yourself will have to bring at least thirty percent to the platform, of which that crowdfunding platform will, will charge a percent on on that. And um, so, yeah, it's definitely a growing product, and um, but has its pros and cons, but uh, 
And then, Jeff, in relation to your first question, huge amount of opportunity for Australian businesses getting funding that are doing more trading with the UK market. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. And very interesting dynamic you bring up there about the websites and competition, knowing too much about each other. That's very interesting for the young businesses especially. So you call Swoop Funding a virtual CFO to businesses. What are the other benefits of Swoop apart from easy access to loans and grants, please? Yeah, it's, it's as you allude to, the virtual CFO aspect is, as a small business owner, you might not have to have be able to afford your own uh, financial director, you might not be able to have an accountant, you have to wear many hats, so you might not be the most financially literate out there. So that's kind of where we step in and that's where we've been developing the technology behind the platform. So as a small business owner, you can come into Swoop and you can integrate your bank account using open banking, you can pull in your cloud-based accountancy software, so your Zero or your Sage or, or my, my OLB, which is pretty popular in Australia. From that, we can ascertain all the things that you're spending money on and all the things you're making money from and start to give you insights to say, hey, you might be overpaying on your energy or your insurance is up for renewal, we can get you a better deal um, or you can get a better utilities contract over here. So it's not always about bringing in money, but it can also be about making your business a better run business, uh, reducing your overhead so that when you do go for funding, your affordability ratios are much more improved, um, which is why we, we're trying to strive to be that virtual CFO to small businesses. Yeah, and that's great to hear that there are services like yours who are able to support people who are thinking about developing their ideas, especially in these times. I've noticed that you know so many small businesses are closing down, but then other people are filling the empty shops with new ideas. So there's this big mm. uh, changeover and evolution of, of the business um, diaspora in a way. But a lot of people are bootstrapping to make their ideas happen, um, which seems you know, sometimes one of the only ways. What are your findings uh, in regards to how much people have to have already in regards to savings and uh, accumulated debt? What are you finding or which businesses do you uh, see proliferating in the current economic setting and how has the pandemic affected the lending and borrowing market in your opinion? Yeah, um, obviously the amount of capital uh, a biz uh, someone might need to start up a business can completely vary depending on the type of business because some businesses aren't very capital intensive and therefore you might need to do a small production run and therefore you need to, to get the money together to get to pay for some stock. Um, we've obviously seen because of the pandemic a huge shift in retail whereby a lot of people are moving online and having e-commerce style businesses and again the overheads to creating your own website and, and buying stuff through, through online channels massively reduces the amount that you need. Um, however, at the end of the day, you're always going to need a sum of capital if you're if you're looking to start a business, test things out. Um, so there are different options that you can go down. Uh, as I mentioned, yes, there's going to be lending options in in lots of the markets that we work with. It's always important to see how the government is is encouraging startup businesses. Um, there's very often startup loan schemes that you can get access to, where you can get access up to, in some cases, maybe twenty thousand, thirty thousand um, dollars at a preferred inference rate because the government is backing that scheme. Also, important to tap into your kind of local region to see if there's any early stage startup grants to help you with capital expenditure, whether you're purchasing new equipment or purchasing new stock. Um, the other side of things is looking outside of the lending market and seeing is your is you are you available to get investment and looking for any kind of investors that might be able to back uh, your business. Um, however, if you're looking traditionally at the lending space. Uh, most banks are going to look at where you can get collateral against you. So if you are a home owner, if you have any kind of personal assets or you've kind of significant cash, then you can always raise money against those as well. Um, but plenty of options out there. It's important just to understand which one is right for you. Mm, exactly, exactly. And I suppose it also depends on what stage your business is at. I think you support people from seed right through to Series B funding. Um, mm -hmm. Are you finding that there is still support for those uh, very early stage ideas that are being ideated and incubated? Or do you think people are looking for more stable enterprises to invest in? Yeah, the great news is there's way more options than ever before for those early stage businesses that are st starting to incubate. Um, I think a big frustration for a lot of startups is 
it's very hard to get that big investor check at the very beginning because there's thousands of ideas out there. Why would an investor back you or why would a fund back you? But there's lots of other funding reads that you can use and, and get access to funding along the way. I mentioned that there's been a huge shift to online and a lot of e-commerce businesses have, have sprung up over the last like, year and a half. Um, well, there's loads of financing behind the data behind e-commerce. So if you're putting a new business online, you're utilizing something like Shopify, you can use the data behind Shopify to get access to money. So if I'm making $10,000 a month selling through Shopify, there are lenders out there that will give me one, two, or three times my average monthly takings that I can use to then go and purchase or grow my business. And then they take a clip back on my future revenues. So instead of hitting me with interest rates up front or any kind of cost of capital or diluting my business, there are kind of cash advances that you can use to look like as, a, as an early stage business um, and that allows you to grow the business and then puts you in a shape that you might be able to then get that bigger investment or that bigger loan. Um, so there's lots of different options out there. Thank you for that. And profit and loss sheets can sometimes be more complicated and taxation and things like that than we uh, initially know. And how, how do you find uh, that the institutions and the lending facilities um, are treating these sort of maybe newer people into the business arena who may not be financially literate yet? Are, are they mm -hmm. exploiting these people or do you think it's reliable and fair, the, the trade that's going on between the institutions and the businesses? Yeah, I, I think that's where we try and come in ourselves in terms of helping with the education piece because all financial institutions or investors are going to need to see financial documents. Uh, it's only natural if they're going to give money over that they understand the business and they can calculate things. But it's also equally important for the business owner to understand the numbers that they're giving them. Uh, and it's on the basis of those numbers that they're going to get accepted and rejected. So very often, Bank statements is going to be one of the most important collateral when you're going to an institution or someone for funding. So understanding what they're looking in the bank statements is important as a small business owner. They're obviously uh, going to see is there money in the bank account, but what they're also tracking are what are the ins and what are the outs, what's the average bank balance, Do, does it have any kind of trends in terms of does it peak for a couple of months, does it reduce massively for a couple of months, because what they're trying to do is predict patterns so that if they give you money, they're forecasting what is going to happen to you over a long period of time. And equally understanding the affordability in the business, should they give you a sum of capital, so they're obviously going to look into uh, the balance sheet to see if it's a solvent business. Uh, similarly, they'll look into the management accounts and dig up the P&L and see over a period of time what are the profit levels? What, what is the kind of growth around the revenue figures? So again, getting familiar with these documentation and how a bank or an investor will look at them, cut them and analyze them is really, really important for a small business owner if they're gonna look for finance. Thank you so much. Yes, just for putting that in a nutshell for us and giving us some clarity on that. It does pay to shop around, I suppose, and to read the fine print. And I suppose that's where an uh, institution or company like yours can support. And we have to wind up the discussion now, although I'm quite enjoying um, this interesting chat. So fintech is rapidly expanding, and what do you think the risks and opportunities are for the future of the sector? Um, I think there's a huge amount of opportunities in, this, in the sector in that it's hyper competitive. So the end consumer, whether they're a small business or they're an individual, they're only going to benefit. Uh, you can see, obviously, the banking sector being massively shook up by a lot of challenger banks coming in and taking away all those traditional charges that we all faced around transferring money, using foreign exchange, uh, being able to go around your day-to-day -day banking completely nearly free of charge. And the same is starting to happen in the small business space where traditionally small business owners had to pay the most expensive things when it comes to day-to-day -day banking or financial services. And FinTech is really, really shaking that up. So from an end consumer point of view, that's fantastic. And then for the FinTech companies in this space, it's encouraging them to be on their toes always being innovative, always trying to look to see what the next thing is to how they can offer a better service to their customers so that they can grow their businesses and their customer base simultaneously. So it is an incredibly exciting area to be in. Um, but the, the, the important thing was to 
from a fintech co company a perspective is to understand there's a fin and a tech uh, so that you're able to balance both what you're offering to a customer so that you can work on the human side as well as offering something from a technological point of view that's going to work. So it's always about finding those balance I find uh, where really, really good fintechs um, tend to, to, to do well. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us today. So if we did have people who were interested in your services, Kieran, how can they find you? How can they make contact with you? Um, so they can get in touch via our website, which is swoopfunding.com, or for Australia, swoopfunding.com.au, for Canada, swoopfunding.ca, or for Ireland, swoopfunding.ie. And uh, yeah, we'd be delighted to talk to any small business owner or prospective startup or small business. Uh, be delighted to chat to you. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Your insights were incredibly valuable. Thanks very much, Sage. Bye now. And if you just joined us, we had an interesting discussion with Mr. Kieran Burke. He's the COO and co-founder at Swoop Funding. And the full recording will be available at Kalkine Media's YouTube channel. Keep watching Kalkine for further live expert talks and live market updates. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Welcome to Expert Talks by Calkine TV. I'm Sage. Today's guest is Mr. Jonathan de Cateret, CEO of Bumper. And to give you some background, Bumper protects the value of their clients' crypto holdings using an innovative DeFi or decentralized finance protocol. So clients set the price they want to protect at, and if the market crashes, their assets will never fall below that price. Now importantly, if the market pumps, the asset rises too. Sounds very interesting, especially in the current market conditions that we're witnessing. So keep watching to find out more. Today's show should be very interesting. Bringing you live today, I'm excited to have Mr. Jonathan de Cateré, CEO of Bumper, a dynamic and entrepreneurial business leader. Welcome to the show, Jonathan. Hi, Sage. Thank you very much for having me. Thanks for making time to join us today, Jonathan. With your significant expertise in driving fast growth digital disruptive brands, we're keen to share your insights on the show today. So DeFi, Jonathan, has been expanding rapidly. Could you share your take on the evolution and development of the DeFi market, and in your opinion, which DeFi protocols are going to have a significant impact on the future of finance in the coming months, please? Yes, of course. Well, I think for some of your listeners out there who aren't familiar with DeFi, it stands for decentralized finance. Now, if you consider that uh, Bitcoin was created nearly uh, in 2008, so we're well over a decade there. Now, just imagine how quickly technology um, rapidly moves on in, in 10 years. And DeFi is really the cutting edge of where cryptocurrency, blockchain, and Austrian economics really collide to produce a really brand new financial system. Now, to kind of put that into context, when we first, first started looking at DeFi back in 2017, it was worth uh, about 15 million USD. We are now within that, that, that space of time up to nearly a quarter of a trillion dollars locked in DeFi protocols. And I think what, what your uh, listeners probably need to, to kind of really understand is 
What DeFi really represents is a total change of the underlying plumbing of how finance can work. It's digitally native, it's programmable, it has low latency, it has high frequency. It means money can fly around the ecosystem um, freely and at pace. And that gives rise to all types of financial instruments and structured products that we've never even conceived of in traditional finance. And to, to give you an example of that, what DeFi allows you to do is to take a stable coin, say USDC, which is pegged to the US dollar, so it's not volatile. And you can use a service that will deposit that into a savings account. And that digital dollar that you have will start accruing interest, but it will be constantly scanning around for other savings accounts that are offering improved interest rates. And if one of them comes online, it will instantly move itself across. And it may do that a few hundred times a day. And so what we are really seeing is, um, for the first time, is what happens when you make money digitally, digital? What happens when you can make it programmable? And what's the next kind of epoch that we believe is going to happen is that central banks will start to release their own digital currencies. We know that China is leaving the furor there with the digital yuan. Um, we are quite certain that other countries will um, follow close behind. And what that will lead to is all that, uh, that digital money and traditional finance will then just be sucked in to DeFi because it is just quite frankly, just more efficient and optimized and a better system um, to manage the, econo the, uh, the financial global economic systems. Sounds great. Uh, thank you so much for putting that in a nutshell for us. And theoretically, um, it does sound fantastic and it's finding the utility for this type of system and, and how it can work across industries, I think that's going to be really exciting and the next few years should really prove to be a window of opportunity for many businesses. So thanks Jonathan for that uh, insight. Now the year 2022 will observe the emergence of regulated DeFi is what we're noticing. So what exactly is it and how will it impact the current flow of the crypto world in your opinion please? Mm. Regulation and DeFi do not go hand in hand very well. Um, but the reason why DeFi works really well is because it is permissionless, which means um, that anybody can have a digital wallet and start interacting with it. And, and it's that property of DeFi that allows that high velocity, low latency property that I, I, I kind of mentioned earlier, which is the kind of key property that allows the whole thing to, to kind of operate um, so efficiently. And, and where FATF, which is the global regulatory body that advises other uh, individual country regulators, they have recent gui released some guidelines uh, a few weeks ago. But reading between the lines, you can tell that it, they are finding it extremely difficult on how to regulate um, these individual protocols. And I'll give you, for instance, um, there are protocols out there which um, are launched by founders. Some of those founders are anonymous, so all you'll have is a, a Twitter tag. Those protocols then um, see success. They grow their TBLs, which is the, the amount of money that's locked into the protocol, into the billions of dollars. And they then move across to something called a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization. And a DAO is really a community run protocol. So there's no longer a board of directors, there is no entity, there is no country, it is domiciled in. And that makes it virtually impossible for regulators to make those protocols accountable and to essentially kind of use their, their regulatory tools and instruments that they would normally um, dispatch. So we feel that really that where regulators are started to kind of concentrate on is how can they regulate the um, the money that's flowing in to crypto. So that gateway between what we call fiat, which is like just your normal dollar or yen or sterling, and when that is then transferred into cryptocurrency, that is where the regulation is coalescing because there there can be um, you know, your customer checks and anti-money laundering checks. But once it's actually within DeFi, um, we are at a bit of a loss about how regulators can meaningfully regulate that in a way that you know stops nefarious actors from participating. Exactly, exactly. I think that's what the, the regulators really 
have at the forefront of their minds, how they can protect the consumers. Um, thank you for your insights on, on DeFi regulations. So how was the impact of the pandemic and the emergence of new variants in particular um, affecting the crypto market? Interestingly, remote work seems to work uh, well with crypto businesses and DAOs, which is the way we seem to be evolving. Um, also, how do tools like your bumper help in such drastic scenarios like we're seeing at the moment? Hmm. Well, the pandemic, you know, you can kind of look back now and see a little bit of hindsight of, you know, what, the, what the, um, the consequences were. I think the first thing was that by, by its very nature, by its very design, cryptocurrency is distributed, right? It's like a kind of um, an underlying principle of cryptocurrency. So there's no single point of failure. And, and, and as a company, a cryptocurrency that has been operating, um, you know, for, before the pandemic, it, it did not affect us in any way because our, our workforce do work remotely, they are globalized. Um, we have all the tools and um, software mechanisms that, are, that allow those people to, you know, work from wherever they are. So that there was there was there was very little disruptive impact in, in terms of, you know, con compared to more centralized financial and, and other companies around the world. The second point, I think, is that the pandemic really um, obviously forced money printing around the world by central banks to rapidly increase. I think people were then stuck at home thinking about what to do with extra income that was coming in or house prices that were going up and stocks and shares that were increasing. And crypto really found a niche there within retail. And I think for the first time, it, it truly became mass market. I don't think anybody can kind of... Um, um, dissuade that viewpoint now and and I think what what that really also did then is there was it, it kind of led to a huge influx of finance which came into crypto and there was already a hardcore of what I would consider some of the smartest people I've ever encountered in my life already working in crypto who were then given um, the financial clout to really make good on their ideas and what we've seen is the emergence of um, an absolute revolution in finance. And there are protocols that are emerging every day that are really pushing the envelope of what finance can do. So um, what we're seeing is the emergence of what we call like the FANG of DeFi protocols. Um, so these are the, the they're traditionally um, companies like Compound and Aave and Maker, which are all lending and borrowing sites, but they're just pieces of software. There are no buildings there are no you know very little employees these co companies or entities typically have in the region of between 10 and 15 billion dollars locked inside them we've seen the emergence of new types of chains that can compete with ethereum that are cheaper that are faster that are more easily accessible um, and you know something like near protocol i think is one to kind of keep an eye on at the moment i know a lot of developers are really super um, excited about that and we're seeing the emergence of, of really clever protocols like Olympus DAO, which is becoming the Federal Reserve of liquidity for DeFi protocols. So I suppose the impact really of the pandemic was one that led to negligible levels of disruption, huge influxes of cash and talent that has now resulted in what we're kind of seeing as a, as a revolution in finance. Thank you so much for those tips there. Yes, new protocol, Olympus DAO, definitely ones that prick your ears up. Now, your own innovation, Bumper, sounds like a godsend, especially in times like this when there's high volatility in price. And price volatility is um, undoubtedly a hurdle with cryptos. So, in your opinion, how does Bumper fit into the whole infrastructure of these DeFi um, competitors. Could you tell us a little bit more about it? Is it a liquidity pool? In part, yes. Yeah. I think just to kind of just take a step back for a moment. Um, in traditional finance, when you consider the, the range of instruments that you can use to, to kind of protect yourself from volatility, it, it really only comes down to two tools. One is a stop loss, right, which will just kind of trade you out if the market drops at a certain point that you dictate. And that's kind of like a circuit breaker. It means if the market pumps back up again, we, you've lost out on that subsequent pump. A more sophisticated tool is an options desk, which is used widely 
by traditional finance. Now, let's put an options desk into context. It was developed 50 years ago. So we're talking about a 50 year old piece of technology that is still being brought out today to protect against volatility. And it is complex. And they have these fixed expiry windows and uh, contracts. And, and they are really inflexible as a mechanism. Now, what we did at Bumper was to look at all the innovation that's happening in DeFi and to really ask the question, can that solve the holy grail problem of volatility? And um, Bumper takes uh, just a radically innovative approach. And to give you a, a very top level view of how that kind of works is that let's say you own a Bitcoin and you saw Bitcoin go up to its all time high a few months ago, which was about, I think about 69,000 USD. And let's say at that point you had the thesis, well, I think it's going to come down. I think it's, it's a bit, it's a bit frothy. So let's say you protected the price of your Bitcoin at say 65,000 USD. If you then use bumper to protect that, as the price comes down and hits that $65,000 mark, bumper would essentially swap you into a stable coin. So that means if the price goes down, your price, your asset is, is, is kind of preserved at $65,000. But it also means if the price pumps back up again, we swap you back into Bitcoin so that if the price surges, you get all that benefit. Now, that approach gives you both benefits. It protects you from the downside, but it also allows you to benefit from any subsequent pump. Now, that's a, an oversimplified version of how Bumper works because that, that, that simplified version just doesn't work in reality because of something called slippage. Um, and, and at the heart of Bumper is we developed a near zero slippage engine that allows us to give that same level of protection. And when, when we really conceived that notion, we then took it a step further. And when you protected your Bitcoin at $65,000, we then give you a fungible token, which we call Bumper Bitcoin. Now that's a kind of slightly magical Bitcoin because it's a Bitcoin that will go up in price, but it will never go below $65,000. And you can use that to borrow um, other assets. You can use that leverage longs. Um, the, the, the array of use cases of where bumpered assets can be deployed in DeFi is something we've only just begun to understand, but it's, we think it's going to become a fundamental building block within the, uh, the DeFi ecosystem. That's fantastic to hear. Um, thanks so much for sharing that. And just wondering about your clients who are getting involved at the moment. Do you find that they are the true Austro-Libertarian economists who want to really make something out of this DeFi revolution that we're seeing? Or are they just your everyday folk, retail investors who are curious about what you do? Mm. There's, a, there's a real spread. I mean, the charge was led, I think, by um, the more kind of egalitarian retail market you know these are the early adopters these are the, the 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 people who were kind of on the edge of the tech who you kind of really kind of started to understand kind of bonded curves and where this whole technology could go um obviously as as as, as with anything that, that kind of reaches a critical mass that then started to get the attention of the the larger players in traditional finance you know the big institutions the banks the hedge funds and they have started to, um, to to pile in now. We can see finally that institutional money is now coming into crypto and it's particularly coming into DeFi because it kind of speaks their world of, of kind of yields and uh, ROI and APYs and APRs. And I think where where this will, where, where this will go, I think, is um, one of two ways, really. I think it will either be that DeFi will just eat traditional finance from the inside out, which is a thesis that I personally believe is where it will go. Or we will see the banks understanding that there is a threat and there's a risk to their current paradigm and they will buy their way in to DeFi protocols or indeed set up their own versions of it, which again, could, could, could kind of, you can kind of understand how that could kind of lead to them kind of becoming very prominent in the space. But what is undoubtedly true, I think, is that the whole global financial system is undergoing a massive transformation. And within five years, we will see that the dominance of money is in digital money, in cryptocurrency money, CBDCs. The tide is turning, turning towards that area. Yes, uh, absolutely. I, I 
completely agree with what you're saying. And it sounds like open, open banking is becoming more prevalent as well. And people are wanting to have more control of their data and uh, privacy is becoming more and more important to the consumer. So um, it seems that there's a lot going for crypto there. In your opinion, as we wind up the discussion, how does the emergence of cryptocurrency impact other businesses across the countries. You mentioned the financial institutions and it's exciting to see that they're getting more involved. It's uh, not a big surprise to hear that many of them are testing and researching blockchain and how they can incorporate that in their dealings. Uh, but also they're investing. Many big banks are investing in cryptos as well. So it'll be interesting to hear your opinions on how crypto is due to impact other businesses as the years go by. Yeah, well, let's start with the financial institutions, because um, certainly for as long as crypto had been around, they were extremely sceptical and critical of crypto. It was like the itch they just couldn't quite scratch and it wouldn't quite go away. And I think over the last 18 months, two years, I think there has been a, a kind of reluctant acceptance that, um, OK, this thing is, is here to stay. Actually, what they're doing is quite clever. And actually, if we don't kind of understand it and migrate across and incorporate then we'll become redundant dinosaurs in the new financial market. Um, I think, and I think here's a really important point to kind of make, you know, one of the things that I particularly love DeFi for is it removes that middleman. You know, we don't need a skyscraper full of hundreds of people with their salaries uh, and, and overheads in order to provide the same service because the service is provided on the blockchain by the protocol and the software and it does it faultlessly, and it does it with 100% levels of trust. Admittedly, there are some other problems that creep in, so it could be hacked and, and things like that. But what we're talking about is, is replicating quite top-heavy traditional infrastructures. Great show. Mr. Jonathan Descartes featured today, the CEO of Bumper, an innovative crypto business on Expert Talks. Please check out the full interview on YouTube via Calkine Media and keep watching for more Expert Talks and live market updates. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. A very good morning to you and welcome to the Morning Outlook Report. I'm Rachel Jones reporting live from Calkine TV Sydney Studios. Now the Australian share market is expected to open higher this morning. According to the latest SPY futures, the ASX 200 is likely to open 22 points higher or 0.3% higher. Yesterday at the closing bell, the S&P ASX 200 was 0.5% or 34 points higher at 7,006. The best performing sector yesterday was utilities. They were up 2.6%. The worst performing sector was materials. They were down 1.2%. The best performing stock yesterday was Appen, closing the day 7.9% higher at $10.38. The worst performing stock was BHP Group, closing 3.1% lower at $44.93. Looking to some big business news from today, and Telstra has announced it will invest in two major telecommunications infrastructure projects to support the nation's digital economy. The two distinct projects are building and managing the ground infrastructure and fibre network in Australia for Viasat, that's a global communications company, and a major new fibre project to build state-of-the-art intercity dual fibre paths. The investment will add up to 20,000 new route kilometres to increase the capacity of Telstra's already extensive optical fibre network. Now, to deliver both of those projects, Telstra expects to invest $1.4 to $1.6 billion over the next five years. Moving on, and the Rice Group's wholly owned subsidiary, Rice Growers Singapore, has today renewed its supply arrangements with a strategic commercial partner in China for the supply of milled white rice to Sun Rice's key markets throughout the Pacific. The two supply agreements will ensure the supply of milled white rice to key markets throughout financial year 2023 and will expire on the 30th of April 2023. 
And the Hastings Technology Metals has received approval from the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility for a $140 million, a 12.5-year loan facility for the development of its Yangibana Rare Earths Project in the Gascoigne region of Western Australia. The NAIF loan forms part of the $300 million to $400 million of total debt funding required for Yangibana. Now, the project will become Australia's second rare earths producer and expands the country's strategic capacity in downstream processing of rare earths minerals. Well, on that note, it's time now for a very short break, but stay tuned for more news set to affect your trading day. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Welcome back to the Morning Outlook Report. In overnight trade on Wall Street, the Dow Jones ended up 0.78%. The S&P 500 was up 0.69% and the Nasdaq closed 0.75% higher. The S&P 500 marked its biggest monthly fall since March 2020. The global market started February on a choppy note amid mixed economic data emanating from the U.S. and also inflation worries. Global equity markets began the new month in choppy trade after a volatile January. A pan-European equity index stocks surged 1%, while Japan's blue chip Nikkei rose 0.3%, with the MSCI's world stock index up 0.24%. Now, oil prices did fall yesterday. That was from seven-year highs as traders speed concerns that OPEC might raise production to control rising prices. WTI was down 0.14% at $80.03 a barrel. Brent crude was at $89.20 a barrel. That was down 0.07%. Gold prices extended their gains as the U.S. dollar retreated. And ongoing tensions over Ukraine underpinned the metal's safe haven demand. Gold advanced 0.2% to $1,800.36 per ounce. U.S. gold futures settled 0.3% higher at $1,801 U.S. dollars. That's all for our Morning Outlook report here on Calkine TV. Have a great day trading and stay tuned for more market updates and economic news live throughout the day. This is Rachel signing off for now. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV.
have heard of Earth Day, Women's Day or Father's Day. Although heavily commercialised these days, they serve an important purpose, encouraging community intervention and togetherness. In the same vein, Global International Days and Weeks are occasions to educate the public on issues of concern, to mobilise political agendas and resources to address global problems, and to celebrate and reinforce achievements of humanity. The existence of International Days predates the establishment of the United Nations, but the UN has embraced them as a powerful advocacy tool. Today, on the day of International Education Day, we will look at the latest news from the Australian Prime Minister who has announced $630 Australian dollar visa rebate for international students. Here's some welcome Australian visa application news for international students. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison announced that international students who arrive in Australia will have their visa rebated at a cost of 630 Australian dollars per student. Local reports say the country will rebate visa application fees for students and backpackers for at least the next three months as the country works to fill critical workplace shortages created by COVID-19. Morrison previously announced that the federal government will remove the 40-hour a fortnight cap on student visa holder workers, which would mean international students will no longer have restrictions on the amount of hours they can work. A news channel reported that the visa rebate initiative will be in place for the next eight weeks and will be organised via the Department of Home Affairs. So why is Australia rebating visa applications to woo the international students? Morrison hopes that the Australian visa application rebate will inspire international students to return to the country. There are approximately 150,000 students currently overseas who have an approved visa to come and study in Australia. International students returning to the country will have to be fully vaccinated. Morrison said they will face the same quarantine arrangements that are enforced and required by each state. The Australian visa application rebate is part of an initiative to encourage students to return for the start of the university year as a thank you for choosing Australia. Morrison stated that he also wants them to come here and to be filling some of the critical workforce shortages, particularly those who are working and being trained in healthcare aged care and those types of sectors that will be incredibly helpful. The Australian government will also give three million Australian dollars to Tourism Australia for a marketing campaign targeting backpackers and students. Treasurer Josh Frydenberg said the visa rebate scheme is expected to cost 55 million Australian dollars. Well, the visa rebate seems largely symbolic. However, a good start for the students waiting to enter the country and start their education. In a major announcement, MasterCard has said that it will partner with Coinbase for the latter's upcoming non-fungible token marketplace and allow the users to make payments through its credit card. In this video, we'll explore all the details of Coinbase and MasterCard's latest partnership. Please subscribe to the channel. I'm Sage for Kalkai Media. Last year, Coinbase revealed that it would launch an NFT marketplace. Coinbase NFT in a bid to cash in on the wave. And ever since its announcement, more than 1 million have signed up and will be opening its first NFT marketplace in the United States, first followed by other countries. Coinbase NFT is expected to be a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace, which with its intuitive design, will empower the art and artist's experience at the forefront in the space. Thanks for joining us in the report. If you like the information, let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below and subscribe to the channel. If you press that bell icon, you'll be notified when the next video is released by Kalkine. For more information, please head to the website, kalkinemedia.com. Sage here for Kalkine Media.
Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm with Peter McCall. Now Peter is the Chief Executive Officer at Parley. Parley provides a contactless, contactless facility management compliance system. Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Hi, Peter. How are you today? Hey, Rachel. Uh, all good. Thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. Great to have a chat with you today. We're very interested to learn more about your company. So just to start off, can you tell us a little bit more about what you do and how you do make people's lives easier? Yeah, so we work within the facilities management sector and cleaning sector. We start off in shopping malls and basically we have reinvented uh, facilities management compliance systems where there is no, no need for our staff to either tap something as proof of attendance or scan a QR code. We, we, we replace it with simply a little name tag which is identified by our little readers which are installed throughout a site which means the staff go about their daily jobs without having to, as I mentioned, tap or scan, and all that data is recorded. And ultimately, the goal of recording that data is for the, the businesses to prove that they're meeting compliance rates for cleaning and security. And ultimately, that lowers uh, public liability claims. So that, in a, a very short summary, is what we do. That's absolutely fabulous. So with that data that you're mentioning there that your system collects in, in what ways can it be used and how comprehensive is it? So it's very detailed data. We hold more data than our, than our competitor. So uh, as I mentioned, our existing systems use uh, old school RFID technology where the staff have to tap on something in their wall or they use a, uh, an app where they scan a QR code as proof of attendance. Uh, there's a very simple problem with those uh, our competitors, and that is human error, where staff simply forget to tap or forget to scan, or they're being called away before they do it. And when that happens, that produces lower compliance rates. So, when if an accident does happen, and let's use this for an example, if a staff member is in an office or in a canteen or in a factory or even in a shopping mall, and they have an accident where they slip and trip, our clients can log into our system. And in the, in the click of a button, check the specific time, let's say between one o'clock and half one, and we'll show them exactly which of their staff are in that area. And unlike other existing systems, which literally only record the exact second that they were in that area, we can tell them how long they were in that area. So our data is far more valuable when uh, trying to defend a public liability claim because we can prove who was there, what time were there, and how long they were there for so that the data is far more valuable. Well, that sounds extremely important, and particularly in these times. So obviously I'm referring to the pandemic. How do you believe the pandemic has affected the demand of such a contactless compliance system? The pandemic, every cloud has a silver lining. Uh, it's, been, it's been great for us business-wise. Obviously, uh, personal health uh, reasons, it's not been great for a lot of people. But for us as a business, 
look, the clues in the name, contactless, no, nobody wants to touch anything these days, so the more contactless solutions out there, the better. And obviously, in public areas, such as, such as shopping malls or even office buildings, there's a high emphasis on uh, making sure that everything's clean and hygienic. So our, our system has the, the highest compliance rates on the market. We, we increase most of our clients' compliance our clients' compliance by at least 20% within the first 30 days. And I, I suppose it's coming a good time too where there's, there's been a, a, an enhanced appreciation of cleaning and security staff during the pandemic where people are appreciating more, a lot more that what cleaning staff do, especially in hospitals or public buildings. So just having technology like ours, plus the appreciation of cleaning, uh, cleaning staff it, it, it has been great COVID ways and business ways for us anyway. And do you think your system can help retain staff and can it also build customer loyalty, do you believe? Yeah, it, it retains staff in so much as that we actually take tasks away from staff so they don't have to tap or scan, they just go about their normal business so it makes their jobs easier. In regards to customer loyalty, I have experience from my previous hospitality industry uh, that I run and loyalty it, it, it's, it's not rocket science in my opinion you hear a lot of experts go on about all this customer engagement and so on but if I take it back to uh, use the example of when I had bars and restaurants uh, it's very very simple if I knew the client's name the customer's name and I knew what they liked and I knew and I rec uh, recognized their loyalty by giving them the odd reward and I recommended stuff that I thought I liked that's how you grow customer loyalty. It's very, very simple. You you acknowledge your customers' custom to you and provide them with a good service. Like what I did back in the hospitality days was exactly what Amazon is doing now. They know when you arrive. They know what you bought last. They recommend you stuff based on what you buy. And that's why people like And obviously, it's great service. But customer loyalty, it simply said, is knowing who your customers are, what they want, and what they would like. It's as simple as that. Absolutely. As you said, it is very simple, but so very important. And just lastly, Peter, what do you have in the near-term pipeline for this year for your company? As I mentioned in the last question, COVID has it has its silver linings for us as a business. We're very, very busy. We have, we have installations going on now in multinational supermarkets. Uh, some of the biggest factories in the world, the biggest facilities management companies in Ireland and the UK. And by pure coincidence, based on, on this interview, we're actually working with the Department of International Trade on our entry into Australia, uh, working with some top, top guys in the UK government and in Australia. So looking forward to uh, getting over to Australia in the next six to 12 months. Excellent. Well, it sounds like very exciting times ahead for sure there, Peter. Yep, looking forward to it. Really exciting, really busy. Yep, exciting times. Well, drop us a line when you get over to Australia. With that, I will well, thank indeed, you for Rachel. your time, Peter. Thank you, Rachel. All the thank best. Thank you so much. Best of luck for this year with right. your business. And with that, I will sign off for today, but watch this space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV.
Hello, I'm James Preston and welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks, exclusive to Cowkine TV. In this episode, I'll be shining a light on Pledger Giving. Pledger is a social impact platform that allows for e-commerce brands to fundraise for charities and to talk us through how it all works, Weston McIntosh, the CMO of Pledger, joins me live now. Weston, great to have you here with us on Cowkine. Nice to meet you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Now, great to have you here, Weston. First and foremost, how exactly does Pledger work? Um, so what we are is we are a social impact as a service tool. So there's a thing called social impact. Basically what it is is trying to make a difference in your community. So this is up to you. It can be your household, your local town, your city, or the world. So what we do is we try and help online retailers take the community they choose, make them So this can be environmental, like trees, or plastic, or it can be helping clean us off the streets, really get to choose what yeah, wonderful. Now, there's obviously things as well, such as GoFundMe, donor, crowdfunder. How does Pledger differ from those platforms, though, for people who might not be 100% across it? So, so, awesome. There's a lot of very cool platforms out there for this. What we're trying to do with Pledger is make the impact well known and make it a long-term system. So the big thing we see with these is that you want to have an authentic partnership. Mm. You're going to see a lot of people do short-term campaigns on GoFundMe, for specific causes, which are cool, They're, some of them are fantastic, um, but you often can't track exactly where the money is going or you don't necessarily know. So with Pledger, a big thing for us is impact. So track the number of meals you provide to homeless, whatever the cause may be. Um, so what we're doing is we're providing the impact, but we're also trying to provide authentic partnerships, which is the big thing. So you probably see every month a lot of major corporations will change the color of their logo to sort of meet whatever's going on that month. Mm. Um, we're trying about marketing, the benefits of social impact, but people actually do see through that and there's a lot of you know, virtue signaling that goes with this. So what we're trying to do is make sure that when you're working with Pledger and when you're working with charity, it's an authentic partnership, it's trackable, and it actually makes sense for both you and it's And talking there about authentic oh. partnerships, something a bit more long term, what would be one of the good examples from 2021 of a brand that you worked with? So we have a number of brands um, that are onboarded, a lot of small ones. So I've got a couple of personal favorites that are very minor. Some are niche rescuing turtle doves in the UK. Um, there's an all-women anti-poaching squad in Africa. It's pretty rhino, so there's a lot of really cool ones there. Um, there. Um, but the biggest one we're seeing, obviously, is, is tree plant. So it's simple, it's trackable, and, you know, obviously, if you, you know, feel the temperatures, I'm sure Australia's pretty hot right now. Um, but if the temperatures, you know, global warming is a thing, climate change is a thing, so people are trying to help and act on that. So it's not very exciting, but it's trackable. So tree planting is probably the biggest one. Hmm. Well, so how can e-commerce brands then incorporate sort of meaningful social impact into their business, and then in turn they can help grow through giving? Is that kind of the, the goal here of Pledger, is to have those perfect alignments between uh, a cause that a company and its consumers would probably be quite interested in and then that, that will help them grow further in that sense because there's sort of that, I suppose, connection, that deep embeddedness where it's a case of, you know, yes, we, we believe in the vision of this company. We like the fact that they've aligned themselves with this brand. Is that sort of how you see Pledger helping businesses grow? Absolutely. So I like, I love to see people you know, take money or well, RIP, but he would have taken money from anybody to help conserve the environment. Like, if you want to plant 20,000 trees at the end of the year, I support you, plant trees, I'm in for that. Mm, mm. Um, but it's not authentic, and people see through that. So the thing with social impact is that when you have it as part of your brain, part of your purpose, the consumer knows they will. They're going to buy more from your site, they're going to come back more frequently. And that's why people pretend and sort of do this purpose. So there's a couple simple rules that work. Um, try and have something that's consistent with what your company is selling. So if you're selling mugs and you're saving bees, great, that's awesome. But <laughs> it won't necessarily draw that connection um, versus if you're selling, say, bike helmets or bike parts and you're supporting the whole price of relief, that connection can be drawn to the connection. See what's going on. So that's wonderful. That's great. If you're a smaller retailer and maybe you don't want to give donations yourself, you know, it's just pleasure that your customers donate. Or, or a couple of local charity. There's, you know, Tons of big charities that are fundraising for us. We're great, support them, but there's a lot of small charities that come in that maybe give them a couple hundred pounds a year or a few thousand dollars per year. It goes really far, and the story you can have there is good. Um, 
they will promote you as well. You promote them. You can talk about them. If you're real, people know that, and they will reward you. Now, as part of the um, the Shopify function within Pledger, uh, what I want to break down is, for example, if someone buys, say, a twenty dollars shirt, for example, how much will be then given across to the charity that they're affiliated with? Is there a way that you can adjust the parameters to say, hey, five percent of every sale goes to this, or is it one percent? Is it ten percent? How does that work? It's up to the retailer in terms of what they want to do. So you've got some larger companies that are giving, say, a half percent, but they're, you know, maybe selling ovens and stuff where they can't afford. The margins are a little bit thinner for a lot of projects, for a lot of products. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll give a half percent or we'll give a few pounds per, per order. Um, but we have some really cool companies that are straight up giving 20, 30 percent of the revenue to niche charities. Wow. Um, it's almost like they don't want to make money. They really just want to help. And you see with the... <laughs> Talk about authentic partnerships, but a lot of these uh, these founders have personal experience with the charities, whether it's cancer research or who may have benefited from these charities in the past, and they truly just want to give back. And what we see, because we track all the orders, they perform very well. Like they're trying to give their money away, but it's coming back to the people who love them. They're, they're great people. So you can give one percent, you can give five percent, or you can ask your consumers to donate. Now, you're also talking just a little while ago about smaller retailers being involved as well. Is there a minimum size that there needs to be to get involved with Pledger, or can any company theoretically do it? Um, any company can do it. We don't want to gatekeep it. We, you know, we see companies like Amazon and the Climate Pledge where they're giving billion dollars to you know, fight the good fight. But we know where the money comes from, obviously. If a small brand wants to come in and you know, donate one pound a month because they're selling and mugs to support these, we're all for that. And we want to make sure everybody has the opportunity to do that. Well, I think a big thing for me and many others is that I'm only comfortable giving if I know where my money is actually going to go to. Uh, so with that in mind, how does Pledge actually keep things transparent and, and I suppose simple so it's easy to follow the entire process? So when it comes to, say, the customer journey, um, you can see the money's going somewhere. That's cool. Are they telling the truth? Are they lying? We don't know. So what we do with our purchases that when you make your purchase through Pledger, um, you get a few different options. So the consumer can actually pick which charity they want to support. Um, so if you have a few that you love, tree planting, we use once again because I'm all stuff in my head right now, and you know, homeless, um, you give your consumer's option to pick. What we try and do with as many of these charities is hard to impact the money. So if you know buying that twenty dollar t shirt, uh, two pounds or two dollars is gonna be called charity you know that's going to be two trees planted, you know that's going to be a meal, whatever that uh, points out to it. It's really tracking. It's, if you can show what the impact is, that's what we try to be transparent to us. Well, Weston, what's in the pipeline for Pledger in 2022? Um, we've got some pretty cool partnerships that are opening up. So as we've been sort of growing and developing, a lot of our charity onboarding is coming through, through shops. People come in and we have our sort of our favorite charities, our the charities that we started with, Pledger, which we find things to be ones that um, we're trying to onboard tens of thousands of charities at once because anytime a new store comes on, we want to find new charities but they want to support specific ones. So we're trying to really grow and develop that. Um, and we're also adding a lot of, sort of impact tracking features. What you're seeing in a lot of countries, especially the UK, where the company is based in Germany, um, ESG reporting is not, not just so quick anymore. You have to do it. Um, there's legal obligations that are coming in the pipeline. Like you have to be showing hmm. your environmental impact, but uh, you track your social impact as well. So what we're trying to do is provide all the information, all the tools to make this easy for employers. I did this for years. It was the most social job numbers and data to governments. It's not fun. I don't want anybody to have to do it if they don't have to. So we're trying to give people all the tools and all the resources to, to, to do it for us. Yeah, wonderful. And just before I let you go, Weston, how can we find Pledger, whether you be a business looking to get involved or a consumer who wants to find who is actually being supported with Pledger's uh, application? How, how can we find you? Well, I'm sure there's going to be a link here, 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 here. Um, <laughs> or if not, or if, not um, if you go to Shopify and just search charity, we're the first company that comes up, because we're just the best. Um, or if you just search Pledger on Google, um, you're probably going to find us. So search. Um, or the product that works to help social impacts, go for it, do whatever it takes. Perfect. Well, Weston, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much.
Well, that's Weston McIntosh, the CMO of Pledger. And if you missed any part of that interview, you can catch the entire chat on our YouTube channel, Kalki Media, so make sure to subscribe. That's all for today, though. I'm James Preston reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Kalki. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. With more than 16,000 cryptocurrencies in circulation, the crypto space is increasing on a daily basis. It comes then with little wonder that some of the world's biggest software players are now setting a course to get involved in the space. The latest big company to do so is antivirus software manufacturer Norton, and in this video we'll take a look at their involvement in the crypto world. But first, please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. Norton, the popular antivirus software technology, has now entered the crypto space, with Norton LifeLock offering the Norton Crypto tool as part of its Norton 360 software for home and business computers. Essentially, it allows customers to mine crypto whilst their computers are otherwise inactive. The tool at this stage specifically mines Ethereum, the second largest crypto by market cap. The tool mines the Ethereum, then breaks the value of the mined currency into pieces and deposits a small percentage into a Norton digital wallet held in the cloud for each participating computer. The paid membership of Norton software is a prerequisite to use it for mining Ether. From there though, Norton scalps 15%, essentially a service fee, which is a bit of a sneaky way for them to make millions of dollars and is essentially them also double dipping given you've already paid for the tech. In order for Norton Crypto to run, a computer will require a GPU card with a minimum of 6GB of RAM, which is actually a more than achievable feat for your everyday user. The key benefit is of course related to the ease of use. Instead of dealing with complex mining rig setups and programs, simply utilizing Norton Crypto and then allowing it to run whilst your computer is idle is sufficient to extract the ether. Resultantly, it could be appealing to someone who is less tech savvy but still wanting to engage in the process. While some have labelled it as an ageing tech company, desperate to try and stay relevant, this latest play may actually ensure the company's long-term survival, with crypto adoption growing exponentially. If you enjoyed the information contained in this video, please make sure to like, share, comment and subscribe, and don't forget to press the bell icon to stay across the latest from Kalkine. You can also check out the website, kalkinemedia.com. I'm James Preston, reporting for Kalkine. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Kalkine TV. Hedera Crypto recently gained traction, pushing its price by over 2%. Hedera is one of the most used, stable and enterprise grade public networks for the decentralized economy. And in this video, we'll get a little bit more acquainted with it and analyze its likely performance. But first, please subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon. How does Hedera work? 
Hedera was designed to eliminate some of the limitations of the older blockchain-based platforms like slow speed and instability. It enables individuals and organizations to create robust yet sustainable decentralized applications. In other words, its platform allows developers to create decentralized applications with relative ease. Hedera launched its initial coin offering or ICO of its native utility token HBAR in August 2018. However, it was relaunched for open access in the mainnet in September 2019. The HBAR token plays two roles in the Hedera public network. Firstly, it enhances the Hedera network services like smart contracts, file storage and others. Secondly, it provides a secure network because the token can be staked to help manage the platform's integrity. Dr. Lehman Bard and Mance Harmon created the Hedera Hashgraph. The total maximum supply of the HBAR token is 50 billion and the current circulating supply is 18.09 billion. It's available for trading in exchanges like Binance, Hobie and others. Hedera Performance Hedera has a market cap of 4.75 billion US dollars and its fully diluted market cap is 13.15 billion. The HBAR token has experienced an all-time high of just over 57 cents and a low price of approximately 6.8 cents over the past year. HBAR is currently trading around the 25 cent mark and has been a victim of the recent bearish trend for the crypto space. If things can settle in the space and the Bitcoin route stops, then we could see it set a new record high by the end of 2022. So to sum it all up, Hedera is a high potential project and is one that has experienced quality gains in recent quarters. It returned 156.88% gains over the past 12 months and it could be in for another bumper year in 2022. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, comment and subscribe. And of course, don't forget to press the bell icon to stay across the latest videos from Kalkine. You can also check out the website, kalkinemedia.com. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. If you're up for an adventure, there's hardly a better destination for it than right here in Australia and nearby New Zealand. Although interstate travel is still up in the air, as restrictions ease, no doubt you want to hit the road and explore the great outdoors. So here's our top adventure activities to stretch those post-lockdown muscles. First up, scuba diving. Ngalu Reef and the Great Barrier Reef. Fancy a swim with the whale sharks? Each year between April and July, you can witness a migration of whale sharks to Ngalu Reef. Don't worry though, because these sharks are docile and harmless and they only eat plankton, they're not aggressive. A more obvious underwater hotspot, the Great Barrier Reef is another thing scuba diving enthusiasts don't want to miss. It's the largest reef around the world. Over 2,300 kilometers hide the incredibly vivid creatures. Think dugons, seals, mesmerizing tropical fish, dozens of different corals, sponges and starfish, even dolphins and whales. There are daily trips organized from Port Douglas and Cairns so the experts can show you the best spots. And if you want a real adrenaline rush, make sure to head to South Australia and hop in a cage to dive with the great white sharks. It's in Port Lincoln, which is one of the best places to visit in the state. Next up, golfing, beachfront in Sydney. Going on an active holiday is becoming more and more popular 
as people love devoting their vacation days to learning a new skill while having fun. You can sign up for golf courses in Sydney and enjoy the most breathtaking place to make a hole in one. The beachfront in Sydney is specifically designed as a giant golf court with a club and a cafe you can unwind in. And while you're in the city, don't miss out on climbing the Sydney Harbour Bridge for an amazing panoramic view and photo opportunities. A similar hard pumping experience can be found at Gold Coast Skypoint Climb, where you get the climb, highest 270 metres external building in the country. Next, bungee jumping, Queenstown in New Zealand. Queenstown is the perfect place for adrenaline junkies and it's a natural place to stop for those New Zealand road trips. There are several spots for a bungee jump, but Kawaru Bridge may be the best one. It's actually a place where bungee jumping was born. The surreal turquoise river beneath, amazing surrounding nature and scenery will make your 43 meter high jump worthwhile. Another great option to try is the world's biggest swing just above the Nevis River, where you'll experience a height of 300 meters. Enjoy a guided hike, jet boating or parasailing and consider visiting the Queenstown Adventure Group to explore other offered activities. Cycling. Soak in Australia on two wheels. If you have the mindset of an independent traveller and you want to explore off the grid paths, cycling is the best way to do it. Australia has an awesome outback just waiting for you. And if you're wondering what area to explore, well it might be best to consider the weather conditions first. The northern area has a high humidity, both wet and dry seasons. The central part isn't suitable for cycling because it's the heart of the desert basically. But a moderate climate is typical for the southern part. Which is why Tasmania is a truly great place and it became a renowned area for cycling from Cradle Mountain to Bruni Island. There's a lot to see. Don't miss out on Freysenet National Park either, where you may get the opportunity to pat a few kangaroos. Explore other trails as well. There are many beautiful spots you can find on two wheels. And lastly, surfing. They don't call the Gold Coast a surfer's paradise for nothing. Exquisite beaches with the urban side back offer you a chance to enjoy amazing waves. Whether you choose to ride some waves at the Snapper Rocks Surfer Bank or Palm Beach, Nobby Beach or Broad Beach, you can have the opportunity to soak up the sun and raise your adrenaline levels. If you prefer a more natural surrounding, choose Noosa. You can also attend surfing lessons. The Gold Coast is packed with surfing schools and academies. Coaches usually work with a group of up to six people, but there's also an option for private lessons. Other great surfing spots include Victoria, New South Wales and Western Australia. So keep this in mind when you choose adventure hotspots for the coming season. to know about Arcade Network Crypto. In this video we'll understand what Arcade Network Crypto is. Microsoft entry into the metaverse with its acquisition of the video game publisher Activision Blizzard shines a spotlight again on blockchain. Metaverse aside, a few other subcategories within distributed ledger technologies are also drawing interest. One of these is decentralized finance or DeFi. Please subscribe to the channel and keep watching to find out more. I'm Sage for Calkai Media. So let's get to know the Arcade Network a little better. Arcade Network helps users move their digital assets from one metaverse to another. Arcade Network would also allow developers to build and deploy their blockchain-based games using the Arcverse. It claims that developers that lack resources and graphics can create their metaverse through their protocol. The last offering of the Arcade Network is Arc Note Case, which is a wallet that can hold NFTs and other crypto assets. Arcade Network also has its own token. Let's find out more about it now. Arc Coin is a blockchain-based cryptocurrency that uses the Arcade Network ecosystem. The project claims that Arc tokens would provide incentives to the users when they redeem their assets in Arc cryptocurrency instead of fiat currency. Arc tokens also serve as rewards for engagement. The token can be used to purchase gaming assets, essentially meaning it is the native token of the network. Let's now take a look 
at what the Arcade coin could be worth. ARK token has a very low market cap of nearly 507,000 US dollars, according to CoinMarketCap. Nearly 9.6 million ARC or ARK tokens are in supply, and the maximum token supply can be 229 million. Lastly, looking at Arcade Network Crypto's price prediction. On a year-to-date basis, the ARK token has lost value, but this is a trend that has gripped the entire crypto market currently. After Microsoft's metaverse move, things may move at a greater speed. Arcade Network claims to be a bridge between different metaverse projects, and by this measure, the ARC token may find more uses. The increased demand for the token may take the price to nearly 10 cents US by the end of this month, and the price is a product of demand of any crypto, and hence, Arcade Network will have to prove its utility. The bottom line. Metaverse tokens are in demand and digital assets within these fictional worlds are at the heart of this craze. RK Network Crypto claims to help move assets from one game to another. An ARK token may be a pick for those investors that believe Metaverse would shine further in 2022. If you like the information, let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below and subscribe to the channel. Press the bell icon and you'll be notified of the latest videos by Calkine. For more information like this, head to the website. It's calkinemedia.com. Sage here for Calkine Media. Good morning and thanks for tuning in. I'm Holly Shields here for Calkine TV, welcoming you all to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks. Now, the Australian Open Tennis Championship wrapped up on Sunday and once again the organisers have put on a spectacular world-class event. However, this year's tournament has also seen its fair share of controversy. Of course, I'm referring to the men's world number one, Novak Djokovic's eventual deportation by the federal immigration minister, Alex Hawke, the supposed threat Djokovic's personal stance on COVID vaccination posed to the federal government. This is all in spite of Djokovic receiving a medical exemption from the vaccination to from two independent boards before his arrival to Australia, as well as his initial visa cancellation being overturned by Judge Anthony Kelly in Federal Circuit Court after Djokovic had spent a number of days in a detention facility. Well, here to discuss the case today is accredited specialist immigration lawyer Christopher Levingston, who heads the firm Christopher Levingston & Associates. Welcome to the show, Christopher. It's great to have you on. Thank you very much for the invitation. Pleasure to have you with us today. Now, first of all, the whole Jovic saga lasted from the 6th of January when he was denied entry to the country until the 16th when he was finally deported. So why was his visa cancelled initially when he had already received that medical exemption? Well, when you arrive at the border, you've got a visa, but a visa is not permission to enter Australia. It's simply an invitation to present yourself at the border and then seek admission. So when he arrived at uh, Tullamarine, uh, very, very early in the morning, he uh, ran into Border Force, uh, who by reason of a uh, shift change, weren't inclined to give him every opportunity to present uh, his case. And notwithstanding the fact that they then exercised powers to cancel his visa, subsequently upon review by His Honour Judge Kelly, that decision was set aside because of a breach of procedural fairness. Right, but uh, the whole process as well, did that need to be drawn out for as long as it was, do you think? Well, if you're going to seek judicial review, you've got to get uh, before a judge. And so uh, Mr Djokovic was constrained by the reality that he arrived early in the morning. He had to get, uh, he had, there were, a decision was made, he was taken into immigration detention. That then got... Uh, the ball rolling. So then an application is made to the courts. The courts have to constitute and then sit. That takes time. Right. That, that does take time indeed, especially a figure like Djokovic. But do you think if it wasn't him, um, this, this tennis star in question, would the outcome have still been the same? That's a great question. I suspect that what's happening at the border every day is that people are being refused entry for a variety of reasons. It is inevitable that there'll be people at the border 
uh, yesterday and today who will be refused entry and if they don't have their documentation in order specifically they don't have the vaccination certificates or the clearances um, they will be refused entry and will go into immigration detention that may not be for six or so days uh, they may in fact be removed the same day subject to a seat being available on another plane so to the extent that Mr Djokovic uh, attracted the attention of the of Border Force and ultimately the Commonwealth, the problem seemed to be a, a lack of documentation. But the longer the matter went on, more problems emerged. And one of those was in relation to the travel declaration form made under the Biosecurity Act. And that itself was incorrect. And that could have also enlivened the cancellation powers. So it's a tricky business. People do get their visas cancelled every day, and I suspect that that will continue uh, with this particular emphasis upon COVID. Absolutely. But uh, considering the, the final decision there, it was Immigration Minister Alex Hawke who admitted that uh, Djokovic, in fact, wasn't necessarily at risk of spreading the virus, but rather his presence may be at risk of an adverse reaction by some members of the Australian community on the basis of their concerns about his unvaccinated status. Would you say this decision was fair from a legal standpoint? Well, it was made, the decision made by the minister was legally correct, but I think that Mr Djokovic had uh, a combination of problems. The first problem was this. Ordinarily, a person who's famous, has got a lot of money, a lot of resources at their disposal, they generally sort of sail through the system without too many uh, problems. The problem in reality ultimately turned upon whether or not Mr Djokovic was a symbol and given that the government's got a very, very strong position in relation to COVID and they've got a lack of tolerance for alternate or dissenting views, uh, Mr Djokovic was unlucky because he was uh, held out by the minister rather than you know, on any proper factual basis in my opinion as being some sort of poster boy for the end of access. Um, as to whether or not that was in fact the case, it is really irrelevant because when the minister exercises the powers, all he has to do is exercise the power reasonably. Uh, and so ultimately, the full federal court decision turned upon whether or not the powers had been exercised lawfully by the minister. They found that he had. So uh, as a lawyer, I can't complain about the way that the law operates. It just operates and the courts ultimately have oversight and review. So. Um, I line up with the decision of the full federal court. Right, it's very interesting there. So obviously there was an element of, uh, you know, this is a public figure, he has a substantial influence perhaps, um, so perhaps it was, as you say, legally um, within his right to make that call. Now, surrounding the case, we've often heard the mantra about the rules being the rules, but is there a moral element to this, do you think? Is there a moral implication of um, not perhaps wanting to put something in your body that you don't want to. Uh, does that concern you at all from a legal basis? Well, given that the powers will reside, the, the powers that the Minister exercise reside in the Migration Act 1958. That's a piece of legislation uh, created by Parliament. Uh, ultimately, the courts uh, will enforce those powers. I guess the situation is this. If you thought that the decision was so unfair or that the minister's powers were so godlike that they offended ordinary sensibilities, um, you can ventilate about that in a public forum, but ultimately the only way to uh, address it is to get elected to parliament and change the law. So at the end of the day, the Migration Act 1958 isn't designed to be fair. It's about the cruel and dispensing of power uh, by uh, important, powerful people. The Commonwealth loves power, it exercises the power. So to the extent that the Prime Minister says the rules are the rules, he's right. Um, but uh, often there's a moral dimension, uh, there's often questions about fairness, but at the end of the day, they all fall away because the legislation is king. Right, and uh, do you expect this to change any time soon, perhaps, do you think? That's a great question. I don't think that the Minister's going to give up powers, um, and there's no, there's no 
indication historically that once powers are gained by government, that they ever give them up. So I think that these powers that reside in this current minister and will reside in future ministers, and these powers have been exercised by previous ministers, I don't think that anybody is going to say, look, it's a bridge too far. I think that once powers are taken, uh, they're exercised, and very rarely are they ever given up. That's an excellent point there, and um, I'm inclined to agree with you. But um, as far as that goes, it's been great to hear your insights today. Thanks very much for joining us on Executive Corner Expert Talks. It's been great to have you on, Christopher. My pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. And thanks for your time as well, viewers. Stay tuned for more live updates. This is Holly Shields signing off. Hi there, James Preston for Cowkind TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Hello everyone, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm speaking with Joe Foster. Now Joe is the CEO of Close the Loop. Close the Loop is the first company to list on the ASX that provides full circular economy solutions. That's from design, manufacture, collection and reuse or recycling. Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Welcome to the show, Joe. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel. Good to speak with you today. Now, you. Close the Loop is one of over 150 companies to IPO on the ASX this year, but it's one of only a handful of ASX companies in the sustainable packaging space. Now, you did raise $12 million at 20 cents per share and closed 50% higher on your first day. So how That's was right. the IPO experience for Close the Loop? Oh, very exciting, Rachel. Thank you very much. Uh, certainly the first few days, uh, showed a lot of progress, uh, a lot of interest in our business. Um, the nice thing about it is that people really want to engage with Close the Loop Group because we do offer the full end-to-end -end solution within the circular economy. And the nice thing about it is that really, it's uh, the message we're putting out there is really about merging two individual companies together. One is Close the Loop and the other one is OF Packaging, uh, which really then allows us to be fully integrated within the circular economy. Now, where do you intend for the funds to be utilised? Yes, in fact, uh, what we've already done since we raised the funds last week is that uh, we purchased a, a company, a specialised packaging company within the seafood industry that actually happened uh, within the last few days. These, this company specialised within the seafood side of it uh, based in North Queensland. And that's number one. Number two is that we are looking at setting up a, a dedicated washing and separating facility to concentrate particularly on e-waste and we see a great opportunity here in Australia to actually uh, separate uh, metals and plastics from e-waste, uh, break it down and then supply that plastic back to the OEMs, which is really the original equipment manufacturers, which will allow them to turn this plastic back into cartridges or back into mainstream electronic products again. Sounds fascinating. Now, yes, you mentioned their sustainable packaging company, OF Packaging. What can you tell our viewers about OF and their relationship with Close the Loop? Yes, in fact, OF Packaging engaged with Close the Loop quite some time ago, looking to try and find a solution within the circular economy. As you may know, Rachel, in Australia currently, there's not really an option for curbside recycling of soft plastics. Uh, OF Packaging have been very innovative in the way they've found solutions to actually get soft plastic, soft flexible packaging pa plastic material into a curbside recycling option. 
working alongside with Closer Loop, we're looking to try and find what we believe is really the holy grail of packaging to packaging, which will allow us to try and get packaging back into the circular economy again. And obviously now people do have a greater awareness of the environmental damage caused by landfill waste. How does this growth in awareness help close the loop? Well, I think it helps us quite a lot because first of all, we uh, were, were pretty much involved in industry, educating industry to try and uh, try and get the consumer to understand what solutions are out there. You're probably aware the, the targets that have been set by the Australian government, certainly in line with APCO, that all packaging must be recyclable, reusable or compostable by 2025. And in fact, uh, all packaging should be actually containing over 50% recycled content. So we're saying that as a group, Closed Loop Group, uh, which is the two companies, we believe that we can be a pretty strong mouthpiece in the marketplace and try and drive that change forward. I think change has got to be driven by industries and companies like ourselves, rather than waiting for the actual industry to change. We want to actually try and drive the change from our side, Rachel. And Joe, would you be able to tell us a little bit more about the acquisition of the Queensland-based seafood packaging group, Oceanic Agencies? What can you tell me about the importance of that acquisition? Uh, well, thank you, Rachel. Yes, we actually identified this company about six or seven months ago. We thought that this business would fit right into the existing OF packaging business. OF packaging supplies uh, soft, flexible packaging to a number of, of markets in, in Australia and around the world, in fact. And seafood packaging is, is our number two or number three market, not just here in Australia, but around the world. So we see this strategic alliance between Oceanic Agency and, and OF, OF packaging, which will allow us to actually deliver a bigger, uh, a, a bigger arrangement of packaging to the specialized seafood industry. Oceanic Agency have actually been specializing in that area for quite some time, particularly with, with uh, local uh, aquaculture seafood products, which is very uh, prominent in North Queensland. It definitely sounds like a very good marriage you have there. Now, mm -hmm. lastly, Joe, what is a Close the Loop strategy going forward in the future? Well, Close the Loop is, um, is looking to try and expand their base in terms of working with what we believe is complex uh, consumable products. Close the Loop have got a very good interesting system in place whereby they've got over 260,000 collection sites, not just here in Australia, but in America and Europe. And we want to leverage against the existing infrastructure and work with our customers on specialized take back programs for difficult to recycle consumable products. Not just the flexible packaging materials that we make here at OF Packaging, but also look at looking at other products like cosmetics, glasses, mobile phone covers, power tools, e-waste and so forth. We want to become the leaders in that market where other, other companies are not willing to look at recycling these products. We actually want to take these challenges on and put them through our, our existing infrastructure and be really the leaders in that area. And as I said, we do see, we do see ourselves really as the most advanced uh, in this particular space here in Australia and particularly listed on the ASX. So it's been a great journey and it's very exciting to say the least, you know. And lots more to come, no doubt. Well, it's been great Absolutely. to chat with you today, Joe. Congratulations on your IPO and your recent acquisition. And with that, I will sign off. Thank you, Rachel, very much. Thank you very much. Watch Thank the you. space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Let's take a look at the top five gold penny stocks listed on AIM that you can use to diversify your portfolio and use as a hedge against inflation. Hey, thanks for tuning in. Holy Shield here for Calcai Media. First up, Galantis Gold Corporation. The company recently provided a positive corporate update on the development progress and production guidance at the high-grade Amag Gold Project in Northern Ireland. The market cap of Gelantis stands at £23 million and has given a negative return of 128% to its shareholders in the last one year. Next, Greatland Gold is a mining development and exploration company focusing on precious metals and base metals. It recently announced the remaining drill results from the initial 2021 drill program and its jury joint venture with partner Newcrest Mining. The market cap of Greatland stands at £562 million and has given a negative return of 57% to its shareholders in the last year. 
And coming in at number three is Wishbone Gold. The Explorer has three significant exploration properties in Australia and three minor prospects. Wishbone Gold recently announced that it has identified four new target zones at its Red Settler project in Western Australia. The market cap of the company stands at £16 million and it's given a negative return of 35% to its shareholders over the last year. And number four on our list is Conroy Gold and Natural Resources, which is focused on Ireland and Finland. It's inked a joint venture agreement with the Turkey-based mining company Demir Export. Both companies have come together over licenses held by Conroy Gold and the 65km district scale gold trend in the Longfin Down Massif of Ireland. The market cap of Conroy and Natural Resources stands at £11 million and it's given a negative return of 19% to its shareholders in the last year. And finally, Pan African Resources. Last week, Pan African announced that it's raised its gold production guidance. The company increased its fiscal year after output increased 10% in the first half. Pan African said it's on track to achieve production of around 2 million gold ounces for the year ending June 30. Its market cap stands at £362 million and it's given a negative return of 24% to its shareholders in the last year. And that concludes our list. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other videos to stay up to date. I'm Rolly Shields for Kalkai Media. Have you heard of reverse engineering? And I don't mean building a bridge or skyscraper in reverse either. It's the process of bringing human capabilities to function in a robotic machine and using its power to compute, achieving things beyond humans' reach. In terms of growth, the AI market or artificial intelligence market is in good stead, valued at US $62.35 billion back in 2020. AI software platforms market is forecasted to be the strongest with a five-year CAGR of 32.7% growth. Brainchip Holdings and Activision Blizzard, now acquired by Microsoft, had huge surges in their share prices this week alone. Especially as the defence sector is coming into the spotlight, today's AI picks could prove lucrative. The US Chamber of Commerce announced the launch of the AI Commission and Competition Inclusion and Innovation to advance US leadership in AI technology. And 2022 will see more government incentives to research and fund deployment of AI technology. The tech giants are investing heavily in AI consumer products and services, such as IBM, who has teamed up with Palantir to sell AI services. Alphabet's Google and Chinese companies, Tencent and Baidu, all have active AI projects. IBM, Accenture and Infosys hold the majority of the market share being 28% of the $17 billion artificial intelligence IT services market and research company, IDC estimates. Cybersecurity firms were one of the leading players in the AI sector. Palo Alto Networks, for example, and Fortinet work with artificial intelligence to prevent malicious actors from gaining sensitive and private data from computer networks. Today's picks are not financial advice, it's just information to help you understand a little bit more about the major players in the AI industry. Sentinel-1 Sentinel-1 Inc. is an AI cybersecurity firm providing their services to a range of industries including finance, healthcare, automotive services and transportation. Sentinel-1 Inc. is pegged to do well in the current market and has increased its customer base by 75% year on year based on the third quarter data of fiscal 2022 and reported its solid earnings back in December 2021. Splunk. Splunk specializes in machine learning and monitors and analyzes big data. Its services index and correlates information that makes it searchable for companies making it possible to generate alerts, reports, visualizations, etc. Splunk's artificial intelligence for information technology operations reduces costs by automating normal IT functions, making it a popular choice for many businesses. And over the last five years, the SPLK stock is up roughly 115%. C3.ai C3.ai Inc. is a California-based enterprise AI software provider and C3.ai Inc provides AI software as a service and CRM solutions to a variety of industries, including defense and utilities. They are in a growth phase, evidently serving 14 newly included industries such as healthcare, life sciences and financial services, as well as manufacturing, a significant increase of just seven last year. 
A notable contract for this company is a $500 million Department of Defense agreement for military operations and simulations over a five-year term. Interesting to note that these AI companies are growing as the demand for technology is also growing and blockchain emerges into the mainstream. Hopefully you found it informative and thanks to your company on the report. If you do like this information, let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below and subscribe to the channel. Press the bell icon, you'll be notified of the latest videos. But for more information, there is a website, kalkaimedia.com. I'm Sage for Kalkai Media. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. has been one of the worst affected stocks by the global travel standstill, leaving investors wondering whether the airline carrier will ever recover to pre-pandemic levels. Hey, and thanks for tuning in. Holly Shields here for Calcine Media. The airline stock reportedly fell 53% in 2020, and 2021 was not much better. Although, not only Air Canada has taken a hit. The entire aviation and travel industries have suffered due to a new coronavirus variant and public health restrictions, including lockdowns and border closures. In April of 2021, the Canadian government awarded the airline carrier a $5.9 billion aid package. However, it did not increase investor confidence in the stock, and it never came close to reaching its 52-week high of $31 per share seen on March 15th. As a result of the Omicron variant's global spread, it's expected that the world will continue to face air travel restrictions, of course, further affecting the aviation industry. Air Canada was forced to cancel its Hong Kong flights earlier in the year, and on top of that, it's announced last week that it will suspend its flights to sun destinations like Antigua, Bermuda and Havana. Inconsistent demand for air travel will almost certainly prevent Air Canada from regaining its pre-pandemic levels of around $50 per share. And the stock price could be falling further in the coming months if the new variant causes more havoc. So if you're not a long-term investor, your investment may take a nosedive. Now the trip to speed, check out some of our other videos to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Calcine Media. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Hello everyone, welcome to the Smart Market Insights here on Calkine TV. I'm Sage. Today we'll be shining some light on the Australian row against China amid efforts to join the EU's trade agreement. 
On 29th January, Trade Minister Dan Tahan said that Australia would seek to join World Trade Organisation or WTO talks over a trade dispute between China and the European Union or the EU. Last week, China was accused by the EU of following discriminatory trade practices against Lithuania. The EU had claimed that the Chinese trade practices are a threat to the integrity of the single market. Lithuania's decision to allow Taiwan to open a de facto embassy in Vilnius did not go well with China as it decided to downgrade its ties with the Baltic nation. The noteworthy point here is that China considers Taiwan as its territory. China also refused to clear Lithuanian goods through Chinese customs and said that it would reject import applications from Lithuania. The Chinese government also put pressure on EU firms to remove the goods manufactured in the Baltic nation from supply chains when exporting their materials to China. And notably, relations between China and Australia took a hit in 2018 after the government decided to ban Huawei technologies from its 5G broadband network. The relations soured further after Canberra formulated stricter laws to check foreign political interference and demanded an independent probe into the origins of coronavirus. The steps taken by the Australian government did not go down well with China and the Asian nation hit back by imposing tariffs on coal, beef, barley and other Australian commodities. Australia approached the WTO and filed two complaints highlighting the duties imposed by China on imports of bottled wine and barley. Meanwhile, the Foreign Ministry released a statement on Saturday welcoming an invitation from France to the Indo-Pacific Foreign Minister's meeting next month. The relations between Australia and France soured last year after Canberra inked a security pact with the US and Britain and cancelled a submarine deal with Paris. And that's all for now. We will be back again with the exclusive Hot Performance show. Until then, keep watching Calkine TV for the latest market updates and related insights. This is Sage signing off for now. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Hello and welcome to Expert Talks on Calcan TV. I'm your host, Rose Jacobs. This is a show where we meet experts and industry leaders from right across the globe to share their knowledge, advice and insights, helping you build your own success and businesses and investments. Today we're looking at why airspace is going to be the big real estate trend of this decade. Australia is poised to admit large numbers of immigrants to kickstart the post-COVID economy. And this begs a very obvious question, where will all these people live? One answer might be to take advantage of a growing trend called airspace development. I'm pleased to introduce our guest today, Warren Livesey, founder of Buy Airspace and a strut out property development specialist. Warren, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you very much for having me. Now, this is quite fascinating. Australia is poised, as, as we've said, to admit large numbers of immigrants, and this is kick-starting the post-COVID economy. So where do you propose all of these people could potentially live? Uh, well, there's two options. One, either within our existing um, infrastructure that we have at the present moment, or obviously stretching and, and making the, the city that much wider. So my main uh, suggestion to us is that we use the existing infrastructure being the um, the roof space above apartment buildings 
Now, of course, we're talking about a roof space that may or may not already exist. So can you talk us through, uh, first of all, the growing real estate trend called airspace development? What exactly does this entail? Well, ultimately, airspace is from where the building kind of finishes, the roof space, until where you permit it to go to with council regulations. So when you actually buy a, a plot of land, and maybe that is, um, you know, maybe 300 square meters, you actually own all that airspace from the ground all the way up until where council allow you to build. So that airspace is either built at the present moment, which you would obviously cap off, but what, what we're quite interested in is from the roof space up to the uh, additional uh, head space that you can actually build to. So would you say that there are many people um, currently living in their, in their place and they're unaware of the fact that, that they have some um, budding real estate sitting right there above their heads? Uh, Rosie, I'd say pretty much everyone I've really ever spoken to. Um, people do when they buy a top floor apartment. They uh, generally do so with the understanding that they may extend into the roof. Um, but this generally is kind of a small uh, attic space or, or um, a small addition to their existing property where we're actually suggesting putting a new uh, apartment or two up in that roof space. Um, because pre presently all the roof spaces, as, as you can well imagine, is this A-frame uh, type space that um, we, we actually don't need along the coast line of Australia because we don't get snow. We don't need the snow to kind of sit on the roof and then fall away. We can actually get away with flat roofs. Um, so yeah, so hopefully just using that idle space that's not being used to try and get more people into a closer proximity of schools, hospitals and police and the likes. It sounds like a bit of a no-brainer really when you think of it that way. Now I'm curious as to how the council determines how much space can be accessed above buildings. Is that to do with not blocking out neighbours' views or is there more to it than that? Uh, when council started to put down the various different zonings, the, most of the buildings were already built, uh, to be honest. So you may be looking at a certain area which would be a low density area, uh, be it around the beach side, but you'll see a lot of apartment blocks being built. So they won't, if they were to knock them down and rebuild them, they wouldn't be able to do that. So what we're trying to do is just what they call using the existing space more efficiently. Um, and ultimately trying to put an additional apartment above in that space. So um, the main, the main um, point of this is really to um, use those particular area to house somebody else and then we can sell that particular space to an investor or the group of owners um, and then that amount of money can be used to fix up the building because majority of the buildings along the, the east and west coast um, of Australia are lacking funds. They just don't have any money in the sinking fund to fix up their buildings and they've been corroded away with the ocean and the likes. This is a way that we can actually then fund the, the sustainability upgrades to all these apartments that are so desperately in need of work. So there are really um, quite a few win-wins out of this scenario. I mean, strata owners can be gaining a huge amount of extra value and it's a benefit for the buildings as well. Absolutely. Look, uh, in um, Australia, it's possibly the, the largest housing sector we have is uh, within apartment blocks. They are insured up to about $1.1 to $1.2 trillion. That's with a T. Uh, and on estimates, uh, the unused space within apartment blocks ranges from about 10 to 15%. So there is a potential of, of recapping uh, between 110 to $150 billion worth of real estate that is presently just sitting there in idle. It's interesting that, uh, that there aren't more organisations or companies out there that have been onto this for, for some time already. Is it just a no-brainer for you? Uh, it's very common in Europe, uh, the US, the UK. Um, they literally put modular homes on top of roofs. It is quite um, a part. Uh, in the UK, they are automatically um, guaranteeing that people can go and go up another level. It just hasn't been needed in Australia. Australia has so much land and you have 28 million people in around. We've been able to fit in, uh, um, in amongst that, but when we start looking at growing the population by, you know, five, ten percent. Where are we going to be able to put these people? Um, as well as, you know, we have the hospitals and the schools and already set up in these particular areas. So 
if we are to stretch out the, 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 um, the town in order to facilitate for these new people, then we're going to have to build all those facilities as well, which is going to be very, very expensive. I've also um, heard that penthouses or very brand new top level apartments here can be typically a lot cheaper to build than to start from scratch with a new build. Is that right? Absolutely. The, the, the joys of the apartment blocks is that you've got the foundations already there. Um, your electricity, water and gas are already plugged in. So you are constructing up in the roof space is primarily wood and, and glazing glass work that can be done by predominantly um, uh, carpenters. So it's the cheapest form of construction um, and obviously the most affordable to reach for the maximum amount of, of uh, return because obviously up in the roof space you have a large amount of light and privacy and obviously um, uh, space for those issues. It really is a win-win and I guess as well, you know, any extra income that comes from building these new bills and the strata owners can then use the proceeds from the sale of these new spaces uh, to potentially pay for repairs or maintenance of the existing building. That's absolutely right. Um, really, it, it's where um, a lot of people along the, the coast, they've, they've, they've spent their last dollar trying to get into this property market, which is going absolutely through the roof, uh, pardon the pun, but um, you know they, they don't actually have the additional funds that are needed to fix a building. So this may be plumbing, fire upgrades, electrical, you know, outer skin starting to need be replacement and they sit there going, you know, am I going to have to sell this apartment in order to be able to fund this? And um, th this is just a, a, a method or a way to actually find the funds for the building in order for them to actually um, stay in their residence and obviously make some money because where a top floor apartment may be worth um, say two to three uh, million odd dollars once it's been built um, and most of that say two million of that can go back to the apartment owners and they can use a million dollars to fix up their building and make it more sustainable you know get us more of the grid but then obviously there's a million left over which can actually be divided equally amongst the owners uh, based on their unit entitlement and if that space is on their own personal name, as in they own their apartment, it's a, it's a tax-free. So it's not just a win-win where on one side, people see it as a huge expense of fixing the building. This is actually a way of making money and making their building more sustainable, which I think we need to do with climate change happening around the corner. Indeed, a very valid point there. I can't imagine why anyone would say no to such a proposal. So I'd like to know, you know, is, is it quite a difficult process for strata owners to gain the approval? Uh, what's involved in, in that process? Uh, it's, it, it's incredible. Uh, because you, you're looking at fractional ownership, uh, you know, so many people owning, everyone has their own financial goals, settings, uh, your neighbours possibly not the first person you would consider going uh, into a financial relationship with. Um, but in, in saying all that, you know, we are all uh, apartment blocks are having this 10 year kind of um, what they call capital works plan of how they're going to fund fixing their building. Um, and a lot of them are at a loss of how they're going to do it. They ultimately are either increasing their quarterly um, levies or they do a, uh, a once off payment that ultimately getting funds into the strata from the owners to then fix it up. So what we're trying to do is, is that the, the, the process kind of generally falls over with the owners doing it themselves because there's so many approval stages. So the, the suggestion that I have after doing 75 developments and spe speaking to over a thousand apartments is, is to try and, and um, get the, um, the owners out of the decision-making process sooner than later. And the fact that if they are comfortable with selling that particular roof space for a million dollars or a million and a half, then the investor or the group of owners can then take that particular space and design it accordingly uh, without it through all the various levels of uh, approvals, which generally stop and, and get everyone into this death roll, sadly. It sounds like it's quite vital to have somebody like you involved in that process, that's for sure. So if people are actually interested in finding out more about this, um, what's the best way for people to learn more? Uh, I have general inf uh, information on my website, uh, buyerspace.com.au. Um, and of course, just getting um, calling me and getting some general information um, because it is an amazing opportunity that I honestly think can help us you know, not only um, help those particular owners that don't have the additional funds, but also this huge need to make buildings sustainable. So 
reusing the, the rainwater and, and solar power to, to, to um, charge batteries that you, you know, ultimately use for the building consumption. So everything that can get us off the grid and make us more uh, climate uh, efficient in regards to intelligent lighting and windows and airflow um, is just what we're going to have to be thinking of doing because every degree or two degrees uh, change here in the coast, it changes five, six, seven degrees uh, in the inland. So certain areas are going to be uninhabitable in the next 15 to 20 odd years, potentially, if nothing's done at the present moment. Well, it, sounds like, it certainly sounds like it's a very exciting time in terms of uh, real estate and, and where we're going over the next decade or so. And it certainly sounds like you're the man for the job. Warren Livesey, founder of Buy Airspace and Strata Development Specialist. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, thank you, Rosie. Appreciate the opportunity. And that's it for Expert Talks for today, but stay tuned for plenty more content coming your way. And in the meantime, as we say here, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine TV. I'm Rose Jacobs. Thanks for joining us. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkine TV. Thank you for joining us. This is Calkine TV. I'm Sage and we have some breaking and trending news for you. The fast food chain McDonald's Corporation is celebrating the Chinese Lunar New Year with a specially created metaverse themed VR exhibition inspired by zodiac signs. McDonald's on Tuesday greeted the citizens with a metaverse themed exhibition as they rang in the Year of the Tiger. China is one of its important markets. And the Illinois-based company said on Monday that it has partnered with Humberto Leon, the co-founder of the fashion brand opening ceremony, to create an immersive experience featuring designs inspired by zodiac signs. People would be able to see the designs through VR platforms. So, is McDonald's Metaverse gimmick signalling its impending foray into the virtual reality space? Metaverse has caught the attention of diverse companies in recent times. Technology, automobile and gaming companies are already seeing Metaverse as the next big opportunity for tapping into the consumer's evolving habits. Companies like Meta Platforms, Microsoft, Apple and Sony are known to have made significant investments in the space or are closely looking into it for future endeavours. So, McDonald's Metaverse Act might help pull its food industry peers into the untapped world of Metaverse. Let's look at McDonald's Metaverse Exhibition. The exhibition themed McDonald's Hall of Zodiacs 2022 Lunar New Year with Humberto Leon features a collection of 12 zodiac signs. Visitors can check out the designs and experience its unique event on VR platforms like Altspace VR and Spatial. People can also see virtual sculptures inspired by traditional Chinese cork carvings. The statues will appear in full and three-dimensional shapes with special effects and virtual reality. Leon's work will also feature horoscope readings based on the zodiac animals on the year ahead. The exhibition's interior design is created by feng shui expert Cliff Tan, and people also can see the exhibition from their mobile phones or desktops. This 3D exhibit is the Burger Giant's biggest marketing gimmick surrounding the metaverse. The exhibition will continue until February 15th, and Metaverse is considered the next iteration of the Internet. 
Big tech companies like Microsoft, Meta Platforms and others are investing heavily in the metaverse space. And during the earnings call last week, Apple CEO Tim Cook had said that he sees a lot of potential in the metaverse. Thanks for joining us on that report. Hopefully you found it informative. Please keep watching. We have more live expert talks and market updates headed your way. This is Sage signing off for now. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Thanks for tuning in, Holly Shields here for Calcane Media. Penny stocks are those stocks that are trading below one pound with a market cap of less than 100 million pounds. And in the UK, they're generally traded on the FTSE Alternative Investment Market Index. These stocks are an acquired taste for investors due to the high risk, lower trading volume factors, making them easy to manipulate. However, they can be an excellent way to diversify your portfolio, and the right ones can have a great return prospect. So with that, let's take a look at three penny stocks for short-term gains worth your attention. First up, founded in 1961, Air Partner is a global aviation services group providing aircraft charter services and aviation safety and security solutions to industry commerce, governments and private individuals across the world. Air Partner recently raised its profit expectations for the second time in less than a month following continued strong customer demand throughout December. Next, Gulf Marine Services operates a modern fleet of highly versatile self-propelled lift boats across international markets. The Dubai-based company recently won a contract extension on improved day rates for two vessels in the MENA region. The extension period on both vessels commenced on the 1st of January this year and will run for 12 months on the company's K-Class and 24 months for one of the S-Class vessels. And finally, Record. Through its subsidiaries, this company provides currency management services in the UK, North America, continental Europe and Australia, so basically the whole world. Record increased its dividend on the 30th of December to 0.018 pence. This takes the dividend yield to 4.1%, which shareholders will be pleased with. But before making this announcement, Record was paying out quite a large proportion of earnings and 77% of free cash flows. And that concludes our list. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other videos to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Calcine Media. Hi there, James Preston for Calcine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkine TV.
Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Property by Kalkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Kalkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching Property with Kalkine. Welcome to the Expert Talks by Kalkine TV. I'm Sage and today's special guest is Mr. Tim Harcourt, an economist with many titles. In fact, you may already know of him from his work as journalist and presenter for Sky News, where his popular book, The Airport Economist, has been produced into a TV series. He is also the industry professor and chief economist at Sydney's UTS and has been the economic advisor to South Australia's premier as well as many other accolades to his name, I'm sure. We're very lucky to share some space today with Tim to gain some insight into the trending issues and their economic significance. And this should be an interesting show, if I do say so myself. Bringing you live today, we have esteemed and well-travelled Chief Economist, Mr Tim Harcourt, who has fit us in his busy shooting schedule for his new TV series, The Big Picture. Welcome to the show, Tim. Thank Actually, you so much. We're just experiencing a small tech issue. We'll be right back after this. Oh, okay, thanks, Sage. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached, where the property market is headed next, what the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Welcome to yet another edition of Expert Talks by Calkine TV. I'm Sage and today's guest is Mr. Tim Harcourt, an economist with many titles. In fact, you may already know of him from his work as journalist and presenter for Sky News, where his popular book, The Airport Economist, has been produced into a TV series. He is the industry professor and chief economist at Sydney's UTS and has been the economic advisor to South Australia's premier and I'm sure he has many accolades to his name that we haven't mentioned today. So we're very lucky to share some space today with Tim to gain some insight into the trending issues and their economic significance. This should be an interesting show, if I do say so myself. So bringing you live today, we have esteemed and well-travelled Chief Economist, Mr Tim Harcourt, who has fit us in his busy shooting schedule for his new TV series, The Big Picture. Welcome to the show, Tim. Thanks, Sage, and thanks for that very generous introduction. I'm also looking forward to talking with you. Oh, fantastic. Thank you again, Tim. And you have a remarkable career history. We are ever so grateful to have you on the show today. Could you share with us the significance of your family upbringing and influences to your career progression, please? 
I have a bit of an un unusual background. My ancestry is actually Transylvanian, and people think that's a natural progression from Transylvania to Dracula to economists to bloodsuckers. <laughs> but in actual fact, my my uh, my great grandfather Israel Harkovich came out to Australia in the 19th century, and he and his wife and brother-in-law had a boat called the Wandering Jew that went round the New South Wales country. Um, selling goods. So we were basically exporters and importers, you know, 150 years ago. And I think my life as a traveling economist, uh, you know, reflects those, those roots. They had a, uh, a paddle steamer called the Wandering Jew that went around the countryside. And uh, so I think my itchy feet comes from that background stage. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah. And as they say, if the hat fits, <laughs> why don't you wear it? So exactly. Tim, You've also authored several books, the most recent being The Airport Economist Flies Again. Correct me if I'm wrong there. No, you're spot on. You're right up to date stage. And that's a sequel to The Airport Economist, which is also a successful TV series. Could you explain how your books have helped Australians to navigate business in the APAC regions, please? Well, it was, in some ways it was a bit accidental. I was Chief Economist of Austrade, the, the trade agency that helps Australian exporters. So I travelled a lot. And I thought whilst I travel, I might as well write articles about every country I visited. So, you know, I initially started off going to China and, and Korea and Japan, Southeast Asia. Uh, and from there, it sort of grew. Uh, and um, most, uh, you know, parts of the world the Australian media didn't have people, you know, in Mongolia and, and Kazakhstan, but I found with my Austrade role as chief economist, I was going to all these places. So I started writing about what makes countries tick and why does Singapore have, you know, lots of uh, engineers and financial consultants, but not many ballet dancers and those types of things. And I decided to write the story of each country and also where the opportunity was for Australia. And it sort of took off from there. It started as a book. Uh, Julia Gillard, the then Prime Minister, launched it. Uh, and then there was the TV show and the podcast and the, you know, and the sequel that uh, you, you pointed out, The Airport Economist Flies Again. That was brought out because a lot of countries that weren't in the first book, like Peru and uh, Colombia and Finland, complained. Where was their chapter in The Airport Economist Mark 1? So I ended up having to visit all these other countries so I could write The Airport Economist Flies Again. And... Uh, I think, Sage, I've been to about 60 countries in the six years before COVID, so I managed to see a lot of the world and talk about their economies. That is fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. It must be a very exciting role to take on, travelling the world like that and, and sharing your experiences with uh, Australians and uh, anyone else who's willing to read the book. Yeah, that's right. I had a funny experience, Sage, where um, I was actually in London uh, with the Premier of South Australia at the time, Jay Weatherall. We went to a alumni function, but Sasha Baron Cohen was also there in his role as, I think, the Admiral, the, the dictator. And I told him in character that I was going to Kazakhstan the next week. And he said, say hello to my friend Borat. He's a journalist there. And then when I did go to Kazakhstan, the other speaker at my conference was Tony Blair, the British Prime Minister. And I told him the whole story of meeting Sasha Baron Cohen and Borat. And Tony Blair said to me, what a funny job you've got. You go all the way to London to meet Borat and all the way to Kazakhstan to meet Tony Blair, which I guess, I guess he was right. Very interesting indeed. Now, let's talk a little bit about your trips to China. China's in the, in the news a lot these days, especially with the Beijing Winter Olympics coming up. And they've put some regulations on spectators and attendees, unfortunately because of the rise of COVID cases. How do you think this is global event will aid or hinder China's economy? It's a very good question, Sage. I was at the uh, Beijing Olympics in the Summer Olympics in 2008. In fact, Kevin Rudd, then the Prime Minister, launched another one of my books. But as soon as a Prime Minister launches my book, they seem to get rolled, so I could probably get a, a journalist instead. But um, at the Beijing Summer Olympics, that was at the peak of Australian-Chinese relations. We had the liquefied natural gas deal. A lot of the buildings that were built for the Summer Olympics, the water cube, uh, the bird's nest, were built by Australian architects. It was really a high point of China Australia relations. Now in the Winter Olympics, and Beijing is the only only city uh, to, to, to host both, um, it's quite different. As you say, there's COVID, 
as you say, there's diplomatic tensions. And China is, of course, not allowing international tourists uh, into the country. So uh, in some ways, I think the Winter Olympics, which is already a smaller scale economically compared to the Summer Olympics, the Winter Olympics is really about developing uh, some of the poor regions in China that have mountains that are, could get some potential from winter sports. I think Beijing has uh, produced something like, they've developed something like 800 uh, uh, ski, ski, new ski resorts, uh, I think 650 new ice rinks. So I think they're using the Winter Olympics really to build up a good winter sports industry in the parts of northern China, the, the colder parts that really need some economic development. I think the Summer Olympics for Beijing was about China and the world. I think this one is principally about developing that part of China uh, you know, domestically. Thank you. So um, China's One Belt, One Road initiative is, is a lot to unpack. It's come into the spotlight more recently and has been operating for quite some time, however. Um, along with the tensions that have been surrounding the Beijing Winter Olympics and some of the nation's decision to not sign the Olympic Treaty, there are also criticisms about how this One Belt, One Road uh, initiative could impact smaller economies and how, in your opinion, is this going to support China's goals of building up their middle class? Well, I think Sage, so, you're right. I, th I think One Belt, One Road was seen as a way to build up the modern version of the Silk Road when you know, China was very instrumental to world trade routes. Uh, and it's got that, uh, you know, it's got that feel for it, a sort of, you know, modern day Silk Road. Uh, but in some cases, particularly in the Pacific and in, in Africa, uh, there have been uh, demands put of very large loans for building infrastructure like key airports and, and sports stadiums uh, for soccer in Africa and so on. And it means that a lot of countries have been indentured to China in terms of loans, which could be quite difficult for them. And in some ways, I think um, the, the One Belt, One Road policy is more about geopolitics, it's more about strengthening uh, China's place in the world, uh, like the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. It's like, instead of building the WTO and the IMF, which China sees as very much European-American institutions, they want to build their own institutions. I think Belt and Road is part of that. Um, economically, uh, I don't think it's quite got the same case, but geopolitically, I can see why strategically China's used One Belt and Road uh, the way it has in terms of uh, locking countries into to infrastructure investments. Mm, thank you so much for sharing your insights there. It is a very big topic and it, we could, you could probably talk for hours on it, so thank you for succinctly relaying that information. How do you think now if we move on to um, the telecommunications space, how do you believe the ban from UK and Australia on Huawei's 5G services will further impact the foreign relations with China? It's been interesting, hasn't it? I mean, we've had this issue with Huawei in Australia, in the UK, uh, in, in Europe, uh, both Central Europe and Western Europe. Um, I think the issue here is it's not just about telecommunications, but a lot of it's to do with uh, security and being able to listen to people. And, you know, it's quite clear that China has large state-owned enterprises that are not, you know, individual in, individual independent companies, uh, you know, like, like a Telstra or like uh, General Electric. They are, you know, related to the Chinese state. So anything to do with telecommunications has you know, has cyber security and has, tele, has uh, you know, issues of state involved. So I think that's why countries have been very cautious uh, about Huawei. Um, Malcolm Turnbull, who I interviewed on uh, The Big Picture, uh, suggested that that was when some of the geopolitical tensions started, was when Australia started being cautious with Huawei uh, about 5G. And that was something that, as you say, we saw in the UK, uh, we've seen in Europe and we've seen uh, uh, right, a, right around the world. It's not just uh, Australia that's had issues with Huawei, it's countries all, all over the world, mainly because of the, uh, you know, the need to separate you know, business decisions from, from issues of geopolitics.
Right, thank you so much. Yes, national security is becoming more of a salient issue for Australia these days and um, I think it's important that they do place extra um, importance to this issue. So we have to start winding up the discussion now, Tim, uh, but I have to say I've read your book, The Airport Economist, or most of it, and I found it very inspiring. In fact, uh, it's instigated me to write a film, and uh, just a short one, well, but uh, yeah, so... Hopefully, if you can get your hands on it or watch the series out there, please do, because it is very inspiring, especially if you're trying to get a small business up off the ground. So, Tim, what are your predictions as a chief economist for the tra trajectory of Australia's economy this year, please? Do you think we're going to risk a fiscal drag? Well, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, one good thing about COVID is that we've got away from this debt and deficit uh, fetish that we used to have. I mean, we know that the most important thing is to uh, keep people employed, uh, you know, to drive unemployment down. And uh, the budget deficit or surplus is really uh, a means to that end. And I think for a long time in Australia, for political reasons, we're in a recession with uh, you know, having, having a surplus and uh, being concerned about debt when there's no reason for Australia to worry about our position fiscally. So I think the most important thing will be to ensure the labour market improves and um, for the Reserve Bank to keep its nerve uh, on inflation, which according to yesterday's decision it has. I think Philip Lowe is a very careful, cautious person, so I think he and the Reserve Bank won't get too spooked by the inflation pennies, which are predominantly to do, do with um, the disruptions to global supply chains that we've seen uh, in, in the international market. So uh, I think uh, if we can get over Omicron and if we can uh, see, uh, you know, proper vaccination boost, boosters and so on and a, uh, a move to not completely normal but to a post-COVID world, uh, I think Australia can manage itself economically reasonably well. Thank you, Tim, for your words there. And it's it's promising to see that we have in New South Wales uh, for small businesses just been offered uh, some further support through Service New South Wales as well. So um, it's good to see that the government is doing what they can to help businesses during this time. Thanks, Tim. Before we close off the discussion, was there anything you'd like to add for our viewers out there before you go? Well, I think um, for those people that get worried about uh, bad headlines and, um, and fear, remember that Australia is one of the best places in the world to be uh, when it comes to the, the pandemic. And uh, for all the fear you'll see in the media, uh, Australia's got very good fundamentals. So if we are very sensible about our public health messages and we get ourselves vaccinated and we uh, are reasonably careful with what we do, then I think it's important now to allow uh, the economy and small business to, to come back and recover some ground that they've lost uh, during COVID. And I've got great faith in entrepreneurs in Australia and small business, we're very adaptable. We've been able to adapt to bushfires, uh, to climate challenges, to floods, to famine, to all sorts of things. So I think that uh, I'm reasonably optimistic that this year will be much better than last year and the year before. There is definitely a very strong spirit bonding Australians, especially during these times. They really do have a resilience there to push through. And it's a very auspicious time to meet you on the road to the election campaign as well. So I'm sure you'll be, your comments would be more um, in demand during this time. So thank you for fitting us in. No worries. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you so much for watching. Hopefully you gained something from that very interesting discussion we just had with Mr Tim Harcourt, the Chief Economist at UTS and Sky News presenter. The full interview will be available from YouTube via Calkine Media, so keep watching for more of the live expert talks and live market updates. Until the next episode, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat.
exclusive to Calkine TV. Welcome to Expert Talks by Calkine TV. I'm Sage. Today's guest is Mr. Michael Bassina from Piper Alderman, a partner for FinTech and Financial Services. And Piper Alderman is a prestigious and award-winning Australian law firm who announced earlier this year that they would accept payments in Bitcoin. And today's guest will share insights from the trending cryptocurrency space in relation to regulations and decentralized autonomous organizations or DAOs. So this should be an interesting show. This year alone, 51 Piper Alderman lawyers have been recognized as the best in Australia with expertise covering 41 areas of law. Piper Alderman was also in the finals for three categories of the People's Choice Awards 2021. And early in 2021, Piper Alderman gained another accolade from the Legal 500 for 10 areas of law. So very excited to be bringing you live today, Mr. Michael Bassina, a partner at Piper Alderman for the FinTech and Financial Services Division. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thanks so much for having me on. Well, we're honoured to have you and we think it's important to raise awareness about DAOs and the emergence of cryptocurrency and blockchain into the mainstream. So we'd love to hear your insights on our Expert Talks show today. So Michael, it's a fairly new uh, concept, this idea of a decentralised board. How is leadership different in a DAO compared to traditional corporate boards? Is there a limit to the number of DAOs one can be in as well, please? So DAOs are a brand new form of organization and people are coming together and creating them using uh, blockchain technology and tokens to, to vote as well as smart contracts to manage the processes by which uh, the decisions are executed inside a DAO. So it's important to recognize that these are not a form of organizing that was created by uh, parliament or pushed out as a particular kind of tax incentive. This is something that's origin originated organically and that creates a whole set of really interesting problems because this is not something where there are rules set out in a Corporations Act, for example. In a DAO, the rules are effectively written by the DAO itself or when it is created to say these are the rules of, of how it will be governed. So there are DAOs where there is a governing council. Synthetics is a good example of that, uh, where there might be sort of an inner group of people elected to then make important decisions. Uh, there are DAOs that are reliant purely on the voting of the token holders within the DAO. So there's no theoretical limit to how many now, someone could participate in, but there is no traditional board in the sense of company boards. So it's mm -hmm. very, very new, and most of the existing laws simply don't work around it. In fact, DAOs have no particular legal status at present, um, and we'll just have to see how they evolve um, and how governments respond. And Australia's been lucky enough to be leading in that space. Yes, it's fantastic to hear that Australia is quite open to the evolution of the internet currencies and uh, it'll be interesting to see which way this goes but also it'll be interesting to see how uh, whether waiting for uh, you know what I mean how much weight each vote will have in the governance of these DAOs uh, you know in regards to how much people have invested as well um, that really makes uh, my cogs and screws tick and in regards to the egalitarian nature of them. It sounds wonderful in theory, and, and I wonder how well Synthetics DAO is going along. Um, would you happen to have any insight on how they're operating? Is it going well for Synthetics? Well, that's certainly held up as one of the early examples, and that mm. was a, a group that, that came out and did an ICO many years ago and then transitioned to a full DAO, and the founder, uh, Kane Warwick, who lives in Sydney um, and is a very well-known figure in crypto Twitter, has stepped back from that position of being viewed as sort of the founder and leader to um, permit others to govern what's happening in the in the DAO and how that the decisions will be made around that. Mm, very interesting. Thank you for those insights there, Michael. So how can Austrac, who is a financial regulator, how can their guidelines aid to develop and regulate the future of further DAOs in Australia uh, in relation to such things as know your customer and zero knowledge ID, which I think are transactions um, pseudonymously still allowed in DAOs? Well, the position is there's uh, only regulation for those providing fiat currency to digital currency conversion services under Austrac's jurisdiction. So Austrac looks after anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing. That's their remit. Um, 
they, as long as a DAO is not engaging in that kind of conversion service or another designated service, then they simply wouldn't have any registration or enrollment requirement with Austrack. However, there is broad definitions of what constitutes international remittance uh, and that could get picked up there. But at, at the moment, I'm not aware of any specific guidance or uh, any rules that are out there for Austrack relating to DAO specifically. What we do know is coming is the Bragg inquiry about really um, forward thinking recommendations, including one of them was to consider whether Australia should implement a new company structure to accommodate DAOs. And that recommendation was accepted by the treasurer who just um, last week gave a speech indicating that that would be moving forward. That's quite world leading. So if Australia manages to come through and it may take 12 or, eight, or 18 or 24 months, mm. but to come forward with a new company structure, which is, I would imagine it would look at, look very much like a highly automated company, uh, perhaps without any kind of traditional looking board, but that could be world leading in that, in that space. And we would imagine as part of that consultation and legislative development, those issues around uh, the pseudonymous nature of blockchains, which when you really get down to it, are not particularly anonymous at all. Mm -hmm. blockchain, public blockchains are incredibly traceable and not very private. And increasingly, we're seeing that um, function being offered by private companies that have been collecting all the data from public blockchains so that they can be analyzed and looked at more closely. You can identify someone from metadata if you have enough of it. Uh, but there's other companies who are also working around the know your customer space to say, well, if you can have an ID token, which is attached to um, a, DA a some kind of governance token in a DAO in a positive way, then you could have people opt in to be identified. I know in the Wyoming example, they have a LL structure that can be used to operate a DAO and wallet addresses are recognized as shareholders inside those um, special Wyoming LLC companies. Now they're of course grappling with the issues of being the first, really first in the world to kind of bring out that corporate structure that ties into a DAO. And many of us are grateful for Wyoming because it lets us learn from what's worked and what could be done better that hopefully we can bring into the Australian context and make sure that our regulations are fit for purpose and help keep jobs and businesses here. Thank you, Michael. Um, it's, it's just so exciting to be part of the Australian financial infrastructure at the moment and seeing it um, evolve with Commonwealth Bank's big news about their pilot platform um, now enabling cryptocurrencies. It's, it's pretty plain to see that things are moving forward and maybe that cryptocurrency will become more widely accepted. Do you think it's important for the regulators, however, during this time to take into consideration whether an organisation is crypto native like Synthetics before it can become a DAO or do you think it should be open to any type of organisation? I think it will be, um, that is a little bit of a chicken and egg question because the nature of DAOs organi organically growing from people self-organising online. A great example of that was a couple of weeks ago a group of people came together to form the Constitution DAO, which was trying to buy an early original um, original copy or from the first printing of the US Constitution. And they managed to raise $45 million in one week. So it's not so much whether someone is crypto native, but under the uh, understanding of DAOs as they exist at the moment, they by definition are crypto native because they are using these um, smart contracts to run voting automatically and be able to seek the permission or consent of all of the token holders in a form of governance for pretty much any decision. So another way of thinking about it, I suppose, conceptually is uh, companies at the moment appoint a board in part because shareholders don't have time to be in and shouldn't be involved in day-to-day -day operations. And also it's completely impractical to take every decision to shareholders. However, in a DAO, um, there is the ability for near every decision that a business or organization wants to do to be put up for shareholder vote or have standing voting positions uh, set by governance token holders, which is a really, really interesting experiment in uh, what the boundaries are or what the directions are for an organization that could use a structure like that, as opposed to a company where once the director is appointed, they have a lot of obligations personally to the shareholders, but also a great deal of power. Uh, and we see that in the battle for boards in, in various listed entities and the, and the complexity and litigation that arises from that. There could be some really interesting solutions that come out of uh, DAOs that could be quite useful in the traditional corporate models as well. Yes, well, it sounds similar uh, to the companies or the corporations that allow their staff to have shares in the company. I think Bunnings does. Uh, Wise Tech Global also offers their staff after six months some shares. Sorry, some shares in the company. So it sounds like it's got an altruistic um, concept or idea behind it. Um, I wonder if it will offer more liquidity to the people involved. The actual 
governance token holders. That'll be interesting to I know. I think that's a big, big benefit. There's a lot of mm. the, most of the DAOs that have been created, the original teams that are involved are receiving tokens from their early participation in the in the project. And some projects even have a smart contract which is generating and releasing tokens over time. So definitely those who have been setting up these DAOs are, are benefiting greatly, particularly when the market price for these tokens, for whatever reason, jumps. So uh, definitely in relation to that kind of liquidity issue is vastly better in the blockchain world in terms of knowing what something's worth. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that it's all, all good. Token prices might be shooting up because there's also technological locks that could be put on tokens to say, okay, the team's going to have this much percent of the of the governance tokens, but they're not going to have them for this period of time, or they're going to have automatic digital vesting over a period of time. That is just simply being done because people can do it. So they're using the smart contracts to enforce it. And that's in connection with this this um, notion that some people have of code. Code is law is the idea. Of course, it's not. But um, when they set up a DAO this way that will operate, that everyone can see the code because it's all open source and see how it operates, then you can have certainty that if someone is an early participant and they're going to have X number of tokens vest over this period of time, everyone can see that that is going to happen. And there's no need for any kind of specific disclosure because it's all already there in the code available for anyone who wants to have a look at it. Great. Hopefully it will be that easily um, practiced, <laughs> um, you know, following the code uh, ethically and, and wisely. So Michael, we're not far away from Singapore. Um, however, the UK and Singapore are offering licenses to Australian um, DCEs and Singapore is proving to be a, a, a pulsing crypto hub these days. Do you think Australia is missing out on opportunities for expansion by not having these regulations established yet? I think that's a very good uh, question and I think we are. I think that is now turned around with the Treasurer coming out last week and accepting the Bragg recommendation that we establish a market license regime for digital currency exchanges. Um, I think there's a clear benefit to having the, that kind of licensing in place. Uh, Senator Hume has been, I, I think, reported as seeking a light touch and I think certainly Senator Bragg wishes to have that approach as well and while we have a Liberal Party uh, moving that agenda forward, I would imagine it will be a fairly light touch approach. We have seen and I've seen firsthand and certainly submitted to the recent Senate inquiry, businesses have been leaving Australia to go to jurisdictions that have greater levels of certainty and uh, very positively supportive regulators around uh, what can or can't be done, particularly around what can be done because the blockchain and crypto world is quite interesting in that a lot of people running new startups want to go and talk to regulators and say, is this okay? And regulators are not used to those kinds of discussions. They're far more used to an enforcement role and dealing with people who are actively uh, looking at what can be done and perhaps in some cases, you know, what, what is technically legal, um, whether or not it meets the spirit of law is a bit different. Uh, and that's been an, an interesting um, point of friction, I think. So in the context of seeing people go offshore, losing jobs, losing investment. I think the um, Australian government has recognised that's a serious problem and that the licensing that's proposed for digital currency exchanges should be able to help address that as well as, we hope, addressing the debanking problems which plague the digital currency exchange industry and also protecting consumers from issues of collapse. We've seen a couple of um, relatively high profile collapse exchanges um, over the last couple of years and that's not something that anyone in the industry wants to see and having some kind of licensing and oversight of uh, digital currency exchanges will be very useful in the future because there'll be some ongoing um, requirements around custody in particular when people are holding other people's money is the touchstone for when there should be some government oversight but as long as we're doing it in light touch fashion hopefully we can be competitive or better than the uk or singaporean models uh, and keep more of the crypto and blockchain businesses here which is a wonderful place to have them, both from a jobs and lifestyle perspective for them, but for the Australian economy as well. Yes, it would be great to see Australia keeping um, keeping up with the, the global pace that this technology is evolving at. So how will central bank digital currencies, who seem to be popping up in the headlines every now and then, how will the central development of central bank digital, digital currencies and capital gains tax impact the regulations that are being de developed and surrounding the DAOs, please. Look, capital gains tax in the recent government announcement has been sent to the Board of tax Taxation to give advice back to the government. There's 
really interesting issues around when a taxable event occurs. So when there's a series of transactions that are effectively between automated software driven contracts, there's a very real question of does every single time there be a small change in value of tokens as they move through multiple automated steps uh, create an obligation on a taxpayer to provide that reporting all the way down the line or is there a way that can be dealt with uh, from a tax position to make it simple and efficient. Uh, there's certainly a technological solution that that is crying out to be to be uh, considered to have taxation dealt with by machines because why not uh, and there's a lot of discussion I think in consideration to be had there so there will be consultation over the next six months by the Board of Taxation around that before advice will go to the government and that's going to be pretty important I think in connection with DAOs because if they are recognized under a form of company structure here then we're going to need to see how they're going to fit into the company tax regime and at what point will um, revenue and other matters be recognized there and how will GST go into it and other, th other um, tax obligations, things like stamp duty. On the central bank digital currency front, we seem to be a fair way away from what might be called a retail central bank digital currency where you might see a digital Australian dollar that mums and dads could get hold of. The most exciting thing to come out recently is Project Atom, which involved several major banks and the Reserve Bank uh, looking at syndicated loan settlement and issuance on a private Ethereum blockchain, which is currently done through complicated bespoke documents involving Reserve Bank and the banks. But this proof of concept showed that there was a vastly more efficient way of doing it, uh, building on the Reserve Bank's previous um, investigations and research into using private installations of Ethereum to run other wholesale issuance. So I think Australia's moving along quite well in looking at a, what will be called a wholesale CBDC, that is as between the Reserve Bank and commercial banks. Um, but it might be a ways, a ways yet until we see something as between the commercial banks and mums and dads and small businesses and medium businesses that could use a fully digital Australian dollar. Luckily, we have things like the NPP and near instant transactions for a lot of payments. Mm -hmm. However, there'll be certain significant benefits from a retail CBDC, not the least of which is as you rightly point out, it could be greater integration into DAOs. There could be really interesting financial products that could be offered out of smart contracts uh, and automated ways of handling even smaller amounts of lending that could be completely automated. And going to that level of automation and efficiency for reporting um, simply means cost savings at the end of the day. A lot of people get very excited and think of blockchain as a mysterious world with near cult-like obsessives. But at the end of the day, it really represents a technology like the internet which can connect a lot of people, reduce the costs of doing business and automate a great deal of things, which we would rather as a society be automated now. Yes, true that. Welcome to the future. I think cryptocurrencies speaking out uh, quite loudly through um, its users. So Michael, reaching the end of our discussion and thank you so much for joining us and sharing your, your valuable insights. Um, do you think the establishment of DAOs will promote smart investments in Australia? Absolutely. This is about reducing costs uh, of doing business at the end of the day, as I just mentioned. Having, uh, for anyone who's dealt with the corporate governance requirements around companies, will understand why there's a number of startups and registry companies and the like that offer interfaces which are currently dealing with old legacy systems around things like you know share certificates and how new shares are issued. There's a, there's a complicated series of, of um, paperwork that needs to be done all the time and that creates an awful lot of work. Um, moving towards a world where that kind of work which is needs to be done right but can be done by a machine simply means that you're talking about a form of organizing that's vastly cheaper. As I mentioned earlier that example, who, who would set up a company and get $45 million raised into it in one week for a very specific purpose? Um, answer no one under traditional company arrangements however these guys in america and, and girls did it in a dow so that ability to move really fast um subject to how the regulations come out could be incredibly powerful for people setting up uh, new ways of raising capital and having them having a radical form of transparency will it you know eliminate spivs and people trying to run scams and and what not? No, but those exist at the moment with people trying to raise money into companies. Things will succeed or fail, and it's not government's job to try and pick the winners. But being able to have a radical, tra radically transparent um, treasury in particular, because you, you can think about tokens in a DAO almost like being able to see into the bank accounts of a company that you've bought shares into, for, for want of a better analogy. 
being able to see what's sitting there in funds and how it is moving is a really interesting level of transparency that current boards don't have to face outside of audited reports and other other um, financial updates to the market. But a DAO has another interesting feature that that's real time. So if a DAO wishes to raise funds for a particular purpose, everybody who's in it, based on how they're currently being used, can see how the funds are being deployed the second that they're being deployed and can see where they're going. So there's a really interesting aspect of um, surveillance by everyone, which may well see practically fraud and other matters eliminated for all practical purposes because of that oversight. And it creates an opportunity for automated oversight as well, so that those inside the inside a DAO structure who are perhaps delegating functions for payments to be made and other things can um, have oversight of what, what is happening with payments and know the moment that it's happened. That kind of stuff is, is a lot more automatable. And those are very interesting because that, in relation to most blockchain, actually sits outside of the current banking system. So it's not something that would rely on that existing SWIFT network globally for making payments. Blockchain payments happen wherever you are in the world very, very quickly mm -hmm. uh, and resolve generally if you're using something like blockchain or Ethereum, sorry, Bitcoin or Ethereum, within an hour we'll have finality. Um, and it's simply, there's no other way to send that kind of value anywhere in the world at that speed with that level of surety uh, to compare to the normal banking system. So I think that speeding up even that payment rails alone is incredible. Making the cost of it near zero relative to other options is also incredible. So having to just have those two improvements alone, mm. almost by definition, is going to help improve where how funds will be deployed and how fast they can be deployed and take advantage of opportunities that otherwise need a longer lead time. So I think that the, I think your question, the answer to your question is a resounding yes. Within five to ten years, subject to regulation, we may see this become a very dominant force of uh, form of corporate organisation. Well, Michael, thank you so much for shedding light on what can be quite a, a murky area at the moment. People trying to understand something that seems like it's in a different universe almost, but it's becoming more and more real and more practical, practically um, accessible. So, Michael, really do appreciate your insights. I've noticed, however, security tokens are also coming more in the spotlight. That's a regulated space. Um, do you have anything to add on that and how it relates with the regulations being developed for DAOs just before we close off? Of course. So there's been a lot of talk about security tokens for the last, I think, four years from when the early ICO days were 2017, 2018, and the Securities and Exchange Commission of America was saying, OK, a lot of these token offerings might be securities under US law. Uh, we've had Joe Longo before the Senate recently saying uh, tokens aren't financial products in Australia and then qualifying it a bit. But the fundamental position seems to be uh, there's certainly not been any kind of prosecutions in Australia for token issuers. Um, and there's very high profile people involved in DAOs here uh, and it seems that um, there hasn't been any huge issues around that. So a number of people, however, have been looking at how can we issue something which is very much a financial product but is completely tokenized and that is a challenge. So uh, there, I know of a number of projects that are trying to do that and are trying to essentially replicate what is permissible at law uh, using blockchain tokens uh, as a bit of an intermediary but there are some challenges because of that traditional way open blockchain systems haven't had identification tied in by virtue of how they're designed so that you wouldn't have uh, everyone's identity attached to their transactions publicly. So a lot of those projects look at using what's called permissioned systems which aren't open to the public to see everything, mm -hmm. but there's generally someone in control over the top who can undo transactions and, and modify things along the way. But obviously if that's being being used, you can't use the uh, as easily the public blockchains for moving payments around in an integral way of that kind of system. But I think that we will see some forms of security tokens coming out that will be recognized. And it may be if we have the regulations right and a corporate structure is set up for DAOs, then nearly by definition, the governance tokens being issued or any kind of ownership token being issued out of the DAO will probably be a security or considered a security. And that may well tie into the licensing around digital currency exchanges. I think we're going to see a merger um, or collision of traditional financial markets and a lot of digital currency because it is simply so much more efficient to do these things on tokens uh, and be able to have them moving around globally between different markets. You know, the global liquidity of Bitcoin itself is quite extraordinary to be able to move move it around compared to the traditional uh, financial system, which is reliant on country-based uh, walled gardens, if you will, and then international agreements and reconciliations that take a lot of a lot of time and expense. The blockchain takes care of all of that reconciliation near instantly. Uh, and, and gives that trusted platform for transactions. So that's really exciting there. 
Yes, absolutely. I think another com Australian company, Immutable X, is, is quite uh, prevalent in their emergence of how they can help the banks save money with just about 10 lines of smart contract code. Sort of interesting to see if they are able to provide more liquidity for many industries with that same type of code. Michael, the banks have been coming up in the news not for the best things recently, which is giving the argument for the emergence of this decentralised peer-to-peer -peer transfers of money a lot more clout, wouldn't you agree? Um, any thoughts to share on that? Well, that's a tricky one. We don't, you know, <laughs> until, until such time as people can get bank loans from a digital currency, which I don't think is going to happen in a, no. in a short period of time. There's going to be a lot of lot of space for the banks to be providing all the services that people like to have, and many people will want to have banking services in the traditional way. Um, I think that it, what it does do is sharpen competition. Uh, if the banks um, are worried about foreign, foreign exchange, for example, being done on blockchain, and there's a number of companies which, for all intents, feel like you're just dealing with a normal Forex company, but they're keeping the blockchain aspects in the under the hood so that they can deliver really low cost uh, performance to their customers, that kind of competition sharpens the bank's uh, view of things. And certainly when you see the Commonwealth Bank bringing out plans to give their all of the, essentially all of their internet banking customers access to buy and sell digital currencies as well, and we're seeing a number of other businesses that are doing that, you, it's following the demand. They're not doing this simply to be innovative. They're doing it because customers want it. So I, th I think you're right. There's a growing demand and interest in the space. Uh, and certainly, it looks like the, the financial sector is, after quite a few years of perhaps ignoring it or shunning it, is finally moving around to say this is not going away. Mm -hmm. This is quite interesting. And, and once they get to know what's happening there and see that you know a lot of the traditional stories of, oh, it's used for money laundering and crime are just not at all true because you can track people quite easily when they're committing crime on, on blockchains. You might have an issue with enforcing once you've located where they are because it's in a different country. Mm -hmm. However. That's the same problem if someone uses Western Union or, or other forms of moving money around. But I think that definitely the banks will feel that that pressure of of um, competition and other sectors as well. You mentioned Immutable X, which is mm -hmm. uh, Immutable has a whole range of games they've been running for years that are, that are based on almost collector cards and the whole NFT boom around that having digital collectibles. It's a brand new product, which many DAOs are issuing NFTs and, and um, being created in relation to NFTs. And this is um, something that's never been done before and people say oh it's a massive bubble and you go sure it is but so is every market when it comes out and we'll be really interested to see how even just that NFT space settles down to be a product that people want to buy in the future and then you've got these amazing DAO setups for people who want to organize in a different way it wouldn't surprise me if every sporting club in the country is running as some kind of DAO in the future because the mm. software is essentially free that's another beautiful part of how these DAOs and a lot of blockchain systems work is it's open source code that anyone can take and improve upon. So it's not a closed system where you can only buy a product from a company and you're reliant on that company to run the code. Every time someone rolls out a DAO with something new, anyone can take that code and make it better. And that model has worked really well in the internet um, via things like Apache Server and other matters. And when there's an error that gets discovered, it gets fixed really quickly. Um, as we, we saw in the last week, Apache had a, had a bug come out that was quite serious, but it gets addressed fast. Uh, and that brings together that incredible power of so many different bright minds working on and contributing to software that there's no charge for to use uh, and really businesses make money around the support and implementation of that software which is um, itself a very powerful change in the business and operating models. Thank you Michael, really do appreciate your insights today and hopefully we'll see more of that bridge being built with the legacy financial system as we know it and this new emerging cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. I thank you again for your time amidst your busy schedule. Thanks so much for having me on. And if you've just joined us, we had a very interesting discussion. Mr. Michael Bassino, a partner from Piper Alderman for the FinTech and Financial Services Division. And if you have want to, sorry, if you do want to watch the full interview, please check it out at YouTube. It's Calkine Media where you'll find it and keep watching for more expert talks, live market updates. And as we say, till the next episode, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine.
I am Sage and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me Sage on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Stocks to watch, DocuSign, TSM and Twilio. How do you think Netflix personalizes your viewing recommendations or the match group shows you the most likely matches on Tinder or Visa and MasterCard keep your credit cards safe from fraud and money laundering? It's all done through artificial intelligence or AI. The emergence of blockchain technology is to be seen as a method of maintaining an ethical manner for the deploying of AI. And this is noted by the European Parliament Resolution on Ethical Aspects of Artificial Intelligence, Robotics and Related Technologies. If advances in technology continue, it's expected the demand for memory chips will grow, especially for the AI sector. Just look at self-driving cars. They require sensors and cameras that produce a lot of data and require AI. Please subscribe to the channel and watch this video to find out more. I'm Sage for Calcine Media. Although cycles of boom and bust are the norm for the semiconductor sector, the increased need for advances in technology are boosting growth in mobile networks, 5G, cloud computing, who have created data centers, running AI processes, all needing storage facilities and memory for the work automated through artificial intelligence. The supply and demand model does impact the industry, and this is where oversupply causes a retraction of prices. In 2021, we saw the opposite. Demand for memory chips is strong, and the supply crunch the industry is facing is causing the prices to go up. DocuSign Inc. is an interesting company, an electronic signature specialist that has included investing into AI technology as part of its strategy to increase the efficiency of its services. The company is confident in its outlook for a bullish long-term growth in their share of the $14 billion e-signature market. Contract AI allows businesses to automate the sorting of big data, including contracts, court cases, regulatory provisions with the power to identify potential sources of security vulnerabilities, regulatory breaches from legal and privacy issues as well. Twilio, you may have heard of them. They're an American company with a very bullish outlook for the long term. Its expertise is in cloud communications platform as a service company. And Twilio offers software developers the chance to make and receive phone calls, text messages and other communication functions using APIs. Twilio's revenue is expected to grow in the 30% range annually throughout 2023. Plus, to its credit, the company's growth strategy involves sprawling acquisitions and Twilio confirmed it's invested up to $750 million in Sinoverse. Additionally, TWLO is a favourite stock for the ETFs and the best performing ETF with 
TWLO as a holding is the iShares US Technology ETF with a return of approximately 30%. Lastly for today, the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company Limited. Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing produces state-of-the-art AI chips designed by major players like NVIDIA, Qualcomm Inc, as well as Apple Inc. And TSM also funds its own in-house AI hardware research and has plans to increase its capex for 2022, veering 80% towards advanced nodes. And the Taiwan Semiconductor is using the strategy of putting money toward better technology in the aim to produce the most cost-effective margins to meet the demand for semiconductors. Many analysts encourage buying the dips in the share price. Thanks for joining us in the report. And please keep watching Calkine TV for further live updates and market uh, expert live talks. But if you like this information, let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below and subscribe to that channel. Press the bell icon, you'll be notified of the latest videos. But also, head to the website, calkinemedia.com. I'm Sage here for Calkine Media. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Stars and crypto scams, instances of alleged blockchain fraud. Let's look at notable sportsmen or clubs who have been involved or accused of crypto scams. Please subscribe to the channel. I'm Sage for Calcai Media.
Who do you claim to be the biggest name of the boxing world in recent times? Arguably, many would say Floyd Mayweather. Let's start there. Floyd Mayweather was sued by investors over promoting the Ethereum Max crypto. Mayweather had endorsed Ethereum Max during a boxing match with YouTube star Logan Paul, wherein the crypto token was used to purchase tickets. He's being sued, accused of manipulating the price of Ethereum Max and has yet to disclose the fortune he made by promoting the token. Besides, he was also under the radar for promoting his digital art piece titled Legacy released on the Rarible Marketplace. For this, Mayweather was fined by the US Securities and Exchange Commission, which was settled by paying a fine of over US $600,000. Faiz Clan. A leading esports group called the Faiz Clan was under the lens amid allegations of a pump and dump crypto scam. The FaZe Clan kicked out one individual and suspended three of its members in July last year, wherein members of the FaZe Clan pumped the prices of cryptos called Save the Kids. FaZe kicked out Frazier, K, Katri from the FaZe Clan and suspended Jarvis Katri, Nikan, Nadim and Jacob for the crypto scam. It was alleged that these said members promoted the token to increase its fan base and buyers who bought the token ended up losing money. 17 out of 20 EPL clubs accused of exploiting supporters According to a survey, 17 out of 20 English Premier League clubs had fingers pointed at them for exploiting supporters in the same name of fan tokens. The survey included that the said number of clubs have one or more deals with crypto companies despite concerns related to potential crypto fraud. In fact, Manchester City was forced to suspend a deal with a crypto firm, Three Key Technologies. In conclusion, the recent Gareth Southgate incident has just emphasised that crypto frauds have entered the sporting world as well. And although the reach is limited, it could increase in the sporting arena if it goes unregulated. At the same time, it's critical for investors, fans and organisations to stay vigilant, to stay away from such crypto frauds. Thanks for your company in the report. If you like this info, let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below and subscribe to that channel. Press the bell icon, you'll be notified of the latest videos by Kalkine. For more information and updates, head to the website kalkinemedia.com. I'm Sage for Kalkine Media. Hello there, I'm Sage. Great to have your company on Calkine TV and this is the Daily Crypto Catch, brought to you by Crossgate Capital. And let's now catch up on the past 24 hours from the crypto space. First in Bitcoin news, the chief executive of investment firm ARK Invest has made a startling prediction saying that Bitcoin could hit 1 million US dollars by 2030. The reasoning cited by ARK CEO Catherine Wood included Bitcoin's increasing adoption across the world. The bold prediction comes at a time when Bitcoin is in the midst of a cold winter currently priced at 38,500 US dollars. And that being said, the past week has been somewhat of a turnaround for the world's largest cryptocurrency, which was valued at $33,500 on the 24th of January. And now let's take a short break and we'll be back with today's biggest winners and losers. So stay tuned. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV.
Welcome back to the Crypto Catch on Calkine TV, brought to you by Crossgate Capital. Now for the altcoin news. The DM Foundation, which makes the cryptocurrency called DM, which runs Facebook's Meta Project, has announced the sale of assets of the cryptocurrency venture to Silvergate Capital Corporation for 182 million US dollars. Although the project was launched in 2019, then known as Libra, it unfortunately ran into barriers put up by policymakers and it became quickly apparent that the project could no longer move ahead. DM Chief Executive Stuart Levy wrote yesterday that the only path forward for DM was to sell its assets. Initially, Facebook intended for DM to be a stablecoin. However, this was met with resistance. In 2019, Professor Ross Buckley at the University of New South Wales told the BBC that the project would quickly become too big and was unlikely to get easy treatment from regulators. Indeed, regulators did put it under heavier scrutiny, leading DM to hit a roadblock. And yesterday, Facebook's former crypto head and DM co-creator, David Marcus, tweeted the idea might fare better with a more acceptable promoter. Moving on now to today's winners and losers over the past 24 hours. Eunice said Leo grew over 19% in the past 24, while Mina jumped nearly 12%. Meanwhile, Flo dropped 9% in the past 24 hours and Uniswap fell as well, 5.5% over the same period. And thanks for your company on today's report. But that's all for the Daily Crypto Catch. Stay tuned to Calkine TV for the latest market updates, business news and exclusive interviews. Sage signing off for now. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's TechBeat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The TechBeat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Welcome to the Expert Talks by Calkine TV. I'm Sage. Today's guest is Mr. Omran Al-Habal, the CEO and the Forward Program Director at Birmingham Enterprise Community. Do you have a great tech idea that you think could create a new tech startup but don't have the resources or perhaps the knowledge of how to get it off the ground? Well, you're not alone. The Birmingham Enterprise Community is an award-winning organization that supports a global community of entrepreneurs and businesses through a range of programs and initiatives that support these entrepreneurs from the concept phase all the way through to supporting high-growth scale-ups. 
So keep watching to find out more. Excited to bring you live today, Mr. Omran Al Habal, CEO and the Forward Program Director, which we'll hopefully find out more about at Birmingham Enterprise Community. Welcome to the show, Omran. Hi, Sage. Thank you for uh, welcoming me today. Well, we're very keen to hear your insights, Omran. You have travelled extensively, gaining valuable knowledge in the establishment of tech startups globally. And with your wide breadth of knowledge, uh, we believe you'd have some valuable insights to share. So let's get started. Um, you've had first-hand experience with entrepreneurs across the world, helping them develop their ideas. What are your uh, I thoughts on the circular economy. We're interested to hear, Omran. Okay. Uh, actually, this year we kicked off the year with uh, a program about circular economy and sustainability. Um, it's, I think, it is the future. And uh, when we launched the project, we got eight times the numbers that we, we expected. Uh, which shows you that there is a very like a, there is a gap in the market. There is a need uh, for knowledge, knowing more about the circular economy, how it works, and it's becoming more of not only knowing why we should be sustainable or why we should follow the circular economy, but it's about how and how to put the knowledge into practice and implement it in the businesses and the startups that we built. Because at the end. We have limited resources of everything. You've just mentioned that not everyone has all the resources. And on planet Earth, we have limited resources as well. So we need to make sure that we use those resources over and over again, rather than consuming them uh, and losing them. That's great. I think the world really appreciates smart people who are able to think outside the square, find the problems, but turn them into... Um, reasons to be uh, giving people purpose and, and responsibility and I think it's solutions based uh, these tech startups I'm finding these days. Is your enterprise, uh, Birmingham Enterprise Community, a not-for-profit, Amran? Well, we are uh, CIC, so it's a community interest company, which is a mix between the not-for-profit and the limited liability company. Um, so any profit the company made can reinvest the majority of it into the business again so we can serve the community and with this structure as well there is an accountability by the stakeholders so we can so none of the directors at Birmingham Enterprise Community for example have the power to um, to stay in the in the organizations if they are not working toward the interest of the community, the accountable body of the community as company, um, legally, they are, they have the power to get them off the company if they are not working towards the, um, the best interest uh, of our community. And that's why we chose this uh, specific structure because it gives us the um, flexibility to serve wider community uh, using the advantage of the both structures, the NGOs and the limited liability. It's fantastic hybrid model. There sounds um, very. It sounds like it gives accountability to everyone involved and makes them feel like they're really playing an important part in the organisation, which sounds great. So uh, I'm noticing we've been through a pandemic era, and there've been so many new startups, really. Uh, opportunities evolving in deliveries and, and other things that you're probably finding in the circular economy. And in your opinion, which industry have you noticed thriving the best this year and creating a lucrative space for startups? Well, <laughs> I've, I've been asked this question last week and I think it's the industry that um, whoever the building the business is good at. So don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say there is specific industry because at the end there is always a space for innovation there is always a space to do better in a service or a product that we have in the market um, so we can usually people say it's tech industries or like we're going to be talking about the metaverse or the nft is coming out now uh, but at the end you can at the same time see that there is there is uh, simply there's clothing companies making like being unicorns and competing with the giants 
around the world. Um, so I would say the industry that you are good at, you have access to, you know, the right people in it, it would be your um, industry to go into uh, this year. The idea is to take action on the uh, things that you are good at. So I wouldn't say there is a specific industry. Um, of course, like um, there's a lot of focus into or, or resources being deployed into the sustainability that you, you've just said. So anything um, going into uh, sustainable um, uh, impact is favorable. Uh, there's the ed tech and the mid tech and the agri tech. Uh, and again, um, it's all uh, to make an impact and build a better future uh, communities and societies. Yes, it's great to see that people who've had to have a bit of a sea change because of the pandemic are using some of their transferable skills and applying them to help uh, the circular economy and, and other parts of industry that have openings or have been thriving through this downturn. So by the end of 2021, you received several awards, Omar, and congratulations. What makes Birmingham Enterprise Community distinctive in the market, according to yourself? Well, I think because we are friendly and we like to <laughs> work with everyone. <laughs> so um, we are uh, an independent organization. So in our sector, in this market, uh, being independent gives you the flexibility to be working with everyone and to collaborate with everyone. And whenever we, when you're uh, going with uh, an open mind and um, to work with others in your industry, that's going to expand your resources. That's going to build a trust between yourselves and even those who might be your competitors. Um, and that will raise your stake uh, in the market, I think. Uh, and of course, Birmingham Enterprise Community was created by entrepreneurs for entrepreneurs. Um, and we, whenever we are working with a business or a startup or an entrepreneur with just an idea, we work with them and we open their minds to collaborate with others as well. So we do not put restrictions on them of working with whoever can provide value for them. We will direct them on their way. Um, and I think this is what set us apart. Having this um, independency and flexibility to be working with everyone uh, and building strong relationships with everyone uh, in the market and in the industry. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your insights there. So we've found that the work arena is evolving. It's becoming more remote. Um, we're finding that there's more opportunities to tweak processes, automate it, make it more technological. Um, according to you, what are the key factors determining the success of a startup business, Omran? Key factor for success uh, for <laughs> a business. <laughs> um, I would say, uh, have, uh, again, having the right people around them and be open-minded to for advice. Um, you've just mentioned if uh, saying that if you have an idea and you would like to start on um, organizations like Birmingham Enterprise Community can provide you with the knowledge that you need. Um, even myself, when I first graduated from the business school, I thought like I have all the knowledge I need. I know everything in business and I can start a business right away uh, knowing the game. But it's not it's not the case. Uh, you need to uh, look for support, uh, have a mentor. Um, uh, look at what you need as an infrastructure for your business in real world, regardless of a university, your university studies, for example. Um, it's really important to know that learning from the other's mistakes is very important. Um, so if you get yourself with the right people who have the right mindset uh, of building businesses or they have built businesses before, uh, that's going to give you an advantage. Um, Sometimes there is the mistake where people think um, I have the product that is the best in the market, the best idea, and I just need, for example, the funding to do it or the money or the investment. It's not the best idea yet. To be the best idea, you need to be committed to it and put in the effort first, showing others that you are committed um, to build this next big thing so you can attract people to be working with you um, so I would say commitment and having the right uh, people around you the right team 
Absolutely. Thank you so much. We're starting to wind up the discussion now. Diversification can sometimes help to keep a company buoyant. However, at the startup stage, uh, what, what are your thoughts on diversification? Do you think it's better to hone in on one angle when you're a startup? When you are a startup, when you first start, anyway, when you start your business, you're going to find yourself going in multiple directions. So you might try like this product and then improve, change it to another uh, and this service and add this as a complementary. And you're going to be testing and experimenting and then uh, visiting again. So I would say at the start, there's going to be a lot of diversification. Mm -hmm. At the start, you might find yourself doing a lot of things. And it's okay because entrepreneurship and startups is about uh, building things, testing them, get a feedback and improve. Um, so there is nothing wrong about diversification at the start, but have in your mind that at some point you need to channel things, you need to make things clear. Mm -hmm. You need to decide which way you are moving forward. As you said, because once you've decided on this, you can build the processes to automate and include technology that's right for the path that you're following. Sure, thank you so much. So lastly, Omran, what's going on with Birmingham Enterprises Community for the Focus? Where are you headed in 2022? We're keen to find out. Well, 2022 is going to be an interesting uh, year. To be honest, we have a lot of, we have high hopes for this year to uh, even expand the business um, bigger. Uh, we are going to be um, working closely with the scale-ups uh, and we're going to be encouraging more building relationships between the businesses that we work with. So uh, we want to, um, let's say, we work, because we work internationally as well, we want to expand that and we already have some relationship with Australia uh, building there. We want to have businesses, let's say, in Australia working with businesses in the UK, um, exchanging knowledge, we want to facilitate more of those introductions and relationships. Um, and as you know, we are sector agnostic, so we want to uh, make sure even if different sectors, different businesses collaborating together to make sure that um, they can build that, as this, we were talking about circular economy, so they can build that close circle of uh, services, product, and uh, the end, making people's lives easier uh, and solving problems. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Omran, for sharing your growth mindset with us. And what you said actually resonates with what the Australian government and the UK government are trying to collaborate to do. Austrade is a government department in Australia, which is looking to uh, foster stronger relationships with businesses in the UK entrepreneurs in the UK over in Australia. So Austrid could be an uh, interesting resource for the Birmingham Enterprise community. Yeah. And thank you so much for sharing with us and best of luck with your plans this year. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. And if you've just joined us, we had a very interesting discussion with Mr. Omran Al-Habal, CEO of the Birmingham Enterprise community, who says they have opportunities for startups and ideas to develop into full-scale tech uh, businesses. So check out the Birmingham Enterprise community if you have a chance and the full interview will be available at YouTube via Calkine Media. Keep watching Calkine for more of the live expert talks and market updates. As we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine.
Okay, and thanks for tuning in. Holy Shield today for Calkine Media. Let's take a look at the top five TSX stocks for investors to get their hands on in 2022. Number one, the Royal Bank of Canada. This is the largest bank in Canada by market capitalization. The bank saw its profit surge by 40% year over year in the financial year 21, and it issued a quarter-based dividend of 1.2 apiece, which has grown by 6.3% in the last five years, set to be paid on February 24 to shareholders. Number two is the Toronto Dominion Bank. The company earned a profit of about $14.29 billion in the financial year 2021, as against $11.59 a year ago. Number three is yet another bank, the Bank of Nova Scotia, operating as Scotiabank. Like other majors in the country, Scotiabank too saw its profit surge in the fourth fiscal quarter last year, and its quarterly dividend currently stands at $1 per share. Number four is the Canadian National Railway, a freight railway which serves Canada and the Midwestern and Southwestern US. The company recently reported a top line of $3.75 billion for the fourth fiscal quarter of 2021. And at number five on our list is Enbridge, the multinational pipeline company. Over time, it's continued to grow through the acquisition of competitors and the expansion of their projects. A major Canadian energy distributor, Enbridge's pipeline network and operation spans across North America. The company is scheduled to dole out its dividend of 0.86 Canadian, which pays on a quarterly basis on the 1st of March. And that concludes our list. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other videos to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Calcade Media. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Welcome to the Expert Talks by Calkine TV. I'm Sage, and today's guest is the CEO of tech aggregator Lakiba, Mr. Giuseppe Porcelli. And Lakiba invest their time, capabilities, capital, and resources to craft ideas into realities, partnering with household names like Mervac, Stockland, Microsoft, and more, accelerating the transformation of digital technologies into valuable businesses, as their website says. With some big names in their portfolio, including Bricklet and EasyDocs, they're making the most of the shift towards large scale digital. So keep watching to hear more about this innovative investment entity. Bringing you live today, we have Mr. Giuseppe Porcelli, CEO of Lakiba. Welcome to the show, Giuseppe. Hi, Sage. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for making time for the show today and congratulations for being recognized as one of the fastest growing fintechs in the Asia Pacific by the Financial Times. What was the inspiration behind this innovative business venture? Oh, inspiration. The inspiration was... Um, my immediate perception when uh, I moved over to Australia with my family in 2014, understanding straight away that um, the background uh, um, and the environment was uh, uh, mainly investing uh, still in mining, so in all the school uh, uh, stuff and matters. And uh, in the meantime, I realized that uh, the country was full of uh, brilliant minds and uh, great entrepreneurs. So 
I, I said to myself, uh, I should build an environment that can pull together these two parts and to make them working together at the same table, same desk and building in the future for Australia. So exporting technology, and that is where we're focusing on exporting technology from Australia. So my inspiration was uh, uh, the mining industry still there and the technology just waiting to explode. Wow, what an exciting um, epiphany to reach, to, to see that you can make this two things become one and explode into a, a huge business for yourself. Congratulations. And it's been a big year Thanks. for Lakiva, obviously with your US launch. How does this connect yeah. with your strategic objectives? Well, the um, U.S. is a huge country, as we already know, right? It's uh, 20 times bigger than Australia in terms of population. And uh, if you really want to export uh, technology on a global scale, you need to buy it. It's not just now, it's back as well on uh, um, international uh, lens, right? So U.S. is uh, the most uh, um, efficient way to uh, grow and uh, the most efficient way to demonstrate what we're building down under here. And uh, um, the first office that we have uh, internationally opened was uh, back in 2017 uh, in London. Then we um, also opened something in uh, India, later on in Italy, my place where I come from. But recently the decision to move into the US uh, because we believe that our product is mature enough now for the big audience. Amazing. And you also have a new board. How will this help to create shareholder value for Lakiba, please? Well, the board, uh, they work for uh, the shareholders, right? They are on behalf of the shareholder, making sure that the governance of a, uh, an organization like Lakiba is well structured, that uh, it's uh, managing uh, uh, properly the funds uh, and the investments that are uh, institutional and uh, uh, family offices, five about people, they do uh, into the company. So uh, the board look after the executive uh, key people that needs uh, all the time uh, to be motivated and to be inquired by how the business is uh, growing and is going. And in our specific case, we had to uh, reinforce uh, our existing great board by getting on board uh, uh, people like Greg West with the uh, US NASDAQ experience uh, uh, considering our uh, expansion over there. And at the same time, uh, uh, we onboarded uh, recently Oliver Krasovetsky, a former managing director of the Morris Australia, one of the most uh, successful uh, capital managers in the country, just to help us uh, with the, the growth that we have uh, on our uh, radar. So uh, the board is uh, critical to a business. If uh, uh, the board is not uh, uh, made by key uh, strategic uh, uh, members, that doesn't add any value. In our case, it's just the opposite. We really rely on them. Yes, the directorate really does have a huge impact on the business operations. And you have a highly commendable portfolio of digital ventures with many gaining in popularity, such as Bricklet, and easy docs how do you identify and conceive such a wide range of ideas well two ways uh, sagey working with uh, partners understanding uh, their gaps and where they spending too much for example or uh, they need a uh, uh, too long time to deliver something to their client base but at the same time uh, uh, talking of uh, uh, innovation we we built back in 2016 uh, a narrow network the infrastructure that is helping us to uh, identify software developers uh, sentiment using AI and ML and uh, that is uh, suggesting us uh, on what subjects those uh, uh, developers are working on so when we combine what the market uh, is looking for and what software developers are uh, looking at we combine the two things and we try to pull out of there the best idea for the next wave of products that the business built. And I think being able to stay ahead of the pack and um, predict those trends is a very important part of your job. And that's, I suppose, what gives Lakiba its uh, prowess and its um, strong force. How does Lakiba's innovative AI or artificial intelligence also assist to identify key factors that help engineer a startup, for example, to maximize their growth potential? 
Yeah, uh, in very high level uh, way, and imagine uh, those uh, software developers uh, around the world uh, talking about uh, new uh, developments, right? What they do as a first uh, step is uh, to question and answer on uh, open forums, for example. And what we have built is a uh, is massive uh, presence uh, on a, a global network infrastructure uh, that is provided to us by Microsoft. And we analyze uh, those question and answer. And uh, with some uh, very great uh, algorithmic, we are able to uh, identify what is the sentiment, if they struggle to build that solution for the customer or what. And uh, we try to predict what is the trend, right? Because if a software developer is working for uh, one of his clients, on uh, researching how to do something, that something maybe it's the next solution to be built and to be commercialized. And that word is a uh, 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 role. We, we identify what uh, has to be conceived, what has to be created and commercialized. That's fantastic. Uh, timing is an important factor in your in your industry, and Lakiba is involved with partnerships, co-creating with major industry players such as Mervac, News Corp, Microsoft, and Stockland. Those are huge names. How important are these partnerships in fintech, and how do they develop Lakiba's growth strategy, please? Well, I will um, summarize the answer, saying that um, there is a no success idea independently from how great it's uh, the idea if you don't have the right uh, distribution partner talking of bricklet for example our uh, uh, fractionalizing uh, platform for a property market right uh, without the uh, larger players like the market can stop we will never keep the market right we will have just an amazing idea down a garage but uh, uh, no one on market evangelizing that so the partnership in our world is uh, the most uh, efficient way to get the product uh, uh, on market, to evangelize it, to make that uh, adoptions uh, such a straightforward uh, process rather than uh, 10 years uh, a journey where maybe you don't know even uh, where do you um, end up to. Very interesting. Um, it's, it's such a wonderful space to watch with um, small companies being bought by bigger companies and, and growing together in collaborations and mergers and acquisitions in the fintech space. It's a very interesting thing to follow. Uh, Giuseppe, we're about to close off the discussion. Were there any um, last comments you'd like to share with the viewers? Oh, yes. I think uh, my personal comment uh, for the viewers is that uh, we are just in the middle of a uh, Australians evolution moving away from the old school uh, uh, industries uh, to the future that is uh, the technology recently uh, players like uh, after the Atlassian and many others uh, are demonstrating how good we are uh, over here in terms of building the future so I would uh, invite and incentivize uh, my colleagues and other technology builders like us to continue to enforce uh, and to look forward together how to build a stronger Australia for the future. Thank you so much. What a, what a wonderful way to finish off the discussion. And the tech industry is pronouncing the creation of jobs in such an amazing way. And we have to thank those people who are in the positions to make jobs for the future. So thank you, Giuseppe, for your time today. Thank you very much, Seiji. Bye. Enjoy your day. So, viewers, if you just joined us, we had a very informative and inspiring discussion with the CEO of La Keba, Mr. Giuseppe Porcelli. Please watch the full interview at YouTube via Calkine Media's channel and keep watching Calkine TV for more market updates, expert talks. Till the next episode, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkine TV.
Adera Verdex and DDX Crypto's price prediction. Multiple forces are bothering cryptocurrencies at the moment. Many analysts think that the Fed's near certain shift to higher rates in March 2022 is causing cryptos and other riskier assets to lose value. Some believe that cryptos may have become overvalued and the ongoing correction was always in the making. Bitcoin, Ether and most other high cap cryptos have lost more value. But there is a crypto that has gained substantially during the same period. Let's know more about this crypto now. Deriva Dex or DDX Crypto. Please subscribe to the channel. I'm Sage for Calci Media. So what is Deriva Dex? Derivadex or Derivadao is a crypto exchange with derivatives features. The platform claims to be a unique decentralized exchange or DEX for short, which delivers from the traditional crypto exchanges with a centralized controlling entity and other DEXs. Deriva DEX promises competitive fees for services and features such as real-time price information. The platform also claims not to use any public blockchain for exchange services. The exchange swears by decentralized autonomous organization attributes, which means control and governance are in the user's hands and not any centralized authority. Now, besides the platform comes with a vertical for insurance mining, where users can stake their cryptos to a fund to earn incentives. DDX Crypto. Like most other blockchain-based projects, Derivadex also has a native token. The DDX coin serves as a native governance token of Derivadex and besides finding uses and staking. DDX holders also get free advantages within the platform. DDX Crypto Price. DDX token, as stated earlier, has lately entered a bullish phase. The price as of now is approximately $3.30 US. The trading volume of DDX is up by almost 4,000% and the price of the DDX token has also gained by nearly 25% according to coin market cap data. DDX crypto's market cap is about 84 million US dollars. DDX crypto's price prediction. Well, DDX is a native token and its value would largely depend on how the Derivadex platform performs. The speculation by cryptocurrency traders in DDX tokens would also impact the price. In late August 2021, DDX crypto price peaked at 13 US dollars, but by the end of the year, the price had plunged to nearly $4.50 US. A sustained bull run may take the price to double digits by the end of the first quarter. The bottom line. Derivadex claims delegation of governance to users. Decentralized exchanges are emerging as a rival to regular crypto exchanges like Coinbase, and DDX Crypto's price would essentially be a product of Derivadex's success shortly. Cryptos are volatile and prices may fluctuate in any direction, but the long term value would always rely on the utility and viability of the linked blockchain project. So if you like this info, let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below and subscribe to the channel. If you press the bell icon, you'll be notified every time Kalkine has a new video offering. But for more articles like this, do head to the website kalkinemedia.com. I'm Sage for Kalkine Media. Hello, I'm James Preston and welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks, exclusive to Kalkine TV. In 2022, effective marketing, especially in the digital space, is crucial to the success of any business. Ready Set Marketing is a centralized marketing for small businesses, built for and by marketers as an all-in-one marketing platform. And to talk us through how it operates, the founder of Ready Set Marketing, Sophia Hassan, joins me live. Sophia, a very warm welcome to Kalkine. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Um, good morning to you all. I hope you're all well. Um, yeah, I'm based currently in the UK, so it's actually the evening for us. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, really excited to be on the show today. Well, a very good evening to you personally then in that case. Uh, Sophia, first and foremost, take us through exactly how Ready Set Marketing works. Yeah, no, definitely. So at the moment, currently, we're actually developing our MVP. So um, we're looking to launch this um, in Q1 of 2022. And um, essentially, we're a centra centralized 
solution for SMBs and um, incorporating our three key main USPs, that's uh, integration, utilization, and resource um, features for, for our customers. And what we're actually developing is a all-in-one solution um, with the key features surrounding campaign management, customer engagement, and reporting. And since the pandemic, a lot of pivoting has happened in, in, in terms of businesses adapting to changes and challenges that they face. So we're looking to really create a platform and a te technology solution with um, that end user in mind and building a solution for them that can really help them propel and grow and scale their businesses with the power of marketing. Um, and traditionally, software has been adopted by enterprise businesses. We're really creating that solution for small business owners and really transforming that experience for them. Um, and yeah, so, so, so that's what Ready Set Marketing is. Now, that's an overview of the company itself, but you made mention there of the MVP program. Can you go through exactly what that entails? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, yeah, so our MVP is essentially our proof of concept, and we're actually looking to launch this in quarter one of 2022. Um, and essentially, where the key pain point that we're looking to solve for our customers is um, really the integration um, use case there, and um, really creating a product that can... Um, integrate within with, with their teams and with, with the resources that they have um, and something that they can use internally within their business but also being able to utilize that utilize that within their teams and within their um, function as well and lastly um, we're actually looking to really roll out this as an as an all-in-one platform um, but for us it's really important that we um, have that have have our three key features featured within featured within the platform, and, and that's campaign management, customer engagement, and reporting features. Now, obviously, that's one aspect that quite separates Ready, Set, Marketing from other agencies, but how would you say you do differ from uh, traditional agencies? Yeah, no, definitely. I think for us, we have a key um, differentiating uh, factor in terms of our uh, proposition. Um, initially, my background is in consulting, so I've worked with loads of um, small business owners, but also startup founders, and really gotten to know the, the key uh, pains and problems that that customer is facing, and, and formulating that with technology, thinking about how, how we could essentially um, you know, serve that customer better with, with the power of, of, of my consulting background, but also using that technical um, uh, software to, to, to really help those, biz those businesses and those clients. Um, so. Currently, at the moment, the the, the company um, is myself and my, my co-founder. So he's um, from a technical background, and he's responsible for pretty much our whole technical roadmap. And um, and yes, yeah, so we're we're looking to, we're looking to really formulate those two those two um, key uh, areas together in terms of in terms of the the marketing, but also the technology and creating that all in one mark tech solution. Now, the technology is a very good point because, I mean, the world of marketing is just ever-changing, especially with that rapid growth of tech and, and different communication platforms. So with that in mind, how do you think you help your clients achieve optimum results whilst keeping up to date with the latest marketing trends, whether it be shifts in technology or the ways that we communicate? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so I, I, I believe that, you know, the, the key in terms of the, um, for us, in terms of our customers and our clients is, a, really understanding what, what that customer need is, really thinking about how we could actually, um, you know, really get to the pain and the root, the root problem that they're trying to face. I think as a marketer for myself and my background in consulting, um, I think it, it, it's been key for me to really, yeah, understand, understand my customer, understand the pain that they're experiencing, and then carving out the, um, the necessary, you know, campaign and strategic direction from that. Um, and also thinking about the different touch points. Um, so the clients that I've had um, in, 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 my, in my career really have been mainly around that kind of B2B stuff, um, startup world. So they, they, they do have similar challenges and similar concerns, but a lot of it is very much, um, um, in very, very much case by case in that sense as well. So we're looking to create a technology solution that can address loads of different pain points that customers are facing but also um not not in a sense where where you know 
creating a um a, a mix match solution it's very very bespoke in that way but also um also quite um innovative as well so yeah so it, it, it's a mixture i would probably say We've been talking about pain points there for small businesses. I'm sure there's a lot of them, that's for sure. But what would you say the uh, integration utilisation specs are lacking within the current tech solutions space here? I, I think there's a bunch of shortfalls, especially when it comes to the small of the company. They might not have the, the resources to access some of that higher tech. Is that a gap that you're looking to fill with what you're doing here in the marketing space? Yeah, no, definitely, exactly that. So, in terms of our um, the, the problem that we've identified here, um, in terms of the utilization, for example, uh, currently businesses are pretty much unable to utilize their you know their tech stacks for breadth of capabilities, and um, they're investing in tools that that ultimately go unused. A, that's a that's a huge cash loss. That's a huge um, resource argument. But also, B, it's a it's a huge waste of um, resources as well in terms of in terms of their time and the amount of investment that they're putting into that. So our solution is pretty much cutting through that red tape. Um, we're packaging that back to the customer in a way where it's really adoptable. Um, that it being a fast solution, it's gonna, it, it will be really adoptable, really easy for them to use within their business. But also um, we've got ranging different plans and different um, features that customers can, can choose and, and, and develop for themselves. Um, and yeah, in terms of integration, um, currently integration is, is 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 integration exists. It's not something that is is new, but it's quite um, out of reach for the S and D customer. So, in terms of the current technology solutions at the moment, um, there aren't many uh, that cater towards that S and D small small business um, customer. And a lot of the Current solutions are continuing to move off market. They, you know, they get bought up by venture capital. They're 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 growing and they're scaling themselves. So the startups that you're seeing today are growing and scaling, and 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 they're no longer looking to serve that that small business customer. So we've identified a huge gap in the market, really, in terms of how we can utilize that as an opportunity to create a bespoke product for that customer. And um, and and yeah, and our our ROI comes into that too. So um. There's a lot, a lot of technology out there at the moment, um, and you know it's, it's it's a very open market. It's not something that's um, you know too closed off in that sense. Information is out there. There's information overload, um, but it's more so how can we actually create a, a, a bespoke product in terms of the um, that being able to justify that monetary value to the customer. How can they use that for their, you know, stakeholder analysis? How can they use that within their businesses to justify marketing um, to, to their to their businesses and the teams within their businesses and their marketing teams? Um, so yeah, so we've really thought thought about the problems and the problems that I face working with these clients, but also the wider macro problems as well, and trying to service those problems. Now, obviously, tech is quite central to what you do, but let's just. Sidestep that for just a little moment here. What would you say makes any marketing campaign a successful one? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, good question. <laughs> so, um, I, as I said, my background is in consulting. So, um, I'm a consultant by trade. And when I'm working with clients, the first thing that I do is, A, really understand their, their goal. What is it they're trying to achieve? And um, I really get into the nitty gritty and try to really understand their team, map out, look in, map out and see what they're looking to achieve within their businesses too. Um, and then the key after that is really the planning um, and getting that right and knowing how you are actually going to carve out that, that strategic plan with that client is going to be key in you achieving that goal for them. Um, I think there's a key in really listening to, to, to the customer. Um, you know, all, all the answers are with your customer. and you need to really be able to adapt and um, cater towards towards that customer, really. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's mainly for me, it's understanding my customer, but also understanding the pain that they're experiencing. And then carving out a campaign um, or a strategy or strategic proposition for them that addresses this across platforms and touch points. And, yeah, really thinking about their, their, their audience, too, and their market and analysing that. I think a lot of it is in the analysis and the initial planning um, that happens really on when working with clients. 
Absolutely. Now, I'm speaking with Safiya Hassan, the founder of Ready Save Marketing. Safiya, what would you say would be the emerging marketing trends that you're seeing come through for 2022? Yeah, no, definitely. I think marketing is, uh, you know, the most broadest and the fastest growing industry uh, can put, <laughs> just to kind of say that. Um, and yeah, I think this is definitely due to the nature of um of the customer. The customer is constantly changing and the marketing is very much dictated by customer and con consumer sentiment as well. Um, and, you know, I think what we've witnessed as a, as a world um, in the last two years with, with COVID and with the pandemic, there was a huge shift and change in the way consumers were behaving and the way how businesses and how brands had to adapt to that change. I think a lot of it is, is, is um, predicting and will be forecasted via by the customer and and that that definitely is going to dictate the future of marketing and its trajectory um and yeah i think for me there's there's there, there are you know loads, loads of different innovations at the moment number one i think the metaverse um uh, mm. facebook coming out with that early last year it's going to play a huge part in marketing um i think virtual reality and augmented reality is going to it plays a huge part in, in the future of marketing, but also um, really going to force a lot of businesses to kind of be more digital first. I think enterprise business uh, will be really easy for them to adapt and change towards that. But I think there's a huge opportunity for um, small businesses to, to get into this space early um, and to really think about how they can service, serve and service their customers in this more of a digital, you know, web 3.0 world that that might mm. be created as a result um and yeah i think ai is going to continue to do its thing i think ai will continue to um propel and um, dictate uh industries um and 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 as a result i think that's definitely going to change you know customer experience and just brand brands in general i think brands will um there'll be winners and losers um and i think definitely we will be able to really I think us as consumers will really be able to further, um, you know, kind of differentiate between those winners and losers as well. So, yeah, I think loads of change is welcome. Um, and, um, yeah, I think loads of, I think the tech com the big tech companies, Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, um, I think they will continue to, to have a huge, um, 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 huge, huge say in what happens and in terms of, in terms of marketing in general. Um, but I think, a lot of that, a lot of the change is going to stem from the, the customer and the consumer. 100 percent. And I really love your point as well about the metaverse. We've already seen the likes of Nike and Adidas get involved with it. So yeah. those big companies, they tend to uh, be pretty much ahead of the game. And if small businesses and small medium enterprises want to keep up, they should probably keep across what is happening with those big conglomerates. So very good point there about the metaverse expanding and just emerging throughout 2022. And Sophia, just before I let you go, where can we find everything that Ready Set Marketing is doing? Is there social media websites? Do we have a website itself? Yeah, no, definitely. Feel free to, yeah, we've got a website, um, readysetmarketing.io. Um, but yeah, feel free to reach out to me, um, on, um, LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Instagram. Um, I'm sure, um, you'll be able to easily find me on, on, on the internet. <laughs> but if you're, if you're super keen, yeah, shoot me an email, um, safia at readysetmarketing.io. Um, but yeah, it's been great. Thank you for having me. <laughs> no, an absolute pleasure. And look, we can certainly find you on the internet, maybe even soon on the metaverse too. So we'll keep an eye out for you all over the place. Sophia, it's been an absolute pleasure to chat. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, uh, have a lovely rest of your day, you guys. I will, and you too. That's Sophia Hassan, the founder of Ready Set Marketing. If you missed any part of that interview, you can catch the whole thing on our YouTube channel, Kaokai Media, so please make sure to subscribe. That's all for now, though. I'm James Preston, reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Kaokai. Hi there, James Preston for Cowkind TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches 
to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Derivadex and DDX crypto's price prediction. Multiple forces are bothering cryptocurrencies at the moment. Many analysts think that the Fed's near certain shift to higher rates in March 2022 is causing cryptos and other riskier assets to lose value. Some believe that cryptos may have become overvalued and the ongoing correction was always in the making. Bitcoin, Ether and most other high cap cryptos have lost more value. But there is a crypto that has gained substantially during the same period. Let's know more about this crypto now. Deriva Dex or DDX Crypto. Please subscribe to the channel. I'm Sage for Calkai Media. So what is Deriva Dex? Derivadex or Derivadao is a crypto exchange with derivatives features. The platform claims to be a unique decentralized exchange or DEX for short, which delivers from the traditional crypto exchanges with a centralized controlling entity and other DEXs. Deriva DEX promises competitive fees for services and features such as real-time price information. The platform also claims not to use any public blockchain for exchange services. The exchange swears by decentralized autonomous organization attributes, which means control and governance are in the user's hands and not any centralized authority. Now, besides the platform comes with a vertical for insurance mining, where users can stake their cryptos to a fund to earn incentives. DDX Crypto. Like most other blockchain-based projects, Derivadex also has a native token. The DDX coin serves as a native governance token of Derivadex and besides finding uses and staking. DDX holders also get free advantages within the platform. DDX Crypto Price. DDX token, as stated earlier, has lately entered a bullish phase. The price as of now is approximately $3.30 US. The trading volume of DDX is up by almost 4,000% and the price of the DDX token has also gained by nearly 25% according to CoinMarketCap data. DDX crypto's market cap is about 84 million US dollars. DDX crypto's price prediction. Well, DDX is a native token and its value would largely depend on how the Derivadex platform performs. The speculation by cryptocurrency traders in DDX tokens would also impact the price. In late August 2021, DDX crypto price peaked at 13 US dollars, but by the end of the year, the price had plunged to nearly $4.50 US. A sustained bull run may take the price to double digits by the end of the first quarter. The bottom line. 
Derivadex claims. Delegation of governance to users. Decentralized exchanges are emerging as a rival to regular crypto exchanges like Coinbase, and DDX Crypto's price would essentially be a product of Derivadex's success shortly. Cryptos are volatile and prices may fluctuate in any direction, but the long-term value would always rely on the utility and viability of the linked blockchain project. So if you like this info, let us know by liking, sharing, commenting on the video below and subscribe to the channel. If you press the bell icon, you'll be notified every time Calkine has a new video offering. But for more articles like this, do head to the website calkinemedia.com. I'm Sage for Calkine Media. Thanks for tuning in, Holland Shields here for Calcine Media. Let's take a look at the top 5 TSX stocks for investors to get their hands on in 2022. Number 1, the Royal Bank of Canada. This is the largest bank in Canada by market capitalization. The bank saw its profit surge by 40% year over year in the financial year 21, and it issued a quarter-based dividend of 1.2 apiece which has grown by 6.3% in the last five years, set to be paid on February 24 to shareholders. Number two is the Toronto Dominion Bank. The company earned a profit of about $14.29 billion in the financial year 2021, as against 11.59 a year ago. Number three is yet another bank, the Bank of Nova Scotia, operating as Scotiabank. Like other majors in the country, Scotiabank too saw its profit surge in the fourth fiscal quarter last year and its quarterly dividends currently stands at $1 per share. Number four is the Canadian National Railway, a freight railway which serves Canada and the Midwestern and Southwestern US. The company recently reported a top line of $3.75 billion for the fourth fiscal quarter of 2021. And at number five on our list is Enbridge, the multinational pipeline company. Over time, it's continued to grow through the acquisition of competitors and the expansion of their projects. A major Canadian energy distributor, Enbridge's pipeline network and operation spans across North America. The company is scheduled to dole out its dividend of 0.86 Canadian, which pays on a quarterly basis on the 1st of March. And that concludes our list. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other videos to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Calcade Media. Become the home of crypto. Hey, and thanks for tuning in. Holy Shields here for Calcai Media. Since fintech is making waves in the digital banking space, the UK is a major destination for this sector. Many experts support the development of fintech solutions and cryptocurrencies within the nation. Matt Hancock, former Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, urged the House of Commons that the Boris Johnson government needs to commit to the progressive development of fintech, blockchain technologies and of course cryptos, citing the latter's decentralized nature which gives more power to the people over their money. 
Hancock feels that while tokenization could ensure greater asset liquidity, exploring blockchain technologies could also provide the UK with an edge. He further highlighted that cryptos could be an asset to economic stimulation and even reduce financial crimes in the country. Now, while his comments, of course, were encouraging to the digital currency enthusiasts, not everyone is on board. A few weeks ago, several MPs and members of the House of Lords launched the Crypto and Digital Asset Group, which aims to look at the regulation possibilities. So far, the UK government has taken an apprehensive stance on cryptos. Bank of England Deputy Governor Sir John Cunliffe said that cryptos could lead to a financial meltdown and the UK government must work towards regulations. Crypto adoptions in the UK went up from 5.2% in October 2021 to 6.1% in December to become the most crypto-friendly country in the world. Behind Singapore and Australia, that is. But as the Bank of England and government are still apprehensive towards digital currency, many are eager to see how the stance will evolve in the future. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other videos to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Kalkine Media. The Chronotech token rose 11% last week upon closing a 30 million US dollar funding round led by venture capitalist Mark Carnegie. Hey, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Holly Shields for Calcai Media. The Australian based blockchain company plans to use the funds to develop and expand its services for the HR and crypto payment sectors. But first, let's back it up. What is Chronotech? Well, Chronotech provides blockchain-based solutions for the HR, recruitment, and payment processing sectors. TIME, or T-I-M-E, is a native token of Chronotech's ecosystem used for staking on TimeWorp.Finance and securing premium account status. The TIME token was updated to ERC-677 standard in November 2020 to integrate it with other DeFi protocols enabling lower cost transactions while making ERC-20 compatible. The company's products and blockchain ecosystem focuses on solving global recruitment and employment market problems. Its freelance work portal, laborx.com, is a popular one among freelancers. Customers can execute digital agreements powered by smart contracts on the platform, and payments are made in cryptocurrency. As for its performance, well, of the 1,372 time token holders, the top 100 owns 97% of the total assets. The token touched an all-time high on January 11 and an all-time low on March 13, 2020. Time is available for trading on PancakeSwap, QuickSwap, Uniswap, and KuCoin as well. What's your take on Chronotech and the time token? Let us know in the comments and as always, check out some of our other videos to stay up to date. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Hello everyone, great to have your company on Calkine TV. I'm Rose Jacobs and you're watching Buzzing Trends. 
Today we'll be looking at two ASX growth stocks that are on investors' radars. Growth stocks are shares of the companies that are expected to grow at a higher rate than their respective industries. These stocks are generally richly valued due to their higher perceived earnings in the future and therefore these companies generally command a premium for their shares. Because of their high growth prospects, these companies also try to steer clear of distributing profits in the form of dividends and instead prefer to reinvest those earnings to accelerate their growth. There are a few blue chip companies as well that could also be seen as a growth stock in the near term. Let's have a look at two such stocks that investors have set their eyes on for the near term. Santos, listed on ASX under the ticker code STO, is today's first growth stock in the list. Oil exploration giant Santos is one of the stocks peaking investors' interest for the near term. It's a direct beneficiary of a massive ongoing rally in crude oil prices that have already surpassed the seven-year high mark and are currently trading above US $90 per barrel. In financial year 21, the company clocked a revenue of $3.51 billion, slightly lower than the financial year 20 revenue of $4.19 billion Australian. However, rising geopolitical tensions have sent the crude oil price outlook to over $100 a barrel US, as per the Economist Intelligence Unit. This massive demand supply shift is likely to benefit Santos's earnings growth. Currently, STO shares are trading at $7.30. 36 Australian per share. Looking at its recent development, Santos shareholders might be seeing red after the company's CEO was appointed to the board of iron ore and lithium producer ASX listed Mineral Resources. Mineral Resources announced Gallagher's new position on Monday night. Moreover, owners of Santos shares might want to keep an eye on the company's Papua New Guinea assets amid rumours of a sell down. Santos is actively moving to sell down its stake in PNG LNG, boosted by its takeover of Oil Search. The merged group owns 42.5% of the LNG project after Oil Search's 29% stake was added to Santos's 13.5% holding. Moving on to Block. Block's part company Square has started trading on ASX under the ticker code of its SQ2. Yesterday, its share price was seen enjoying a positive session as it officially took Afterpay under its wing. Afterpay is now delisted from ASX. In the noon yesterday, shares in the US-based financial services company were up 8.11% to $174.50. Block is a US-listed fintech firm and not an original ASX 200 company. However, after the acquisition of Afterpay, Block shares were listed on the Australian Bourse via CDIs or CHESS depository interest and consequently included in the ASX 200 as well. Block is Jack Dorsey's digital payments company, which has soared to new highs during COVID-19 as the pandemic has massively increased consumers' reliance on digital payments. Block's ecosystem is, is becoming robust with its spiral tool which builds free open source projects that advance the use of bitcoins. The growth in the crypto space could be debatable owing to various restrictions and regulatory hurdles, but there is no denying the exponential pace of bitcoins adoption. According to the Global Crypto Adoption Index in 2021, Bitcoin adoption surged 880% worldwide. Square shares are trading at Australian $165.22 per share. In conclusion, high growth factors are often speculative and majorly depend on a thorough and rigorous analysis of the respective industry. These factors may change quite quickly and therefore growth stocks are considered to be a riskier bet. Investors should always do proper due diligence before investing in these stocks. Well, that's all for now. We'll be back soon with our buzzing trends show to share the latest market insights with you. Till then, stay tuned with Calkine TV for more stock, business and economy related hot trends. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. 
Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Jacobs, time for a quick news update. The Federal Government of Australia is set to announce two new bonus payments for aged care workers across Australia. Scott Morrison, Prime Minister, is expected to be introducing two new bonus payments worth up to $400 each in a speech to the National Press Club on Tuesday. This decision has come after the aged care workers have struggled due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. This bonus is likely to be introduced by the month of May as a part of government aid for each sector. It's said that the initial payment would be made in the month of February itself, while as the second payment would be made at the start of May. Around 234,000 aged care workers working in the government subsidised home care and residential aged care would be able to claim their hands on this bonus. It would also be incorporated for the people who provide direct care, food or cleaning facilities to elderly people. Each worker is said to be paid the total amount depending upon their total hours. The package for the aged care sector would be additionally funded by $209 million. Carolyn Smith, Director of United Workers Union Aged Care, has applauded this decision. He said that this announcement for aged care workers is an aid for the people who have helped elderly people during the ongoing pandemic crisis. He also said that the union is pleased with the decision that the incentive would be offered to all aged care workers, including catering and cleaning staff. Carolyn also said that these workers have been struggling with low pay, less staff and poor COVID-19 response by Scott Morrison. Most of the workers are still not getting regular RAT tests and sufficient PPE indicating federal government's failure. I'm Rose Jacobs. Thanks for joining me. The UK's trade could be boosted to up to £28 billion annually by 2035, as its exports to India are set to almost double. Hey, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Molly Shields for Kalkai Media. Let's take a look at five FTSE listed stocks that will be impacted by the UK's free trade agreement. 
The first is GlaxoSmithKline, the UK-based global healthcare giant. The market cap of the FTSE 100 listed company stands at around £81 billion and has provided a return of about 15.75% to its shareholders in the last one year. Recently, Unilever had approached GlaxoSmithKline about buying the pharmaceutical group's consumer goods arm after a newspaper reported that a £50 billion offer it made had been rebuffed. And number two on our list is Mondi, the UK-based manufacturing business that provides packaging and paper products internationally. The market cap of the FTSE 100 listed company stands at £8.6 billion and has provided a return of about 0.25% to its shareholders in the last one year. In its third quarter performance, released in October 2021, Monty stated that it delivered a strong performance with higher average prices across the business and a strong volume growth year on year. And that's against the backdrop of sharply higher input costs. Another stock to look at is Rio Tinto, an Anglo-Australian business which is among the leading metals and mining companies in the world. The market cap of Rio Tinto stands at £66.2 billion and has provided a return of negative 8.04% to its shareholders in the last one year. Rio Tinto recently announced that it has renegotiated agreements with the Mongolian government to advance a delayed and rather costly expansion of its AU Tolgoi copper mine. And coming in at number 5 is Johnson Mapey, a London headquartered specialty chemicals business. The market cap of the FTSE 250 listed company stands at £3.5 billion and has provided a return of about negative 36% to its shareholders in the last year. Johnson Mathey and Material Recycler European Metal Recycling recently signed an MOU to develop an efficient value chain for recycling lithium ion batteries and cell manufacturing materials in the UK. And next is Smith & Nephew, the UK-based manufacturing company that supplies medical equipment worldwide. The market cap of the FTSE 100 listed company stands at $10.8 billion and has provided a return of negative 23% to its shareholders in the last year. Smith & Nephew has announced the acquisition of Engage Surgical and its semitless partial knee system. And that concludes our list. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other news to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Calcine Media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calcine TV. Rose Jacobs here with you for Calcine TV and a breaking news update. Telstra listed TLS on Wednesday announced that it would invest over 1 billion Australian dollars on two major telecom infrastructure projects to boost connectivity across Australia and the digital economy. The telecom major will spend between 1.4 billion and 1.6 billion dollars in the next five years. Telstra operates in the telecom services sector and is a telecommunications carrier. According to the statement released by the company on the ASX, the first project includes building and managing the ground infrastructure and the fibre network in the country for global communications company Viasat. This program will lend support to new Viasat 3 terabit class global satellite system as part of a 16 and a half year contract. It will also invest in building intercity dual fibre paths. The investment is expected to add up to 20,000 new route kilometres to raise the capacity of Telstra's optical fibre network. The company expects to spend up to 70% of the $1.4 billion to $1.6 billion across its T25 planning period or an additional $350 million of capital expenditure per year over financial year 23 through to financial year 25. Telstra CEO Andrew Penn said the two projects were part of Telstra's T25 ambitions for InfraCo. 
Meanwhile, the telecommunications giant's technology services leg Telstra Purple will acquire Acura Technologies for Australian $30 million. It is also planning to buy Australian industrial automation service provider Alliance Automation. Telstra's shares were trading at $3.96 up 0.38% in the early trade. The stock fell over 6% year to date. In the past year, the stock delivered a return of almost 25%. And that's the latest with the news updates. Stay tuned for more breaking news right here on Kalkine TV. I'm Rose Jacobs. Thanks for joining me. Hi there, James Preston for Kalkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Has your week hit you for six? Barely had time to breathe, let alone throw a flick pass? Well, don't worry, Cowkind has all your sporting action covered. Each episode, I'll bring you the biggest sports news of the week. Exclusive interviews with athletes, sports commentators, and journalists. Plus, we'll also look at the finances off the field from new broadcast deals, sports commercial partnerships, and more with sports business. So for a sports show that tackles all the big issues, ball and all, Join me, James Preston, for Game On, every Friday, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Welcome to the Expert Talks by Kalkine. I'm Sage. And today's guest is Mr. Jackson Neo, one of the co-founders of DeFi Nation, a Singapore-based game development company with an exciting new offering to play to earn NFT games. And DeFi Nation is merging traditional gaming with the new and the possible. And in their own words from their website, they state, our dream started with that question we all choose to go down the rabbit hole, to carry on dreaming, to free our people from the constraints of reality and to create our own metaverse with a sustainable ecosystem where everyone will be fairly rewarded for doing what we all love, playing games. And I'm excited to bring you live today to our show, Mr. Jackson Neo, the co-founder of DeFi Nation. Welcome to the show, Jackson. Hi, 
everyone. Hi, everyone from Australia. Hi, nice to meet you. Thank you for making time amidst your busy schedule. We are so happy that you're able to join us today. So there's big news surrounding your company with your game, Age of Tanks. We need to know, Jackson, what is the inspiration behind this game? So at that point of time, we started learning about game fight. And um, of course, we played some Axis and some other games. Then we feel, hey, we are a gaming studio. I think we can contribute more to this uh, specific industry. And we wanted to do something really different. Why? Because at the time, there was a lot of copycats. Everybody is trying to play things like this. So you can see the whole market flooded with a cute Pokemon monster like a game. So, yeah, so we decided something very different. And one of my crew actually met, uh, we met together in the army. And our first mission was in the tank. So we decided to come up with Age of Tanks. Fantastic. It's Fantastic. very catchy. Very catchy. So, how have your venture capital partners helped to make this possible? Oh, we, we wouldn't have come so far without all our strategic advisors and partners. There's so, so, so many I have to thank. But uh, in a few moments, I would like to thank the, the few prominent ones. Because uh, without their guidance and their, their, their resources, we, we wouldn't have been so successful right now. So, uh, among which, uh, the most important is Step BC, Shima Capital, Complex, B Block, UC Blue, Two Game Skills, uh, Artists, Uni X, Blue Wheel, uh, NFT Tech, and of course, Great Swiss and MH Ventures. I think it's really amazing with them around. So, uh, because this is our, this is not our first time doing uh, a game, but this is our first time uh, venturing into the game fight industry. So, there's a lot of things that we need to learn. So, uh, they have been great. So, in short, they have been. Uh, super, uh, Sounds like a 24 hour job getting all those partners and investors on board. So, congratulations. Um, yeah. Jackson, what is the minimum amount of investment required for someone to start playing your game? Okay, for each of X, we include quite a few different elements. Of course, you have the play to earn, but you also have to play. So, a simple run, run down of our game too. So a player can start without any money at all. So he can start playing and uh, you'll be given the default free tag to actually farm for Brodia, which translates into war chests. So inside these war chests are different parts of our tanks. And all our tanks are made up of four different parts, which is the gun, the edge, the hull, and the edge. So which means players can start to accumulate more and more different parts before they really decide how they want to assemble them and make it into an NFT with us. And once they Make it to an NFT tank. They can participate in the PVE, PVP, 1v1, 7v7, and the new boss that start to activate the big bird and earn a guilty token quite a bit. Wow, so they customize their own tank and then that yes. those tanks become collateral for them in a way. Is that correct? Uh, it becomes NFT. It becomes a non fungible token, uh, which is um, you can use them in our game start to earn our AOT token right away, which is a live token, live trading, good prices, a solid backing. So it's going to be very amazing. Like, like you said uh, previously, the assemble part and the dis, uh, dismantle part is what makes us very different from other games right now. Most other game five games you see, uh, like I said, uh, a lot of cute Pokemon monster kind of game. So uh, no offense, but if you put all these NFTs in front of me, and don't tell me which game they belong to, I might not recognize them because they all look so similar. But in Age of Tanks, because you can collect different parts to the tank, so you might end up having a very small uh, base, which is a very small engine build, and um, getting a very big cannon on top. So it is going to look awkward, but it's going to be so awesome because each tank will come with their own um, attributes and special ability, and it belongs to you and you only. So I think. This would help in separating us from the rest of the world. That is amazing. That is amazing. What fantastic timing, especially as the metaverse is about to explode and NFTs are already going through somewhat of a boom. Now, Jackson, your company is valued at close to $21 million after your successful funding round. What will the money be used for? It's the book. Um, in the word game five, uh, the word game comes first. So our game must deliver, which would be delivered very soon as we are talking right now. 
our alpha launch is ready, our beta launch is, launch is ready, our full game launch will be on the 22nd of February. So a good amount of money will be used to, to ensure and to develop the game and to make sure it stays ahead of time. Uh, right now, uh, with comparison to other P3, P5 projects or even tech one projects, we are way ahead in, uh, in the timeline. And we want to stay that way. So of course, uh, the money has to be used on the game itself. And second, most important one, marketing. Uh, marketing has become a very, very important element in, in today's world. You see, there are, you see a lot of good products that, 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 that was invented but did not become very successful because no, don't have enough uh, marketing and not enough friends. So we're going to spend a good amount of money on marketing as well. And we are not just uh, targeting the, the crypto scene because we, we came from a traditional game scenario. Of course, we want to bring along our, 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 our future clientele which is those that would, you know, be waiting for a train, waiting for a bus, taking their handphone and, you know, playing a mobile game. This, this was where we come from. So we're going to focus a lot on them as well. We convert them to uh, users of our platform as well. Thank you. Now, Jackson, as the digital world grows, security becomes more important as, unfortunately, there are some negative cyber actors out there. Can we please talk a little bit about security on the platform? I think like a, a, a normal listed company would have um, their, their accounts audited by the big four, right? So same here, for us, we are audited by Certic, which is one of, I think, the best in the market out there. So everything is on the chain. Uh, they are, they are, their report is on, on the chain. So you can check it all on their website. Uh, they audit all our smart contracts. So to make sure that there's no way we as developers can, can do something funny to hurt the, the public's interest and we clear all the parameters and uh, I'm, I'm glad that we managed to squeeze it in way before uh, the game even starts. So this gives uh, everyone to participate with us a lot more sense of security. I think this is very important. And every time we come out with a new smart contract, we will get it audited with Certic and we are signing up more player of a partnership with them as well. So this will be very important in the future. And Binance Smart Chain is your blockchain of choice. It's a very popular blockchain for NFTs. Was there any particular reason that you've chosen Binance? Okay, of course, um, on the BSC, there's a lot of players already. So so we, we don't need to go, go into detail why we choose BSC. But uh, I think this is just a start. We are actually in contracts with, with a layer one called Complex, which is pretty big in the AMAC region. We're already in contract with them to start the cross-chain. And we are also uh, in talks with Engine. Um, we are also exploring Avalanche, uh, Solana. So this is a trend that that that, that, that cannot be neglected. Uh, BSD is just a start, but we will cross to all the further players. Uh, you've mentioned some huge names there: Engine Coin, Avalanche. Uh, they're all, uh, you know, posed to do well next year. So great to hear it from one of the experts as well that you are looking to potentially collaborate with those blockchains. So we're coming to the end of the discussion now. I'm so excited to have you on the show. How do you see play-to-earn games to revolutionise gaming as we know it? Do you think traditional gaming will be able to continue in the future? I love this question. Um, I've been asked a lot of similar questions in recently. Like, uh, do you see? Do you see game buys as a competition to, to this, to that? Do you even see Bitcoin as a threat to bank? It's all of a similar thinking. I think this is wrong. There's no competition. A new industry is created, a new technology has been has been innovated. So so people should embrace it uh, and not be and not be forgotten by the times. So to me, game is still gonna be games. There's a lot of different types of games uh, in the market. Uh, for example, uh, you, you have the PS5 to give the best images. You also have the PC games, which gives you a lot of uh, strategy, uh, uh, strategy uh, possibilities. And if right now, you, you bring me a Nokia phone with, remember the, the game Snake? That, that uh, in the 80s, 90s, all of us was so addicted to. I, I, I might spend an hour playing it. So I feel the market is very big. And um, as of now, the new buyer industry is only 20% of the traditional so, so there's still a long way to go, but uh, I really see a revolutionized gaming experience because last time we used to spend money, play game for pleasure and nothing else. And all the profits go to the gaming studio. 
But right now, there's a chance that doing what you've been doing for the past five years, ten years, twenty years, can get hit at the moment at the same time. Yeah. So nobody will reject it. So it's a trend not to be not to be neglected. And I hope more people embrace it because next year it's going to be really, really big. And with um, like you said, the metaverse being uh, introduced by Mark, uh, everything is going to be uh, very fast moving forward. And um, please make use of this uh, gap where the most of the public haven't realized it. And that's the gap where you earn a lot of money. So this is my advice to those that are looking, uh, wanting, wanting to try something new. But of course, always invest with prudence. Always invest within your limits. Do not stretch yourself too hard. Uh, no matter what you invest in, do your studies and make sure you, 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 you protect your money safely. Thank you, Jackson. What a lovely segue to the end of the discussion. And I can tell how much you love your job. You are so passionate about your project. Thank you for sharing your passion with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> well, do you have any other closing comments for us before we close up the discussion today? You just uh, reminded me how, how, how blessed I am right now in this position <laughs> because we can do what we love for a living. I mean, I mean, the world has really changed. I mean, when, when we were growing up, I'm an Asian family, um, we grew up, we were kids. So imagine I tell my parents, hey, I want to play game for a living. My gosh, I will be beaten up, right? But right now, the world has changed. Anything you do, as long as it's legal, as long as it doesn't hurt other people, as long as it's your passion, and you'll be the best in it, you're going you're gonna to make a lot of money. So I feel, I feel this is a great time. Uh, to be yourself, to embrace what you really love and take charge of that. And this is why the crypto world has, has gotten caught fire among uh, the, the past few years because it really allows people a lot of freedom to choose their career. And there's a lot of young entrepreneurs coming into the scene. That's what Definition Studios is for. We are an incubator. We are going to incubate young entrepreneurs who want to enter into the game IC. And uh, of course, this is a story for another time. Hope we have the chance to do this again uh, next year, which is maybe a few days later. <laughs> that would be great, Jackson. We'd love to have you back on the show. Thank you again for making time for us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and if you just joined us, we had a very interesting discussion with the co-founder of exciting GameFi studio, DeFi Nation, based in Singapore, Mr. Jackson Neo. For the full interview, please head to YouTube, Kalkine Media, and check it out. And if you're thinking of getting into coding, game development, cryptography, now is the time to check it out. There's plenty of educational resources online. And Jackson said his company works as an incubator. So maybe check out the website as well, defination.studio. Thanks for your time. Keep watching Kalkine for more of the expert talks and live market updates. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Kalkine. Property by Kalkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Calkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market, as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching. Property with Kalkine. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV.
Has your week hit you for six? Barely had time to breathe, let alone throw a flick pass? Well, don't worry, Cowkind has all your sporting action covered. Each episode, I'll bring you the biggest sports news of the week. Exclusive interviews with athletes, sports commentators, and journalists. Plus, we'll also look at the finances off the field from new broadcast deals, sports commercial partnerships, and more with sports business. So for a sports show that tackles all the big issues, ball and all, Join me, James Preston, for Game On, every Friday, exclusive to Calcine TV. If you're up for an adventure, there's hardly a better destination for it than right here in Australia and nearby New Zealand. Although interstate travel is still up in the air, as restrictions ease, no doubt you want to hit the road and explore the great outdoors. So here's our top adventure activities to stretch those post-lockdown muscles. First up, scuba diving. Mingalu Reef and the Great Barrier Reef. Fancy a swim with the whale sharks? Each year between April and July, you can witness a migration of whale sharks to Ningalu Reef. Don't worry though, because these sharks are docile and harmless and they only eat plankton, they're not aggressive. A more obvious underwater hotspot, the Great Barrier Reef is another thing scuba diving enthusiasts don't want to miss. It's the largest reef around the world. Over 2,300 kilometers hide the incredibly vivid creatures. Think dugons, seals, mesmerizing tropical fish, dozens of different corals, sponges and starfish, even dolphins and whales. There are daily trips organized from Port Douglas and Cairns so the experts can show you the best spots. And if you want a real adrenaline rush, make sure to head to South Australia and hop in a cage to dive with the great white sharks. It's in Port Lincoln, which is one of the best places to visit in the state. Next up, golfing, beachfront in Sydney. Going on an active holiday is becoming more and more popular as people love devoting their vacation days to learning a new skill while having fun. You can sign up for golf courses in Sydney and enjoy the most breathtaking place to make a hole in one. The beachfront in Sydney is specifically designed as a giant golf court with a club and a cafe you can unwind in. And while you're in the city, don't miss out on climbing the Sydney Harbour Bridge for an amazing panoramic view and photo opportunities. A similar hard pumping experience can be found at Gold Coast Skypoint Climb, where you get the climb, highest 270 metres external building in the country. Next, bungee jumping, Queenstown in New Zealand. Queenstown is the perfect place for adrenaline junkies and it's a natural place to stop for those New Zealand road trips. There are several spots for a bungee jump, but Kawaru Bridge may be the best one. It's actually a place where bungee jumping was born. The surreal turquoise river beneath, amazing surrounding nature and scenery will make your 43 meter high jump worthwhile. Another great option to try is the world's biggest swing just above the Nevis River, where you'll experience a height of 300 meters. Enjoy a guided hike, jet boating or parasailing and consider visiting the Queenstown Adventure Group to explore other offered activities. Cycling. Soak in Australia on two wheels. If you have the mindset of an independent traveller and you want to explore off-the-grid paths, cycling is the best way to do it. Australia has an awesome outback just waiting for you. And if you're wondering what area to explore, well, it might be best to consider the weather conditions first. The northern area has a high humidity, both wet and dry seasons. The central part isn't suitable for cycling because it's the heart of the desert, basically. But a moderate climate is typical for the southern part. Which is why Tasmania is a truly great place and it became a renowned area for cycling from Cradle Mountain to Bruni Island. There's a lot to see. Don't miss out on Freysenet National Park either, where you may get the opportunity to pat a few kangaroos. Explore other trails as well. There are many beautiful spots you can find on two wheels. And lastly, surfing. They don't call the Gold Coast a surfer's paradise for nothing. Exquisite beaches with the urban side back offer you a chance to enjoy amazing waves. Whether you choose to ride some waves at the Snapper Rocks Surfer Bank or Palm Beach, Nobby Beach or Broad Beach, 
you can have the opportunity to soak up the sun and raise your adrenaline levels. If you prefer a more natural surrounding, choose Noosa. You can also attend surfing lessons. The Gold Coast is packed with surfing schools and academies. Coaches usually work with a group of up to six people, but there's also an option for private lessons. Other great surfing spots include Victoria, New South Wales and Western Australia. So keep this in mind when you choose adventure hotspots for the coming season. Hello, I'm James Preston and welcome to another edition of Executive Corner Expert Talks exclusive to Kalkine TV. For those lucky enough to own a property, there's a never-ending desire to improve your dwelling and truly make your house into a home. One of the best ways to do that is with smart and tasteful renovations, but it can be a very costly exercise if you don't do your research. Fortunately, new cost-effective marketplaces are emerging and one of those is the Renovator Store, a 100% True Blue Australian-owned company serving the Smart Renovator and their trade support. It's the fastest growing source in Australia for building and plumbing supplies. Scott Pendleberry is the founder and managing director and he joins me live now from what looks like to be the factory floor. Scott, very welcome to you to Calkine. Good morning, James. Thank you very much. Great to have you here, Scott. Now, I've given a little bit of an insight into what it is that Renovator Store offers, but can you give us a little bit more of an insight into exactly who your service caters for? Yeah, Renovator Store does focus on the smart renovator, the homeowner that's looking for better prices, a way to stretch their budget a bit further, and, and a homeowner that likes to, to pick their own products that are going to define their home. So, I think gone are the days where uh, you leave it up to your builder to source all your products. Uh, homeowners now have got everything at their fingertips online, and they can um, they can source these products quite easily with the click of a button. Absolutely. Now, a big trend that we've seen, Scott, in the past two years is a major increase in the amount of money being put back into the home, and I think that's largely due to the lack of travel with COVID and there's a bit of extra money hanging around. Based on the interaction that you've had with your customers, what would you say has been the major focus of a lot of those renovations? Well, I think, you know, if you look at some of the renovation trends lately, it, there's a lot of new ideas in design and in functionality. Um, you know, in design, the homeowner is exploring new finishes. Uh, there's, there's alternatives to plasterboarding, plasterboarding your, your walls, people even putting floorboards on their walls. Um, new finishes and things like sinks and taps, you can go for copper, brushed brass, you know, gone are the days of, of just choosing between chrome and black. So, you know, design's a big, a big trend at the moment, and and functionality. You know, spaces are smaller now because homes cost more, mm. and and I think you know people are looking for ways to get access to all the space that's available in the house. So, innovative storage hardware is is a big trend at the moment too. Have you seen, for example, a big uptake in things like granny flats and sheds? Given that there is a, a bit of a smaller space, people are looking to try and cram in as much as they can into their own property. Definitely. Uh, personally, I've seen some great ideas converting, you know, the, the garage or, or the granny flat in the back of the house to a very livable space, whether it's, you know, an alternative uh, workspace or or another play area for, for the children. Um, some of the innovative designs that we've seen um, make the best use of space, you know, in, in an increasingly expensive property market. Mm. Yeah, it's getting quite crazy at the moment, that's for sure. And, and look, another trend that has emerged is I think even well before the pandemic began, we saw quite a huge shift towards online marketplaces across a range of industries. Uh, what do you believe is the major benefit of operating the online space compared to, say, having a, a brick and mortar store? I know you've got the workhouse uh, there, obviously, the factory, but, um, you know, most of your, your work is actually completed online. Yeah, look, that, and that's... That's a great question. It really comes down to the benefits of sourcing online. You know, what are they? Um, and we've seen the propensity to, to source renovation products uh, really escalate during COVID. But if I think the smart renovator these days knows that the range online is, is far greater than 
what they're going to see driving around showrooms for the weekend. Uh, I was in a showroom last weekend and they even encouraged me to uh, go to the website because there's far more products <laughs> they can offer on the website than uh, what they can show on the, the showroom floor. But the other, the other big advantage is price. Uh, I think everyone understands these days if you're shopping from a retail bricks and mortar space, essentially you're paying for the, for the rent, the salesperson, the staff, uh, all those costs that uh, an online store doesn't have to pass on in the product price. So a good online store has has a small team, a great website, and basically a warehouse. So the cost of doing business is much lower. And if they're fair to their, their customers, that means lower prices. And that means you can push your budget a lot further or get the luxury items that you want. No, you're 100% right. Cutting down that overhead is such a huge differentiator between that inline uh, so the online store and the in-store physical presence. Now, we were touching on this a little bit in terms of what you can do to sort of spruce up the property that you have, maybe fit a bit more in. You were talking about offices being created, for example, um, wonderful things being done with garages and sheds. Obviously, at the moment, we're facing arguably our worst ever housing crisis in the country. A lot of people are feeling priced out of the market. Do you think there is a practical solution and is there a way that Renovate a Store can help in that regard? Well, yeah, I think there's two things that, that Australia is a little behind in, and, and one of them is building methods. Um, there are a lot of building methods in Europe that we yet to see here, we yet to be taken up uh, as mainstream. And a lot of those really speed up the building process, uh, cut the cost of, of the, the total build, and, and you end up with a more durable home. Um, space utilisation was, was another trend that I saw, but, uh, you know, renovator still tries to keep ahead of the curve in in the latest products and, and one of our biggest trends is is smart storage hardware you know the corner cabinet in your kitchen that's got pots and pans at the back that you never use uh, can now be pulled out uh, for easy access you've got pull out pantries that give you full access to the, the vertical space in, in your cap in your cabinets um, pull out bins that are hidden away but um, you know maximize the waste space that you can put in in your kitchen cupboard all these small products that uh, contribute to a much more versatile and functional house. It's interesting you mentioned that because another big trend that's emerged in the past few years is the young nomad who get those buses or the vans and they sort of kit them out with all sorts of uh, sinks and beds and stuff. Do you have quite a few people like that coming towards you uh, looking for that kind of product so that they can create their own little mobile home? We certainly do uh, service the mobile home market and we've got uh, a lot of, again, innovative storage that, that, that helps in that space and, and small sinks that are still at the luxury end but can go into a mobile home. We're not in the space for fold-out beds or anything, but that, that is a big trend at the moment where you have a multi-purpose space where um, you know, it can be converted to a bedroom with a press of a button and everything folds away and hides away from the living area. That means you can have one room for two purposes. So those are trends that you're going to see more and more of as space becomes more expensive. Now Scott, it does look like it's very busy back there. You've got your workers going hard at it behind you in the background. Uh, we are approaching Christmas. We know that's a very busy time. Have you seen a bit of an upswing in terms of uh, a bunch of families looking to develop and renovate their properties to make sure it's ready to have the family around, the extended family for Christmas? Yeah, it's a good question. This year is a bit different. Uh, typically, Christmas it does it does actually quieten down for us because, as you know, a lot of trade goes on holiday at Christmas, and a lot of building sites shut down. So, building activity overall typically quietens down over Christmas, and, and renovation products are not typically a gift product. However, this year I think because there's been a lot of projects on ice during the year, we, we're seeing a big pent up demand for um, projects to, to speed up. Um, mm. A lot of the market is suffering from lack of availability. Products are taking longer to come from overseas or get manufactured. So we're actually seeing a heightened activity at the moment. And we're, we're sending products all over Australia and New Zealand to, to meet that demand. Uh, so it does look like there's a rush coming up to the Christmas period to get things done. You know, so they can enjoy the new house or the new renovation for summer. Now, Scott, what do you think the future of building and renovation has in store for you? 
Um, there's definitely going to be more more of a move to online sourcing. It, it really is the way to um, get your products quickly, get fair pricing. Uh, the architectural space is is dramatic, very very quickly moving online, and that's that's an industry that typically had their favoured suppliers in the, the bricks and mortar space. I think that that's quickly moving to, to online sourcing, both in B2B and B2C areas. Um, other future renovation trends, as I mentioned, that you know the new building methods and space utilisation. I think overall, the, the homeowner is now taking charge of their renovation. They've got more information at their fingertips. They're a lot more savvy with a lot of the renovation shows and picking the design and function they want from all the fixtures and fittings in their home. Um, so I think people are more decisive and uh, know exactly what they want and, and they're just hiring the builder to execute. I think you're right, Scott. Every time I watch Grand Designs, there's two things I think, wow, I wish I could do that. And also, wow, I want to stay the hell away from it because I know I would butcher it if I tried myself. Uh, is, is there anywhere we can find you? Do we have uh, social media, websites? Obviously, there's the sign in the background there. Well, renovatorstore.com.au is our main website. Uh, we, we're on Instagram as Renovator Store and Facebook as Renovator Store and, and Pinterest as Renovator Store. They're all great resources to find new ideas and communicate with our service team. Wonderful. Well, Scott, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks, James. Appreciate it. Well, that's Scott Pendlebury, the founding director of online building supplies marketplace Renovator Store. And if you missed any part of that interview, you can catch the full chat shortly on our YouTube channel, Kaokai Media, so don't forget to subscribe. That's all for this Expert Talk. I'm James Preston reminding you to stay apprised and invest wise with Kaokai. Another live news update here at Kalkine TV. I'm Rose Jacobs. Thanks for joining me. Google's parent company Alphabet reported another quarter of solid growth, capping the financial uh, the final rather three month three months of fiscal 2021 with a 32 percent jump in sales to US 75.3 billion dollars despite antitrust hurdles. Shares of Alphabet jumped more than 7 percent in after hours trading. The results beat the average analysts forecast of US $72 billion according to Refinitiv data. In addition, the revenue of US $74.9 billion was more than the average estimate of $71.652 billion. The search giant's advertising, hardware and cloud computing segments benefited from holiday shopping. It was the company's third straight quarter of record sales. The company also announced a 24 one stock split in which shareholders as of July 1, 2022, will receive additional 19 shares subject to the shareholders' approval for the split. Alphabet CFO Ruth Porat said the company aimed to make shares available to more buyers. Google, which generates most of its revenue from internet ads, said it lost some sales because of companies' product trimmed budget and new iPhone privacy measures during the third quarter. In the last quarter, however, its ad revenue rose by 32.5% against the average. Analysts expect Google to continue its lead in internet ad sales over its rivals. Its secondary businesses, including cloud, also lifted the overall sales. Cloud revenue rose 45% higher than the expected. Also, its fiscal 2021 profit increased by 89%, while sales rose by 41% year on year. Alphabet shares gained 43% over the past 12 months. Let's look at the regulatory hurdles that Google is facing. Google faces regulatory challenges in the US and Europe against its search, ad tech and app store businesses. It also faces allegations of secretly collecting customers' location data. 
The U.S. and the European Union plan to bring laws to curtail its market dominance. The proposed U.S. regulations aim to limit Google's ability to preference its own businesses and force it to divest its ad tech unit. These challenges would increase its legal expenses and discourage it from going for acquisitions that could invite regulators' ire, saying analysts. Wall Street Journal reported that the company could be forced to discontinue some of its business to comply with with the court rulings or new laws. Over the past quarter, much of Google's revenue came from e-commerce ads as businesses moved online to overcome the pandemic disruptions. The tech giant had partnered with the e-commerce firm Shopify Inc. to simplify the search listings and ad purchases for merchants. Google has been increasingly under pressure from investors to diversify its business, although its digital ad segment still accounts for over 80% of total sales. It is investing in a cloud computing unit to compete with established players like Amazon.com and Microsoft. And that's the latest in the news breaking updates. I'm Rose Jacobs. Thanks for joining me. Hi there, James Preston for Cowkind TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Kalkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Kalkine TV. Welcome to the Expert Talks by Kalkine TV. I'm Sage. Today's guest is Ms. Kirsten Koftry, the founder and CLO at Gaia Learning and Teach SDGs Ambassador. In celebration of International Education Day, we're gaining the insights of those who tirelessly dedicate their life to education and raising the awareness of the community. So please keep watching in the end, to the end to find out more. So bringing you live today, we have Ms. Kirsten Kuftry, the founder and CLO at Gaia Learning. Welcome to the show, Kirsten. Hi, Sage. Thank you very much for having me. You um, pronounced my surname perfectly, but it's Gaia Learning is um, the name of our company. Gaia Learning. Thank you. Okay. Well, Kirsten, I'm glad I at least got the name right. And I'm so glad to have you with us today. We have to make the most of our time together. So let's dive straight into the discussion to understand a little bit more about Gaia Learning. So you offer personalized learning on demand for ambitious families looking for flexible and bespoke education. Could we find out a bit more about your services? 
Um, yes, of course. Um, it actually started before the pandemic, but during um, our first school closures in the UK is where um, our services really took off. Uh, lots of families having to continue to work um, flexibly through um, various lockdowns and lots of um, families as well who had their kids in private education um, with job uncertainty still wanting that personalized approach for their children um, but needing something a bit more affordable so that's when it sort of took off and we did classes around the sustainable development goals keeping kids um, active and learning and busy and not bothering their parents um, while everybody was dealing with a lot of uncertainty um, through through the pandemic and through lockdown. And it really gave us a real insight into how education could be um, could change and just how much more agency young children could have as part of that change in their education. So really interested in what's happening in Australia at the moment around um, student visas and, and how um, the government there are emphasising the role of, of students. They certainly are. Um, there's been some great um, initiatives for internships and it seems that there has been a focus on upskilling and, and some free education offers as well from the government. So we have been very lucky during the pandemic. So you're an ambassador for teaching at the United Nations Sustainable Development. How are you driving the goal apart from doing your work at Gaia Learning as well, of course? And how a great space for you to be in, a very exciting space, but also one that's kind of vulnerable being at the front line there in the conditions that we're in. Uh, we do appreciate your insights today. Thank you very much for having me. I think yeah, the kids are the ones that are rewriting and creating these new spaces. So, um, yeah, we've got to let them in. <laughs> exactly. There's a room for all of us to flourish. Thank you, Kirsten. Really do appreciate your time. Thank you. Bye. If you just joined us, we had a very interesting discussion from the education space. Ms. Kirsten Coftry, founder at Gaia Learning. And you can watch the full interview on YouTube via Calkine Media's channel and keep watching for more of the Expert Talks live market updates. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Property by Kalkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Calkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching Property with Calkine.
Hello, and this is Rachel live from Kalkine Studios, and you're watching the IPO Corner Show, a weekly show dedicated to the IPO market performance and brings you hot public offerings and all important information about the listing companies under the spotlight. However, before investing in any shares, investors need to understand the business prospects and operations in detail, such as future risks and returns. This can include changing the IPO price or issuance date as the companies see fit. Let us first take a look at proposed Andean Mining IPO that's slated for the 14th of February at 12 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Time, according to the ASX IPO announcements. Andean Mining is an Australian mining and exploration company operating in Colombia. They operate through their wholly owned subsidiary, Corporación Minera de Colombia. The subsidiary company owns 100% of the El Dovio Copper Gold Silver Zinc VMS licenses in Central West Colombia. Adian Mining look to raise up to $6 million at $0.02 cents a share in its IPO. Moving on to the next company now, according to ASX announcements, Top End Energy has proposed its plans to list on the ASX on the 14th of February at 1 p.m. Top End Energy's primary objective is to play a significant role in the ongoing and necessary global energy transition to help reduce carbon emissions. The company plans to deliver on this objective through unlocking natural gas, hydrogen and helium potential within its existing asset portfolio while pursuing the development of clean energy solutions to offset any carbon emissions the company produces and facilitate a cleaner energy mix for the future. Top End Energy look to raise up to $6.4 million at $0.20 cents a share in its IPO. And lastly, we have U.S. Student Housing REIT. They're proposed to list on the ASX at 10.30 on the 16th of February. The REIT acquires and manages student housing assets near top-tier public universities across America. It aims to drive value from its operational strategies and capital upgrades. The REIT will be the only Australian listed property trust primarily investing in U.S. student housing. The REIT has targeted a stabilised yield of over 6% each year for investors to be paid quarterly to its unit holders. Applications from retail and institutional investors will be accepted from the 17th of January to the 7th of Feb. Citigroup Global Markets is the financial advisor for the listing jointly managed by lead managers, Bell Potter Securities and Shore & Partners. U.S. Student Housing REIT seeks to raise $45 million from the issue of around 32.63 million shares at an offer price of $1.38 each. Well, it's time to wrap up the show, but let me share this critical information first. Before investing in IPOs, investors must check the credibility and the track record of the company. The risk appetite level can vary from investors and they need to consider factors such as an analyst view, brokerage ratings, industry outlook, financial performance and the peers review before making an investment decision. Also, it's important to note that companies can change their IPO price or issuance date as they see fit. Well, that's all for the IPO Corner Show for now. Stay tuned to Calkine TV. We've got many more shows lined up for you with live updates across the economy, markets and sectors. This is Rachel signing off for now. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Hello, welcome to the Expert Talks by Kelkine TV. I'm Sage. Today's guest is Mr. Mark Whitten, who's a CIO at Portal 
Asset Management. And Portal Asset Management are a multi-award winning digital fund manager whose data-driven strategy has the ability to provide excellent return on investment to high-value clients. In today's show, Mr. Mark Witten will discuss a new offering from the fund managers, the Horizon Weighted Index Fund. And as you know, we bring you the industry leaders and successful business owners in order to understand the insights of the stock market, or in this case, the crypto sector. So bringing you live today, we have Mr. Mark Witten, CIO of Portal Asset Management. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Great to have you on and exciting news coming from the Portal Asset team. So, Mark, let's start off with the success of Portal Asset Management's digital fund. It's great to hear that there's a new offering of the financial mm. instrument from you. Can you tell us more about the Horizon Index Fund and how it will open the opportunity for wholesale investors to get exposure to the digital asset space? Sure. Um, so we noticed in our interactions with family offices, uh, for the most part, that some of the barriers to entry um, for them were the complexity of the trading strategies and um, the issues around custody and counterparty risk. And the fact that, you know, if they wanted to hold crypto directly, they would be taking on risks such as, um, you know, who has who's holding the keys, key man risk, or somebody should something should happen to that person and so on. Um, so guided by what we perceived as quite a, a strong need in the market for what we call a pseudo ETF type product, we put together the uh, Portal Horizon Index Fund, which is basically an equally weighted index of the top 25 crypto assets, um, both cryptocurrencies as well as the DeFi assets and smart contracts, DeFi tokens and smart contracts. So excluding stable coins, excluding anything that's pegged to a fiat currency. Um, the reason we did this is that we perceive that as much as um, Bitcoin and Ethereum dominate the market in terms of their weighting, we believe that the next level of growth and, you know, we'd prefer to have a broad market exposure to the top 25 crypto assets across all the sectors, you know, not just layer one, but layer two, NFTs, um, you know, the new gaming tokens, etc. And the thought is to reduce the, the risk in terms of holding the keys and the custody um, so we use boutique asset management or boutique capital in Sydney as our trustee. Um, we have Gemini as the as the custodian, and we we generally trade on Binance. Um, so it's very safe, secure. You get units in the Horizon Index Fund. We re-rate it monthly. So on a monthly basis, um, we just take a view as to what each of the tokens have done, and we re rebalance the fund so that there's four percent of capital in each of the uh, in each of the tokens. That's, that's excellent news. Sounds like you've really thought this through, Mark. Would you mind if I ask a question about the funds under management with Portal at the moment? Do you have that data available? Yes. Um, so the Portal Digital Fund, which is the flagship fund, started um, in May 2020, going on um, just over well, 20 months now. Um, we're close to 20 million US dollars, depending on how this month goes. You know, we started off the month at, at around 18 and we had inflows, but the market's down probably around 10 to 15 percent. So we'll see how the month ends. Um, but we'll call it call it 18 million US dollars confirmed there in the Horizon Index Fund, which has just been launched. Um, it's been in the planning for a while, but we've just launched it now. Um, there's probably about only three, four hundred thousand uh, dollars in there at the moment. But we're, we're you know, we haven't really started marketing it as yet so going into the new year we'll be driving it um, as well as a potential third fund which will be an actively managed um, long short type strategy that's fantastic mark uh, well happy to help spread the news about this fantastic new product from portal asset management so how does the horizon weighted index fund outshine the ProShares bitcoin futures etf or singapore's fintonia bitcoin physical fund please so I think if we take a look at the, the correlation between um, between Bitcoin and Ethereum and the rest of the, the overall market, the correlation is still very high. Um, it's, it's call it around between 80 and, and as much as over 90% in times of, of stress. However, on a, on a weighted strategy, um, taking into account fees, we've achieved 200, I think it was 257% versus 243% versus the CCI 30. And that's because some of the DeFi and smart contract tokens have outperformed relative to Bitcoin, which had a spectacular run. Layer one tokens had a spectacular run in October. 
um, but they're also you know tend to fall really hard as well during times of, of, of market volatility but it's it's you know it's a passively managed fund so there's no real active um, it's not like we sit and decide which tokens get weighted more or less it's it's broad you know 20 25 tokens four percent in each token we reweight it on a monthly basis and it's passively managed so you're just getting a broad market exposure as such you're taking on market volatility which is still around um north of 80 percent at the moment closer to 90 percent with the correction we saw over the weekend um, so it's not a managed vol product like the initial flagship fund which maintains volatility mm -hmm. below 20 odd percent it's less than a third of the overall market and that fund is delivered around 90 percent net of fees for the year well, I think one of the selling points, as you mentioned, is that it's a broad uh, basket of those top 25 altcoins, is it? Do you include Bitcoin mm -hmm. as well? Yeah. Yeah. So the top, you know, Bitcoin is 4%, Ethereum is 4%, Solana is 4%, etc., all the way down to the top 25, excluding the stable coins. So you still get exposure to the likes of Bitcoin and Ethereum, but mm -hmm. on a monthly basis, we just reweight them. So, you know, if something's rallying hard, um, you know, it'll be, it'll be, cuts on a monthly basis and vice versa if it's starting to fall out the index it'll be up weighted but you're not going to be you know just holding this all the way down once it gets past the top 25 it's, it's removed or once something goes into the top 25 for more than a week it's added excellent thank you for explaining that to us so the back testing on your strategy has provided some promising results potentially earning investors up to an amazing 250 percent return on investment could you talk us through this please Sure. Well, I mean, it's it's essentially, you know, as, as, as the strategy has been explained, um, you take a look at equally weighting those, those top 25 tokens from the beginning of the year and on a monthly basis, looking at what they've achieved over the month and then reweighting everything. We based it on a, a, a nominal sum of a million dollars invested um, and then, you know, weighting it, as I said, on a monthly basis, cutting the ones that have done really well and then upscaling some of those that had had lagged. And this balances out over time. You, you know, the, the majority of tokens tend to follow the lead of, of Bitcoin and Ethereum. There are times when in the first half of the year, the first call it quarter of the year, the overall market outperformed um, Bitcoin and Ethereum. But then it also fell a lot harder in May and June. Um, and then Bitcoin caught up and rallied and, and so did all the layer ones in, in October. So net net over time, you know, the, we believe this broad proxy gives you a better representation with the same volatility, but I think you're getting exposure to, you know, better, a more diversified portfolio that's not subject to just one or two tokens that, that, that are dominating the performance. Yes, exactly. And, and it can be to an investor's benefit to hold uh, cryptocurrencies over a long span of time rather than trade it um, to see the changes in the price. And some of the altcoins have seen amazing uh, returns of a thousand percent or more over the last 12 months which is amazing to see so the horizon index fund is open to sophisticated and institutional investors as well as family offices ad advertise on your website can Australian investors invest via family trusts or self-managed super funds at all mark yes no they can they can invest via those those structures there's not a problem um, and it's domiciled locally so you know there's there's no issue with um, with foreign entities and whatnot I think, you know, we, we've also just seen, just to, to kind of finish off on, on, on your initial earlier point around uh, some of the tokens that performed, um, you've seen a shift away in strategies, away from more quantitatively driven strategies uh, towards more fundamentally driven strategies and investors that are looking into thematics and investing in some of the tokens that are outside the mainstream. But we haven't really got many um, ETF type products. I think this is the first here in, in Australia. Um, there's a couple, um, you know, that you can take a look at indices that you can either replicate or look at purchasing. The Sarsen, um, you mentioned ProShares, um, there's a few other. But I think net net, you know, for family offices that are looking to generate, you know, intergenerational wealth, that are looking to, to give themselves a bit of diversification to the space, that have a longer time horizon and are very conscious of fees. You know, this is a passively managed product, so there's just a management fee and there's no performance fees. At the same time, there's no, like, token picking. It's just the top 25, excluding stable coins. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing that. Sounds like an amazing product. So if people want to find out more about this, they can just head straight to the Portal Asset Management website. Is that correct? Yes, portal.am. Thank you. And the subscription forms and all the rest of it there. So it's very easy to, to find. If it's, essentially, there'll be three products in the long run. There will be the 
Portal Digital Fund, which is a low vol fund, very much you know less than a third of the market volatility and very diversified. There'll be an actively managed fund in the middle, which is more of a long short fund, conservative around 35 to 50% annualized volatility. And then there'll be this Horizon Index Fund, which is just a broad representation of the overall market and will therefore give you the market returns. It'll be the same as buying the S&P 500, you know, if, you, if you're related to the ASX, if you're related to buying an equity index. Yes, it could be a good way to get introduced to the whole crypto sector and understand how the volatility um, affects investments, but on a broad basis of a, the top 25 cryptocurrencies, um, it'll be interesting to see how that balances out and, and provides a significant return using your strategy. So Mark, we're reaching the end of our discussion now. What are the ways of investing in digital assets and where does Horizon fit into these offerings, please? Yeah, I mean, so you, you can buy the tokens directly. You can open an account. Um, I see, unfortunately, another um, exchange, Melbourne-based exchange, ran into some difficulties being placed under administration. So you have to be very wary of counterparty risk, um, you know, and, and, and custody risk. So if you're buying the tokens directly, you know, ensure that whoever's holding the keys, um, that you have some sort of at least in duplicates, in triplicates even better, authentication. Um, and if one set of the keys is lost, you're still able to recover because that is the real risk. You know, in crypto, whoever's holding the keys controls the crypto. And the second strategy would be to go out there and find, um, you know, find a fund. Australia's got some some great funds like Apollo, um, Digital Asset Capital Management, with this Digital Asset Fund. Um, there's some great offshore funds. There's the big, you know, the Panteras and Galaxies. And then there's lots of niche funds, which is what we look for. We look for funds um, within the Portal Digital Fund, which is the third way to invest is via a fund of fund structures. We look for best in class fund managers that are all running very differentiated strategies. So we give you a lot more diversification and a lot less correlation. You know, the beta of that fund is around 0.25. So when the markets are down, like in November, the markets are down between seven and 9%. Our fund was flat. Um, you know, again, in, in, in September, the markets were down, I think nine, we were down one and a half. So we tend to be down around you know, at most 10 to 15% of the overall market drawdown. So it gives you a more smooth volatility profile. And that's, you know, the Horizon Fund sits on the opposite end of that spectrum where you're not getting any hedging, you're not getting any protection, you're just taking market risk. So it's a great timing tool, you know, when the markets are down, excuse me, as they were over the weekend, and as much as 20, 25%, mm -hmm. now would be a good time to invest in a fund like that as you're getting, you know, a broad exposure at a, at a relatively much you know, cheaper valuation. Yes, you're absolutely right there. Buy low, sell high is the usual adage that goes along with that. And diversification is one of the best tactics to um, impact or to manage volatility, which um, is one of the factors that people think of when they think of investing in crypto. So it sounds like a brilliant time to take a closer look at Portal Asset Management's Horizon Weighted Index Fund. Mark, thank you so much for your insights today. It was great to connect again. Was there anything you'd like to share with us before we close off the discussion? Um, yeah, I think we, we've got a, a really wonderful webinar um, tomorrow with Henry um, Oslanian, the head of PwC's crypto strategy. We'll be putting out his report. I think when investors are starting to sit down and think about their asset allocation decisions for 2022 and where they'd like to allocate to equities, fixed income, real estate and alternatives, uh, bearing in mind the change in the inflationary outlook and interest rate outlook that kind of sparked this latest sell off last week. It'll be good to, to sit down with us. We'll give our sort of brief market outlook and Henry will give his outlook for the crypto space. I think it'll be a very entertaining and um, enjoyable webinar that we'll be um, you know, hosting tomorrow. So if anyone would like the link, feel free to reach out to me. It's you know, mark at portal.am and I'll, I'll register you and get you a link. Fantastic, Mark. Thank you. Looking forward to your webinar. I'll hopefully be there too. And thanks for joining us and making time amidst your busy schedule to share the latest from Portal Asset Management. Well, thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Well, everyone, that was Mr. Mark Whitten from Portal Asset Management with the fantastic news about the New Horizon Weighted Index Fund. Sounds quite inviting at the times now when the market has recently had a bit of a flash crash and a sell-off. The prices are lower than they usually are in some cases. I think Bitcoin reached a price that it hadn't seen since October this year. So. 
who knows where it's going to go next. Probably upwards, um, but we'll just have to wait and see what the charts are showing. Um, thanks for joining us. If you wanted to catch any more of that interview, it'll be available on our YouTube channel, Calcine Media. And keep watching Calcine for more of the expert talks, live market updates. But till the next episode, stay apprised and invest wise with Calcine. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkind's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkind TV. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Property by Kalkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Kalkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching Property with Kalkine. Thanks for joining us on Calkine TV. My name's Sage. We're bringing you some trending news just now. The Federal Trade Commission is expected to open an antitrust probe into Microsoft Corporation's 68.7 billion US dollar mega deal to acquire gaming company Activision Blizzard, media reports have said. According to a person familiar with the matter whom Bloomberg cited, the FTC would soon start an antitrust review of the proposed acquisition. The Commission will probe whether the takeover will harm competition, the report said. And Activision Blizzard is the publisher of popular video game franchises such as Call of Duty. Regulators plan to toughen the merger rules to discourage big companies from acquiring smaller rivals. And in the past two years, merger filings have surged in the US. They fear the situation could worsen. 
And generally, the Justice Department investigates such cases. This time, however, the FTC has taken up the case. And earlier, the Federal Trade Commission had unanimously voted to block arms maker Lockheed Martin's proposed 4.4 billion US dollar purchase of rocket engine maker Aerojet Rocketdyne Holdings over antitrust fears. Microsoft had announced the Activision deal in January, its biggest ever acquisition on record. Let's look at how this purchase can bolster Microsoft's video gaming business. The acquisition is expected to bolster Microsoft's successful video gaming business while putting it in a better position to take on its main rivals, Tencent Holdings Limited and Sony Group Corp. Days after Microsoft's announcement, Sony Corp also had revealed plans to acquire Bungie Inc., the creator of video games like Halo and Destiny, for 3.6 billion US dollars. The deal would make Microsoft the world's third largest gaming company. And so far, the Xbox maker hasn't faced stricter regulatory scrutiny, like Alphabet and Meta platforms. Sources cited by Reuters said that the Redmond, Washington-based tech giant would pay three billion US dollars if the Activision deal falls apart, suggesting it was sure of winning antitrust approval. The transaction is expected to complete in June 2023. Microsoft MSFT stock was down 0.81% to US $308.45 US at 4 p.m. Eastern Time on Tuesday. And thanks for joining us in that report. This is Sage signing off for now, but keep watching uh, Kalkine TV for more live market updates and expert talks. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. A teenager tracking Elon Musk's private jet has asked him for $50,000 to stop. Well, let's take a closer look. I'm Rachel Jones and this is Kalkine Media. A 19-year-old student and aviation enthusiast from Florida in the US has caused a star with Tesla billionaire Elon Musk around the existence of a Twitter bot whose purpose it is to track Musk's Gulfstream private jet and post real-time updates of its location. Jack Sweeney is the creator of the bot at Elon Jet, and it seems Musk is not too happy about it. After discovering the existence of the bot, Musk direct messaged Sweeney asking him to take the bot down as it poses a security risk to him. As the SpaceX founder put it, I don't love the idea of being shot by a nutcase. Following some back and forth between Musk and Sweeney, Musk offered the teenager $5,000 to take the bot down, to which Sweeney made a counteroffer. He replied back, any chance to up that to 50K? It would be great supporting college and would possibly allow me to get a car, maybe even a Tesla Model 3. Now, Musk ultimately turned the offer down, saying he felt uneasy about paying to shut down a bot which he sees as a threat to his security. Sweeney later released the private conversation through Twitter's direct message service to the public in the hope it would pull Musk back to reconsider the offer. Sweeney added that he'd worked hard on the project and that $5,000 was not sufficient compensation for the time and effort he'd put into the project. The Florida student later offered to delete the account if Musk gave him an internship at one of his companies, the eccentric billionaire and innovator, is yet to respond. Now, if you like this video, you can like, share and comment on it. And you can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel signing off for now.
Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calkine TV. market bleeding heavily for the last few sessions, the Australian financial space, especially the banking sector, has also taken a hit. I'm Rachel Jones and this is Calkine Media. The ASX 200 banks, which comprises seven companies from the benchmark ASX 200, classified as a member of the banks industry, has fallen 5.69% this year to 2,438. But how are Australia's top-notch banks faring amid this continuous selling spree? Let's take a look at these ASX banking stocks and their performance so far this year. The Australia and New Zealand Banking Group, the Melbourne headquartered ANZ Bank, has a market cap of $75.37 billion and is one of the largest financial institutions of the country. ANZ shares have been on the decline for the last few sessions, having shed 5.96% in the last five trading sessions. The volatility in the stock price has also spiked as its 14-day average true range, which depicts the daily average move in stock, has has risen to 61 cents, the highest since March 2021. However, there is a strong support around $26.30 to $26.60 on the charts, which has kept the stock from falling since March last year. Next up, let's take a look at the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, also known as ComBank. It's a Sydney-based banking giant. It's the largest bank of Australia in terms of market capitalization, which stands at $162.87 billion. The pandemic doesn't seem to have impacted the bank significantly as CBA clocked revenue worth $24.5 billion and a net profit of $10.18 billion in financial year 2021. However, CBA shares haven't been able to resist the market-wide selling and have fallen 7.35% this year. The third bank on the list is the National Australia Bank, a Melbourne-based financial institution. The bank reported a noticeable jump in net profit to $6.36 billion in financial year 2021 compared to a net profit of $2.56 billion a year ago. The market cap of the NAB currently stands at $89.12 billion, and NAB shares have witnessed liquidation from investors' portfolios in 2022. So in conclusion, Australian shares haven't had a good start to the year so far. The benchmark ASX 200 index has tumbled a sizable 8.3% recently. The index has fallen below the psychological support level of 7,000 to hit 6,000 769.2, the lowest level since April 2021. Now, if you did like the information in this video, you can like, share and comment on it. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon for notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel signing off for Calcai Media. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know.
Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Welcome to the Expert Talks by Calkine TV. I'm Sage. Today's guest is Ms. Kirsten Koftry, the founder, CLO at Gay Learning and Teach SDGs Ambassador. In celebration of International Education Day, we're gaining the insights of those who tirelessly dedicate their life to education and raising the awareness of the community. So please keep watching in the end, to the end to find out more. So bringing you live today, we have Ms. Kirsten Kuftry, the founder and CLO at Gaia Learning. Welcome to the show, Kirsten. Hi, Steve. Thank you very much for having me. You um, pronounced my surname perfectly, but it's Gaia Learning is um, the name of our company. Gaia Learning. Thank you. Okay. Well, Kirsten, I'm glad I at least got the name right. And I'm so glad to have you with us today. We have to make the most of our time together. So let's dive straight into the discussion to understand a little bit more about Gaia Learning. So you offer personalized learning on demand for ambitious families looking for flexible and bespoke education. Could we find out a bit more about your services? Um, yes, of course. Um, it actually started before the pandemic, but during um, our first school closures in the UK is where um, our services really took off. Uh, lots of families having to continue to work um, flexibly through um, various lockdowns and lots of um, families as well who had their kids in private education um, with job uncertainty, still wanting that personalized approach for their children, um, but needing something a bit more affordable. So that's when it sort of took off and we did classes around the sustainable development goals, keeping kids um, active and learning and busy and not bothering their parents um, while everybody was dealing with a lot of uncertainty um, through, through the pandemic and through lockdown. And it really gave us a real insight into how education could be um, could change and just how much more agency young children could have as part of that change in their education. So really interested in what's happening in Australia at the moment around um, student visas and, and how um, the government there are emphasizing the role of, of students. They certainly are. Um there's been some great um, initiatives for internships and it seems that there has been a focus on upskilling and, and some free education offers as well from the government so we have been very lucky during the pandemic so you're an ambassador for teaching at the united nations sustainable development how are you driving the goal apart from doing your work at gaia learning as well of course and how is your involvement with the united nations on education um, helping to progress the goals please um, so during as i said that period where we were doing these kind of homeschool classes and helping parents manage their workload in the pandemic um, this time last year um, i was recognized as an ambassador for teaching the sustainable development goals and we were able to kind of collaborate in a global classroom with kids from all over the world. And it was just so inspiring to see kids coming up with solutions to the real big problems that we face in the world, not just what's going on in Australia at the moment, but I think governments everywhere are having to find joined up solutions. And actually kids are the ones that have got those really great ideas in how we can solve um, solve those problems. So I think with migration and disease um, and education, they're just some of the problems that um, really do need collaboration um, and involvement from young people. And um, I think that the government should 
certainly make it easier for young people to come on shore to be involved in that process. Um, I'm a little bit biased. I'm joining you today, obviously, from the UK, but I started my career um, in an internet um, events media company in Sydney on a temporary visa myself. And I certainly wouldn't be, um, 15 years later, the CEO of a startup company myself if I hadn't have been given that opportunity at a really exciting and important point in my life. So I really think that it is so important to um, focus on visas for young people to come into the countries. I mean, Australia really does have that geographical isolation that is a disadvantage to it in competing with talent and students from um, all over the world. And I think reducing barriers to entry is really, really important. Absolutely, and thank you so much for sharing your own personal story there. That's very inspiring. And, well, what work seems to be evolving to become more remote. You can work for an organisation wherever you are now, as long as you have a computer and internet these days. And it seems that, you know, the world that it is now has evolved so much as well that it's, it's almost hard to prepare for the future because we don't know what it holds. So I, I think enhancing children's imaginations and by traveling, you can gain so much more of this life experience, I guess, is what you're saying from your own experience. What are you noticing from the students' reactions after understanding that there is a whole different world out there that, that they could connect with? Yeah, I think it's not just the, um, the students. I mean, young, young kids are so good at um, kind of self-directing their learning and learning through YouTube and TikTok and um, and all of these places that adults and teachers don't really have a hold on anymore. Mm. Um, what I'm keen to do with Gaia Learning is actually create a place for teachers and educators to be able to be really innovative with, um, with the profession of teaching. It is also a, an industry that is rapidly evolving. Um, we set up just before the pandemic, as I said, the year before, but since COVID, it has been the most rapid acceleration of the shiniest, whizziest, most interactive ed tech tools out there. And it's, it is a really, really exciting place to be um, involved with, but it also offers opportunities for real flexible work for teachers in a way that wasn't traditionally possible. So um, I actually left the classroom um, completely this time last year when um, my business grew enough to um, allow me to do that. But what I can see at offering is more opportunities for um, women, I'm a single mum with three kids, um, to earn good money in education, um, to be able to travel and to live um, in different places around the world. Um, I do hope one day we will return to Australia. Um, and I think that it's both work and education that we've seen changing. So I think what's interesting with government incentives, um, we've seen it in the UK a lot, this need or desire to kind of patch over and get back to normal and um, just invest in the things that kind of worked in the past, but I think a lot of a lot of that money, um, you know, six hundred and thirty pounds for it, or sorry, um, dollars for a, for a student is um, it's nice, but it's it's not really going to change anything major. Um, investing that money more into better synchronous and asynchronous. Um, education models where um, students can flexibly work remotely and onshore in Australia so that they're not wasting their money while they're waiting for, for um, lockdowns or isolations or things to, to come to an end. Um, there are new spaces where education is happening and that's where the investment I think needs to happen. Um, if governments aren't willing to do it, I think that's where businesses are um, you know need to put a put more focus 
Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing your insider's perspective there, because sometimes we kind of take education for granted. But I think your perspective is fantastic in regards to keeping the, the teachers and the educators themselves uh, excited and inspired by the work that they do, because it is, can be taxing at times, and, and their dedication you know, should not be sniffed at, because it's, it's almost not a 24-hour job, but there is an emotional uh, bond that you have to gain the maturity to deal with that the students kind of get connected to you and expect things from you that sometimes go beyond the description of the role so very very interesting point there that you make to keep the the sprite for life in the educators as well so we're that's coming to where I think, oh sorry one more point on yes, that is please. I think that's where it's so so exciting where technology can take us there because um, when we use technology to reduce the main, the mundane um, processes and jobs that teachers are having to do that really do kill the enthusiasm and stop that ability to be able to connect with students because um, of that extra work, we can um, replace that with technology. So get um, in our online ecosystem all of that teacher workload is massively reduced with flipped classrooms um, and automated processes so that our educators can just be left with the energy to, um, to connect with and inspire the, their students um, and um, not have to deal with, with that. And because of that, we've had, we are always inundated with applications from educators to join our team. Um, so I think this space is going to grow and, and certainly it can in the tertiary education sector as well. Yes, and it's so great that your mission is to help these people because I'm, I'm sure their studies have been disrupted a lot from the lockdowns, etc. So um, very valued discussion we're having here. And as we reach the end, let's just find out a little bit more about how making learning more human and more flexible can be more valuable in your opinion through what you do at Gaia Learning. Um, so yeah, I, mean, I was originally a geography teacher um, after I um, moved back to the UK and so for me the purpose of education is very much to solve the issues that we're facing on our planet and on our earth if we can't teach kids how to do that, then I think that you know self-actualization and and all of those other um, things are, um, you know, we're not going to get there. <laughs> so I um, really advocate for using technology and the online space in um, in the classroom to free families and young people to spend more time out in nature and um, playing. <laughs> and looking and being part of the world around them. Um, I think there's a misconception of online learning that it is um, negative for kids and that it's all one um, uh, <laughs> space. But if we completely reimagine what that could be in a personalized way, then um, I think that we can make more, learning more human, join up our solutions to um, problems and really create something that's not just an emergency response to the pandemic, but real pandemic proof, future proof solutions to education. And I think that's where government money um, or investor money needs to be um, directed right now. Yes, exactly. We're kind of selling the future to the learners, but also selling the fact that the learners need a future to the, the governments who fund these type of projects. Thank you so much, Kirsten. It's, it's a great space for you to be in, a very exciting space, but also one that's kind of vulnerable being at the front line there in the conditions that we're in. Uh, we do appreciate your insights today. Thank you very much for having me. I think yeah, the kids are the ones that are rewriting and creating these new spaces. So, um, yeah, we've got to let them in. <laughs> exactly. There's a room for all of us to flourish. Thank you, Kirsten. Really do appreciate your time. Thank you. Bye.
If you just joined us, we had a very interesting discussion from the education space. Miss Kirsten Coftery, founder at Gaia Learning. And you can watch the full interview on YouTube via Calkine Media's channel. And keep watching for more of the Expert Talks live market updates. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Calkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Calkine TV. five-year agreement between Binance and the Argentinian Football Association is a fine example of how the crypto world is solidifying its roots in the real world, especially in Argentina's football arena. Hey, and thanks for tuning in. I'm Holly Shields for Kalkai Media. Binance will be the major sponsor of all Argentinian national soccer teams over the next five years thanks to this new agreement. The partnership intends to strengthen the brand's relationship with one of the world's most popular soccer teams, introducing cryptocurrencies to fans and users to more developed crypto technologies. The deal also involves releasing a new fan token, which will be available soon on the platform. Argentina's national team had previously partnered with another cryptocurrency platform and signed a two-year agreement with Bybit in November of last year. With over 2 million registered members, Bybit is one of the most rapidly developing cryptocurrency exchanges. Under the terms of agreement, Lionel Messi, the team's captain, and his teammates will have the company's logo on their trading clothes until November of 2023. But aside from Bybit, Binance has replaced another crypto exchange, Socios, which had retaliated against the AFA, claiming there's been a contract breach. The football organization had previously launched a similar fan token with a company called Sarg. Socios maintains that their terms were broken when Binance was brought on board as the AFA's principal worldwide sponsor, barely nine months after the deal was signed. Nevertheless, given that Argentinians live and breathe football, Binance's deal with the AFA is expected to establish the platform's foothold in Argentina. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other videos to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Calcai Media. Are you sick of paying through the roof for a product that doesn't truly suit you? Want to make sure that you get the best deal possible? Then let us help you. At Calkine, we do the research, run the numbers, and take a look at the true value of the product to make sure that you're informed as a consumer. Whether it be the best streaming service to suit your binge watching desires, the right broadband and NBN plans to ensure a no buffering experience, saving money with your energy, gas, and mobile plans, or treating yourself with a bit of retail therapy. We will break down all the details about every single deal. What's in it, how much it costs, and whether it's worth it for you. If you want to save money and stay informed, then subscribe to the channel and press the bell icon as we will be rolling out a stack of content to keep you in the know. Hi there, Rose Jacobs with you for breaking news here at Calkine TV. Bullying, sexism and harassment culture has been declared at mining giant Rio Tinto.
Rio Tinto released a report on its workplace culture as a part of its commitment to ensure constant cultural change across its global operations. Elizabeth Broderick, a former Australian Sex Discrimination Commissioner, carried out the report. The reports have summarised that there has been bullying, harassment and racism culture at the global mining giant. In the report, there was almost 21 women who had complained about actual or attempted rape or sexual assault in the past five years. The report was compiled after eight months of research, during which more than 10,000 people shared their experience with Rio Tinto. An online survey was conducted during this period for more insights and views on the company's culture. The information in the report was also compiled from more than 100 groups, 85 confidential individual confessions and nearly 140 personal written submissions. The report has also summarised that 28.2% of women and almost 6.7% of men have gone through sexual harassment at work in the past five years. Racism has been very common in the company, according to the report. Bullying and sexism have been systema systematic across Rio Tinto also. After the report went public, Jacob Storsholm, the Rio Tinto chief executive, said that the findings of this report have deeply disturbed him and can imagine how disturbing the report is for someone who reads it. While apologising, he said that he seeks apologies to each team member who has been a victim of bullying sexism and harassment. As per the statement issued by Jacob, he said that he feels ashamed of what is happening in Rio Tinto. In the future, Rio Tinto will implement appropriate action to address the concerns of the report. Also, it will make sure that, with the help of the management team's commitment to a safe and respectful culture at Rio Tinto in all of their areas. He also said that he believes they can make positive and lasting changes to strengthen their workspace culture. While, as on the other hand, Elizabeth Broderick said that the report is not a reason for reduced confidence in Rio Tinto. He also said that after the multiple interactions with the Rio Tinto leadership team, he could sense a desire for transformational and positive change. And that's the latest with the Breaking News Update. I'm Rose Jacobs. Thanks for joining me. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Hackers have stolen 80 million US dollars worth of crypto from Qubit Finance. Hey, and thanks for tuning in. Holy Shield here for Calcone Media. The DeFi platform became the target of hackers on the 27th of January. Qubit said on its Twitter handle that they minted unlimited XETH to borrow on BSC. It also said its team is working with the security and network partners on their next steps. Going to Peg Shield, a blockchain security company probing the hack, the cyber criminals made off with 80 million US dollars worth of cryptocurrency from Qubit's Cube Bridge. Over 200,000 Binance coins were stolen, marking this incident as the largest crypto hack so far this year. It's believed the Qubit team has directly reached out to the hackers to minimize losses for the Qubit community, offering them a maximum bug bounty to return the stolen funds. Analysts at Certic revealed that the culprits used Qubridge Protocol's deposit option for the robbery. The procedure was misled into assuming that they had made the deposit when actually they hadn't. Certic believes that the hackers repeated the act which converted all the assets to Binance coin. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other videos to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Calcai Media.
Property by Kalkine. Looking for a dream home? Well, that may sound easy, but it isn't. And from looking for a property that is the right fit for you in terms of cost and other factors, to zeroing down on the right mortgage plan, there are various aspects to consider. And for the latest slowdown in the property market, tune in on Calkine TV with me, Sage. I will give the latest updates on the property market as well as real estate stocks to help you make the right decision. Keep watching Property with Calkine. Known in the crypto world simply as CZ, Zhang Peng Zhao is a Chinese Canadian business executive who has a net worth of $68 billion. Zhao is best known for co founding the world's largest cryptocurrency exchange, Binance. So let's take a closer look. I'm Rachel Jones, and this is Calkine Media. The power of crypto and its undue influence on the world is not lost on people. It's changed so many lives. One of the great examples of crypto taking someone from rags to riches is of Shang Peng Zhao. Recently, the Bloomberg Billionaires Index revealed that the CEO of the cryptocurrency exchange platform Binance has a net worth close to 100 billion US dollars. He's currently the richest crypto entrepreneur in the world and also the wealthiest Canadian. He was born in China's Jingzhou province, his family moved to Vancouver in Canada when he was 12. He took many different jobs to help support his family, even working at McDonald's. He now ranks as the 11th wealthiest person in the world now, just a little behind familiar names such as Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates. Binance was found in China and was later banished from the country. The platform routinely facilitates as much trading as the four biggest exchanges combined. However, it's not without its controversies as it faces regulatory probes globally. Its heavy success highlights the vast scope the unshackled cryptoverse provides people with, but controversy has surrounded the firm nonetheless. In a recent 24-hour span, the platform completed $170 billion worth of transactions. For slower days, there are around $40 billion transactions. Now, if you like the information in this video, you can like, share and comment on it. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon for notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel signing off for Calcai Media. Hi there, James Preston for Calkine TV. Are you into gaming and virtual reality? Does AI and the endless possibilities it entails capture your interest? Or are you constantly trawling through the web to try and discover the latest updates and innovations in the tech space? Well, let us do the work for you. From the latest product launches to shocking affairs on the World Wide Web, exclusive interviews and information about the top companies like Apple and Google to brand new tech startups vying for your attention. Calkine's Tech Beat has the latest in what matters in the world of technology. Join me every single Thursday on The Tech Beat, exclusive to Calkine TV.
It's likely Australians could be paying more for tap beer if a new tax increase is passed on to the drinker. From the 1st of February 2022, the Australian Tax Office increased the excise duty rate per litre of alcohol by a factor of 1.021 to keep up with inflation. The Australian Hotels Association, Clubs Australia and the Brewers Association have launched a national campaign to cut the twice-yearly tax hike on draft beer, which comes into effect today. Australian tax office figures for draft beer sales in the first quarter, that's July to September of the 2021 to 2022 tax year, have shown the true devastating impact of the pandemic on Australia's hospitality sector. The figures show that pubs and clubs sold 40 million fewer pints of beer in July to September 2021 than they did for the same period in 2019 before the pandemic hit. That's a massive drop of over 50% in beer sales for struggling venues. After a horror year in 2020 where pubs and clubs lost over $1 billion in beer sales, Due to lockdowns and other restrictions, these latest figures from the ATO show that losses for 2021 could well exceed this. The ATO recorded 903,982 litres of alcohol as having been served in beers over the counter in July to September 2021, compared to 1,993,027 litres during the same period in 2019. Commenting on the analysis, Chief Executive of the Brewers Association of Australia, John Preston, is calling for the federal government to use the forthcoming federal budget to reduce Australia's fourth highest beer tax in the world to give pubs and clubs a fighting chance. He says they're very concerned that on the 1st of February, the Australian government will hit Australian beer drinkers with one of the biggest beer tax increases in more than a decade that it's not right and it's not sustainable. Other countries are reducing their tax on draft beer to give pubs and beer drinkers a break. It's hoped the beer tax can be reduced to help reduce the suffering of the hospitality industry. Now, if you like this video, you can like, share and comment on it. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel signing off for Kalkai Media. Welcome to the Expert Talks by Calkine TV. I'm Sage, and today's guest is Mr. Joe Rowitz, the founder, CEO, and architect of the award-winning blockchain business called Dragon Chain. Known as America's Blockchain and originally created at the Walt Disney Company back in 2014, Dragon Chain is a hybrid blockchain platform focused on solving business problems at an enterprise scale. So Dragon Chain holds multiple cornerstone patents on blockchain technology ranging from scalability, interoperability and enterprise process orchestration. And we'll find out more about these today and much more, so keep watching. Very excited to bring you live today, Mr. Joe Rowitz, founder and CEO of Dragon Chain. Welcome to the show, Joe. Hello. Thank you. <laughs> Great to have your company today, and I'm sure the viewers are keen to hear your insights. So let's get started. 
incorporated back in 2014, Joe. That is very early on in the history of crypto. Can you share the inspiration behind your brand, please? Ah, uh, yes. Um, well, I, I've, I'm a longtime architect, and uh, I had gotten into blockchain in 2010, and I, I was focused quite a bit on uh, the scalability and uh, ma making the technology work for a, a normal business. And uh, when Disney brought me in, uh, we started building in 2014. And, and uh, you know, at first we were called the Disney private blockchain platform. And uh, when we open sourced all of the code and released everything in 2016, uh, we had to come up with a name that did not include the, the, uh, the name Disney or any of their trademarks. And, uh, uh, you know, dragons seemed fitting for uh, Disney. Uh, sourced brand and uh you know we have a we have a nice mascot in fact you can you can see the uh the mascot here uh the old that's the oldest version but but either way it was a very uh friendly form of uh branding for uh what at the time might have sometimes been a little scary to some or at least very abstract technology so that was the gist of it that's fantastic. Thanks for sharing with us. So that was a very friendly yes. blue looking mascot dragon there and very yes. fitting for the metaverse and the development of blockchain um, as dragons may have been seen by some people and maybe not seen by others in the very distant past. So thanks, Joe. Great to have you on the show. As a sector leader, You've been ideating blockchain since the beginning, helping businesses now getting blockchain ready as this emerging tech makes its way into the mainstream. What services does Dragon Chain offer? Or wait, should I pose that differently? What do you not do? Because you're involved in quite a lot, I noticed from your website. <laughs> right. Um, it's very, uh, we, you know, we try to take a very agnostic, uh, industry agnostic approach. So we don't focus on a single industry at all. Um, we tend to, uh, focus on, uh, I, I guess, the, the platform side of the business where, you know, blockchain as a service, uh, which would include advanced types of tokenization. Um, we do a lot of scalability uh, work and, you know, bas basically making uh, real systems work with blockchain or, or leverage uh, blockchain for either proof or compliance proof or um, some of the more advanced uh, uh, capabilities are what I like to call behavior systems where, you know, if you look at the core uh, result of every single crypto out there, um, key, key uh, being Bitcoin itself, uh, is that the technology is obviously useful and valuable and very unique in influencing human behavior you know and in, in the case of bitcoin it's it's to get people to mine uh bitcoin um but in uh in a lot of the other systems that we've uh, we've built we're looking at more advanced ways to influence the way that people work with the system um and very you know both with the tokenization but also with uh, uh some other number of other things that we can plug in um and you know but we keep it we keep it very open that uh uh if there is a use case that someone might have uh, uh focused on these all of these various capabilities that blockchain can provide uh you know we're we're there so that that's great to hear because i think people are coming up with new ideas a weekly maybe even daily so it's great to hear that you right. do provide this type of service is it open globally or do you mainly focus on american clients definitely globally um we have actually we're, we do a lot we probably do more work uh outside of the u.s than inside but uh you know we're, we're u.s based uh but uh we we don't uh we definitely don't restrict anything we're, we're open to working with anyone Fantastic. Great to hear it. Well, a lot of our clients are APAC based, so hopefully you'll hear from some of them soon. So, Joe, please right. tell us a little bit more about your holy grail blockchain, I'm sorry, blockchain patterns. What does this mean yes. for Dragon Chain? OK, um, yeah, and we 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 went in there and you know, primarily we, we patented uh, a few of these things to protect ourselves because we knew we were uh, quite early and we knew with our architecture we had some uh, unique uh, potential 
to to build some of the things that people really you know uh, know uh, were going to be uh, important uh, like interoperability. Um, the, you know we we filed for that patent because our system was already implemented. It was already operational. We knew uh, that we could already do that and scale and uh, effectively. Uh, interoperate with a lot of different systems. In fact, we have uh, what we call out as four dimensions of different types of interoperability, all the way from uh, the typical thing that you would, that you'd hear about on uh, crypto Twitter, like uh, tokenization uh, interoperability, all the way to a functional utilitarian focused uh, interoperability between uh, traditional systems and blockchain. And we have a, a, a lot of really unique ways to handle that. Um, we also received a patent on uh, blockchain scaling, which, uh, although it's a little abstract, it, it actually defines the uh, use of an, uh, an objective measure of time as scarcity in a blockchain network. And uh, we've proven it out. It, it really works and uh, it's pretty amazing, but it's very abstract. It's very unique. It's kind of hard to describe. Um, and then we also have things like a smart contract orchestration, which because of our unique uh, model, uh, we can effectively tie smart contracts together into an advanced orchestration. So if you had, uh, you know, an enterprise business that uh, already understood in their infrastructure how to uh, orchestrate a process from beginning to end, which in might include, you know, lots of complexity, uh, we can model that entire process, including the human elements uh, with smart contracts. And it's very powerful and um you know we're just getting uh started uh with you know seeing how people are going to use it you know the, the entire uh reason that we built this is for the unanticipated things that people will come up with um you know to build on blockchain so it's pretty interesting absolutely i've heard that the technology and smart contracts can save a lot of businesses a lot of money if it starts operating in this new envisioned way so it sounds like the system's catching up with you joe sounds like you've been there waiting for all this to start to uh, unroll and unfurl around you and it's it's starting to happen so very exciting space to be watching and what dragon chains up to um, yes yes i mean i'll, I'll say the the uh we're, a lot of people will say it, we're very early, but I think, uh, you know, people who watch the price movements and things like that, um, it's sometimes hard to tell because it, it looks like uh, if you come from the financial world, it looks like a bubble. Um, if you come from the tech world, it it's very foreign to a lot of uh, uh, technology people. But um, I do think that uh, what we've seen is probably going to be a blip because once uh, a lot of the projects understand and realize the, the real fundamental uh, uh, use, you know, primarily in my, like in my opinion, again, on the uh, <clears throat> human behavioral components and how to incentivize people to follow a certain workflow. Um, it's going to be a radically different world because uh, there's, there are a lot of things that you can really make efficient with uh, by applying marketplaces you know where where right now people you know you think uh, uh in, in some situations there's no way to measure what really is a marketplace uh, it could be a political marketplace um you know between between groups inside of a company and once you can model that and really measure it um then everything can be much more effective and more transparent it's not even that it's uh, uh an issue where you're pushing people to do something that they wouldn't want to do. It is uh, uh, much more akin to opening up an objective and mer you know, uh, merit-based system that they can see how they can be rewarded um, and let them do those things that they, uh, that, they, that they can already do with a lot more fairness. So um, there's a lot of really neat applications coming. Yes, I've heard of some bridges being built now between NFTs and DeFi, which will hopefully create hopefully create more liquidity is what I'm trying to say. But Joe, very interesting points you just brought up there. Do you think that people's behavior with blockchain and cryptocurrency will be impacted or uh, influenced by whether they view it as an asset class or a commodity or emerging tech? Do you reckon, is that what you're saying, that their um, view of it may then influence the way they behave with this technology? 
yes, um, and it, it is, uh, it's hard to describe very quickly, but um, if you can imagine uh, that you lay out goals. So uh, you, you, you have a business or even a, you know, a simple website and you lay out some goals and normally you have to have moderators trying to push people to do things the right way or to train them to do things the right way. Um, but with a properly applied uh, blockchain or crypto system, you can take those really, those, uh, those, how do I say, sometimes complex, sometimes not uh, real world activities and tune them by uh, providing the transparency, providing the rewards, and then openly showing people what the what the rewards are that and and the uh, so you have the incentives and disincentives um, for various uh, actions, in, including things like security or uh, people trolling each other on the internet. Um, that you can effectively apply uh, apply behavior systems to those issues and clear up a lot of what you would otherwise um, have happen. You know um, and that maybe that is not the best way to describe it, but it's it's very interesting because it's it's all it's all combined. And uh, if you look at uh, the crypto space right now, uh, a tremendous number of people look at it in terms of uh, you know the charts and the numbers themselves, the uh, the price of Bitcoin, the price of Ethereum, the price of anything else, and that's all, that's always. Uh, going to be there and it's not a negative it is a positive thing um, especially to to gather attention but uh, effectively the fundamental uh, utility of those tokens is in my opinion far more important uh, because once that's tied in um, you could say that utility tokens applied to a project are you know if, if you want to look at it from a financial angle uh, or from that context that those tokens could effectively be a much more powerful uh, and much more direct indicator of the value of the, the uh, project itself because they're tied directly to the utility. It isn't like I can take a share of Apple uh, stock and do something with it. You know, I can buy it, I can sell it. But, you know, with uh, a, a crypto token, I can, uh, in many cases, not always, but in many cases, I can do something with it, which might be tied to DeFi, it might be a financial action, but it might be a totally um, a, 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 a transaction or action completely unrelated to any financials at all. It might literally be uh, like a token at a laundromat. I can go in and I can I can wash some clothes. I can take a token to the arcade. I can, I can play a game. Um, and when you tie those things to the tokens and make the tokens more advanced than uh, just a static thing that I can put in, and uh, uh, if instead I can have other measures, you know, how long I held it, um, how I used it in the past, um, how often I'm in the facilities, um, uh, all of those things can be taken into account and can reward me more with either mining or with uh, production of other tokens or uh, with better access to the system. Um, there are all types of really interesting advanced capabilities you can you can plug in. And we're just getting started. I mean, uh, uh, probably I'd say 80% of uh, my job over the past uh, few years has been uh, trying to figure out the best way to communicate these concepts that are uh, really abstract, right? And uh, you know, knowing that everybody has different uh, angles to look at at uh, this technology, um, it's it's really unique because you have you know you have extremely advanced technologists, and then you have people who are uh, very focused on the financials, uh, all coming together, and it's it's kind of messy, but uh, you know we're we're really we're moving far, so. It's taken a while. I'm I'm impatient, but <laughs> well, you've been there right from the beginning. Uh, I can see why. But uh, things are developing quickly, um, as we can see. A lot of people are jumping on board. A lot of institutional investment into the space, and yes. those emerging economies, the developing countries that are adopting the payment transactions, peer-to-peer -peer transactions of crypto. That's interesting to see because it is helping out those people. <laughs> Um, to gain access to this type of technology. But Joe, on that note, uh, do you think people with limited um, 
in knowledge or information about computer science will be disadvantaged as crypto develops into the mainstream more? I hope not. Um, <clears throat> a lot of what we're working on is focused more on, uh, I, I guess you could say the governance side uh, of things where you have people who understand either human nature or they understand uh, uh, a particular role in a system. Um, you know, uh, they might be a master at doing one thing in a system and they can effectively help tune the system to better do that one thing. Um, and, you know, at some level, uh, of course, you will need uh, software people uh, to, to implement those and, and integrate various things. But uh, in my opinion, a lot of uh, the issues that we have with uh, adoption and even scalability, oddly enough, um, in the crypto space uh, come from the fact that it is largely right now uh, uh, controlled by, I wouldn't say controlled by, but uh, influenced by engineers that aren't looking at the business aspects. So they're, they, they tend to get a little more dogmatic or religious about some of the technology. And, uh, you know, we, we try to, to step back and take a little more, uh, well, a little higher level view of things. And <clears throat> across the board, one of our biggest uh, goals that I think we've uh, we're still in the middle of it, uh, probably, but uh, but we've made great strides in simplifying the user interfaces on our systems uh, in a way that you do not have to be a technophile. You don't even have to like technology to use our systems. Uh, what we uh, you could go to Din Social and see uh, one of the probably the prime example of this. Uh, but there are others. There's Rainmaker um, and uh, there. Eternal, if you go to eternal.report, um, that <clears throat> it uses really advanced uh, forms of blockchain tech on the back end, but the front end is usable by a normal person. You don't have to have a hardware wallet. You don't have to have MetaMask installed. You don't have to have um, anything that a normal uh, crypto system would typically have. And yet people can use these uh, straight out of the box right away. Uh, it just feels like a traditional uh, website, um, but we're using all of this technology in the back end to do the things that really matter. And uh, there are so many different ways to look at that. Um, it's really interesting. And uh, that, that's been a huge goal because if you can't get normal people in and using this technology, it's going to take a lot longer to, uh, to, to build the adoption that we really need. Exactly, and that's why it's so important to have these dialogues and conversations with people like yourself, the experts right. who know all about it, and we're just helping to raise awareness of the ordinary folk who will hopefully one day also adopt this technology or, or just pique their interests a bit. So, Joe, Disney yes. has its own municipality currency for use in the park grounds. That's been going for quite a while now. And so it seemed like a perfect fit for crypto and blockchain to begin there. But these days, anti-money laundering, know your customer, it's all becoming a lot more important with these type of peer-to-peer -peer transactions too. How does Dragon Chain help to keep the crypto sector safe from cyber criminals, please? Okay, um, some of, we have a lot of different angles there. Um, uh, one of the primary things we did, which turned into our scalability patent, um, was the development of a technology focused around uh, measuring time on, on blockchain. And we, uh, our very first uh, capability that we plugged in on uh, with that was to, I wouldn't say train, but to, to, uh, to educate the people who were uh, Dragon Chain fans because they were already Disney fans. Um, and a lot of those people we're not crypto people. So we were really worried because there were so many scams going around in you know, 2016, 2017, 2018, and people lost a lot of real money. So we put this system in place to uh, effectively reward people with a measurable value um, for doing certain things that uh, vastly increased uh, their security, which you know, primarily moving their tokens to a hardware wallet rather than keeping them on exchange um and it turned into something that we could that we 
uh, plugged into our network to scale it. Um, and that's just one thing. We also have, uh, uh, I guess, a lot of what we look at is any of the um, fintech products that we provide, uh, where they are uh, a lot of times uh, focused on uh, fraud prevention, as an example, you know, and uh, with identity systems, uh, AML, KYC, um, that what we try to do is to establish a, a framework where any business can come in from anywhere in the world and uh, work with their legal team or whatever they already have uh, uh, down as a policy and effectively codify that into smart contracts, um, which with Dragon Chain is extremely easy. It's built to do uh, what would normally be very complex things like that on blockchain. Um, it's a very simple, a uh, uh, process to do that, but by codifying those, the great thing is, uh, no matter who you need to prove something to, you know, if you need to prove to a customer that you followed uh, the privacy uh, policy that you've uh, established with, with uh, you know, publicly or under GDPR or in the U.S. under CCPA, um, you can codify that, and you can prove to your own user uh, where they can end. I should say they can independently prove that you are following that policy uh, by just giving them that data. And it can be, you know, selective exposure. Hey, look, uh, you're, this is your data. You're about to delete it. I'm going to give you the all of these records and you can actually check uh, your these transactions all the way up to uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum and know that we're telling the truth. And it would cost us billions of dollars to lie to you about this. Um, and then you think about it on the other side, any other uh, KYC or AML or any other bank regulation that could be attached um, can effectively be proven to the regulators or to the tax authorities that look we really did XYZ uh, as required and um, that becomes really powerful because it's all automated you know you you don't have to have uh, a thousand accountants in um, in a room to uh, to be able to pull together that data um, and and What's better, uh, whoever you are uh, providing that data to, uh, does not have to trust you. They can, you know, they can view the data, they can view the circumstances, and uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, more detailed nuances to it um, and proving that data and having data quality. But uh, the fact that it's on chain and the fact that we can scale it to uh, make it uh, inexpensive uh, uh, to put on chain uh, means that you can prove anything that uh, might uh, be a risk right now in a traditional business so and then you know it could go into identity there 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 are very amazing things uh we built a system in uh 2019 related to covid that was effectively using decentralized uh identity uh platform to let someone prove to their boss uh that they uh, had uh, either had the proper tests or whatever was necessary without exposing anything of the medical data. So we were able to, to uh, in the US, uh, have a HIPAA compliant uh, system uh, very quickly uh, because it was decentralized. So, you know, I could show to you that my score is a certain amount, which uh, has a threshold either provided by the state or the company to say, okay, you can come into work. Um, without exposing my actual medical data, what my test results were, um, if I'm vaccinated, anything else. So there's some neat stuff there. And, you know, we do a lot of that, but it's it's very typically uh, a little bit um, counterintuitive. <laughs> well, I'm hearing you. What you're saying there sounds very interesting about blockchain itself being public ledger and a record keeping system that's open source. It sounds great. So Joe, what about the future trend predictions? Quantum computers aren't that far away. How impactful are the regulators going to be? Like, do you find clients are hesitant because they don't know what the regulations are going to do and how much they're going to stir things up? Or is it because by jumping on the blockchain, do you think people feel that they may be isolated in a separate universe that's not yet part of the real world? Um, what are you finding right. from your clients? Um, it, it looks uh, to us like uh, behavior systems are uh, a golden ticket. They're they're uh, they're so powerful and so effective. And when people see them, 
they don't even know they're in place. They, they just tend to work. And so it becomes a very organic, very natural way uh, to, to build these capabilities into what your real business goals are. You know, not coming up with, oh, we need to get into crypto, so let's uh, put together some NFTs and sell them, which, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. But you think about what could really be done in the, uh, you know, the, with the main mission of a company, it's remarkable. So I, I think that's uh, really where things are be go will be going. Um, there are a lot of other trends. There's definitely decentralized governance, which in my opinion is even a really good key component of building behavior systems um, because the, uh, the more uh, influence that your best users have on the future developments of your systems, uh, the better off you're going to be. Um, you, your systems would be more efficient. They'll be more natural. They'll be far more powerful than your competitors, and um, that's that's a big big part of what uh, what I see coming. Um, there are, of course, a lot of other uh, u utilities that will be added, uh, even with some of the NFT projects that are going on. Um, I think, uh, and it's an interesting world, but the the gaming uh, world is there's a little bit of pushback right now on some of the play to earn and nft modeling that's going on but it's it's interesting because i think there might be <laughs> we might need a little more time before some of it rolls out but there are some intensely important capabilities that can be added to traditional gaming uh platforms that i i, I know are coming but I, it might be another um another season before we get to that so We'll see. Great. Well, thank you so much for sharing your valuable insights. Really found that very informative and interesting. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And viewers, if you just joined us, we just had a very interesting discussion with Dragon Chain CEO and founder, Mr. Joe Rowitz. Please watch the full interview at Calkine Media's YouTube channel. And keep watching Calkine for more of these expert talks and live market updates. And as we say, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Good afternoon and thanks for tuning in. You're watching The Penny Fix here on Calkine TV. First up, these small cap stocks are showing a V-shaped recovery from last month's sell-off. While the benchmark ASX Small Ordinaries Index continues a four-day winning streak and up 1.32%. With that said, let's have a look at two ASX penny stocks which are grabbing investor attention today. Well, the first of which is Brockman Mining, trading on the ASX under the ticker BCK. Brockman is listed on both the Hong Kong and the Australian bourses with a market cap of $426.8 million. The company operates in two key projects with Western Australia, that is the Marilena project and the Off Palmyra project as well under the BJ agreement with ASX listed mineral resources. And notably, Mineral has been granted a port capacity allocation with the Government of Western Australia for a new iron ore export facility. 
That was announced by Brockman yesterday after the market closed. And the allocation for a new iron ore export facility at Stanley Point, Berth 3 in Southwest Creek within the Inner Harbour at the port of Port Hedland. The new iron ore export facility remains subject to various relevant approvals and agreements to develop and operate, along with a positive final investment decision by Mineral Resources and Hancock as well. If Stanley Point Berth 3 is developed, Mineral Resources is aiming to ship at least 20 million tonnes of iron ore per annum from this facility. Triggered by the, the, the development, Brockman Mining shares shot up by 93.13% today to trade at 0.064 cents. And the next penny stock to have a look at is Avitro Biotechnology, which trades on the ASX with the ticker code AVE. Now, Avitra, formerly known as Phosphogenics, is a $23.89 million biotech company working to develop human and animal health products using its patented drug delivery system, tocopherol phosphate mixture. Today, investors rushed to buy its shares as the company has entered into a product license and supply agreement with none other than Team SAAS. Now, SAS Group LSC is a U.S.-based software-as-a-service portfolio company. The agreement is granting Team SAS exclusive rights to commercialize a recreational cannabis distillate containing its patented drug delivery system. This agreement signals a strategic step towards Avitro's ambitions in increasing the breadth of cannabis products and market leveraging TPM formulations. And this will occur parallel to its existing work to register its CBD soft gel products for sleep indications with the Therapeutic Goods Administration in Australia. So due to high demand, Vitro Biotechnology shares surged 23.08% to 0.016 cents. Now that is a wrap for now on the Penny Picks, but tune in next time for more Penny Stocks coming your way only on Calkine TV. This is Holly Shields signing off. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Kalkine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Kalkine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Kalkine TV. Welcome to the Expert Talks by Kalkine TV. I'm Sage, and in today's episode, we have a special guest, Mr. Simon Harmer. He's the founder of Thursday. And Thursday for the Curious is a design studio that this creative entrepreneur has imagined, and Thursday is a multidisciplinary agency consisting of branding, digital, graphic designing, and much more, which aims to create clarity for brands and businesses from the strategizing right through to the digital implementation. So keep watching to find out more and excited to bring you live today, Mr. Simon Harmer, founder of Thursday. Welcome to the show, Simon. Hey, Sage. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And it's only Tuesday, so we're in for a bonus treat here <laughs> to find out all about Thursday two days before. So, Simon, you've been in the creative industry for about 20 years. Your opinions are obviously going to be valuable for today's show. How has the branding and designing industry transformed throughout these two decades? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I suppose in, in many respects, not a lot has changed because fundamentally, good design, good branding um, will always be the same uh, and they'll always have value. Uh, I suppose when I look back, over those 20 years, you'd say the biggest change has been digitization. It's been the internet. It's, you know, when I talk to my kids now and tell them that 20 years ago, the internet wasn't really much and uh, mobile phones weren't really around, they find it hard to believe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so I, I guess fundamentally for us, from a design point of view, it's more about how audiences interact with the brand now. It's uh, everything is digital. So back in the day, 
uh, when we started, uh, we were designing not necessarily for screens or mobile phones, and that's changed dramatically. And I think the way audiences now uh, interact with brands, if you look at the biggest brands in the world, you know, the Facebooks, the Googles, the Amazons, they're digital first brands. So that's been the biggest change for us, I think, fundamentally. But at its heart, branding and design is, is you know, it, it will always be fundamentally the same. It's the reason that, you know, some brands have been around for well, Coca-Cola is what 125 years old now, and it's still going strong. It's amazing, isn't it? It's just selling that idea to people that the brand will give you what you need. Thank you for sharing that, Simon. Yeah. And I think one of the one of the big changes was especially the ratio of a television. We're in 4K now, I think, and before it was four by three, and all these sorts of changes have happened, including the internet as well. So running a business is, you know not easy at the best of times it's a 24-hour job really getting something off the ground so how can innovating and branding and strategizing help businesses to excel in a saturated market to optimally add value yeah it's a good question and i think that's probably what i've spent my entire career trying to convince people of is that um fundamentally design and brand at its heart will add value um and Obviously, I'm going to say that as a creative and as a, a design studio founder, but luckily there's lots of good research there to back me up. Uh, there's a wonderful company organization in the States called the DMI, the Design Management Institute, and they did this fantastic survey over a 10-year period uh, where they tracked what they call design-centric com uh, companies, companies that use design at their heart, and they, they monitored them against the, uh, the, 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 the top 500 companies in, in America. And they found they outperformed them by over 200%, which is phenomenal. And uh, in, in this country, we, we have a wonderful organization called the Design Council, who are always championing design. And they'll tell you that for every uh, pound you spend on design, you'll get 20 pound back. So I'm always telling clients, if you've got 100,000 pounds to spend on design, we can guarantee we'll get 2 million back in revenue. <laughs> so we know that fundamentally at its heart, design adds real value. That That's the key thing, I think. And what you really want from brand particularly is something that's unique and it's compelling for your audience. So I think by using, trusting a process and understanding what your audience wants and needs, and then making sure that your brand connects and resonates with that audience in a meaningful way will really add value. So trust it at its heart. That's fantastic to hear about the government incentivizing design like that. That's great. It really does give you purpose to do your job well and keep uh, England as a cutting edge leader in the design sector. So the B2B ecosystem is ever expanding as we know. Please share your insights on how one or a business can enhance their B2B marketing skills if you don't mind. Yeah, well, it's, it's really interesting, Sage, because um, the, the world of design and creativity that I've been in for 20 years gets ve is very closely aligned with marketing. Um, but I suppose the one thing I always talk to audiences about is that I'm not a marketing expert per se. I, I, I suppose my expertise is in creativity and design. But I, what I have known and what I've seen over the last 20 years is I've worked with marketers. They're, they're our key audience here. So we typically work with marketing directors, with marketing managers and brand managers. And I think what I've seen in those 20 years is some traits that um, I think really add value, if you like, to that person's role. So the people that seem to do really well in their roles are people that firstly, fundamentally, they understand their own brand, they understand how it works, and they understand their marketplace. So uh, the, the sector they're in, but also what their competitors are up to. And the key thing there is they really, really understand their audiences. So they've spoken to them, they, they connect with them regularly and they understand what they need. That's the first thing. The second thing we always think here is it's about trust. So developing a really strong relationship with your agency or your internal team. The best work that we ever produce is with marketers who really trust us as the experts in design and we trust them to know their marketplace. So that's the other thing. I think there's a, to have a real desire to grow and to learn is really important, probably in any industry or in any role. So people are always striving to learn more, to grow, to read, to watch wonderful shows like yours and, and connect with other people in that ecosphere so they're doing more. And finally, once they understand that, it's about sharing that knowledge with others and helping others to grow as well. So those, I think, are the kind of key principles if you're looking to do really well in marketing. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for breaking it down in a nutshell. Now, I understand you're in Winchester and that's close to London, but it's not exactly in London. Is that correct? 
Yeah, not too far, uh, less than an hour away. Lovely. And so coming from a city or a ge geographical location like that, how does branding and design um, change? Like, do you feel that to create value that you do need to find a way to link the future prospects with the traditions of a place and so people can have something to bond them to values and, and the creation of culture through branding? Yeah, I think um, place is really interesting. It's something that we've been thinking about a lot here from a brand point of view that a lot of people look to London as the, the, as the kind of hub for finance, for design and creativity. Mm -hmm. um, but we're, one of the things that we're keen to do here at Thursday and have been for a long time is to, to really put Thursday on the map as a, a kind of center for excellence for design, design thinking and creativity. Uh, so that's really important. And I think, you know, I suppose branding at its heart needs to do that. Uh, and it'd be great if we could rebrand Winchester at some point and, uh, and put that on the map. But yeah, so um, I think place is important. Um, but yeah, we're, we're a relatively small country compared to you guys. So, um, you know, what's, what's probably a trip up the road to London for you is it, it, it could be a bit of a trek for some people. Mm, true. Well, thank you so much for sharing that question aside from the discussion. Back to the mainline discussion, branding and design can be subjective at times. So Thursday, how do you ensure that meaning that you provide while branding for the clients holds significance for your target audience, please? Yeah, it's a great question, Sage. I, I think the thing I always come back to, and this is quite hard for me because I'm a creative by heart, I trained as an illustrator, is, is process. That's the key thing. Uh, you've got to trust the process. You've got to find a process that really works. We use a very strong design thinking process here, a kind of double diamond process. And, you know, we always talk about the idea that creativity and creatives can kind of be a bit wacky and they go off and it's all right brain stuff and, you know, coming up with loads of ideas. What process does is it kind of hones that in and it gives it real purpose, particularly from an audience point of view. So, what you'll find is that a really strong branding process at its, at its beginning will do lots of insight and research. It will talk to the audiences, it will look at competitors, it will look at the marketplace, and it will really understand that first before we then come in on a, on a, position, a strong and unique positioning for that brand. So, you know, we might take Calkine and we'll say, okay, what is it about Calkine that's unique? What are all the competitors saying? We'll talk to your audiences, and then we'll create this very unique positioning and it's not until that point that we then let the creatives go on it that's when they can do their magic so we know then that everything they're creating is founded in this insight and in this positioning so it has this really strong foundation really strong roots so then when you get to those areas around subjectivity which you can do you know inevitably and there'll be somebody in the boardroom who says but i don't even like orange why are we doing this orange and we can go back and say well at its heart, you know, th this brand is all about energy and warmth and, you know, connectivity. And, and so orange does feel like the right color in that incident, instant, instance. So as long as we have that really strong foundation of insight and discovery and then a really strong brand position, we know that we can kind of hone in that subjectivity and we know that it's relevant to the audience. That's, that's the key thing, I think, instead of just going straight into creative. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. So setting up your boundaries and limits, but based on evidential data and what your clients' needs and wants exactly. are, I suppose. Yeah, that's so yeah, fantastic. Thank insight. you for breaking it down for us. So we have to wind up, unfortunately, although we're having a fantastic time having a chat to you today, Simon. Lastly, what are the plans for Thursday? What's in the pipeline for 2022? Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. We could uh, keep talking, but it, it's getting quite late here now, so they'll probably kick me out soon. <laughs> uh, 2022, well, do you know, it's been a, it's been a strange couple of years uh, in the UK and, and everywhere, obviously, and the industry as well as a whole. Uh, I have regular uh, monthly meetings with lots of agency owners in the UK, and for some people it's been very difficult. Um, and, and for some people, you know, particularly the digital agencies, they've really excelled. We do brand and digital here, so we've had a bit of both. I think for us it's about... Um, one of the key things is, again, focusing on Winchester, putting Winchester on the map as a center of uh, creative excellence. It's about continuing to doing amazing work for brilliant clients. We have really strong relationships with our clients here. And it's about positivity, I think. I think, you know, we've come out of this pandemic now. Um, let's use design for good. It has uh, such wonderful ways of adding value. Let's see if we can do that all over the world and for all of our clients and all of our staff. And I think also what we're really keen to do is really start to think about key things like sustainability and what design can do to solve problems like that as well.
Fantastic. What a great way to close off the discussion. Thank you for your time today, Simon. Really appreciate it. Absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. And if you just joined us, we had an inspiring discussion with Mr. Simon Harmer, the founder of Thursday, a design studio in the UK. Catch the full interview via YouTube at Calkine Media and keep watching Calkine for more live expert talks and market updates. Stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Has yet been no update on the developments related to the definition of being fully vaccinated in Australia. The Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation is still considering whether to change vaccination advice. The National Cabinet held a meeting to discuss if the definition needed to be changed as suggested by the Victorian Premier, Daniel Andrews. He was hopeful about getting approval on updating the definition of fully vaccinated. He has said that the third dose of a booster vaccination is mandatory for everyone as the state reopens schools. He believes that full vaccination should be three mandatory vaccine doses to combat the COVID-19 infection even if cases reduce. He hopes to change the definition by seeking approval from the National Cabinet and the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation, that's a government department. However, the National Cabinet has refused to approve this request as the ATAGI is yet to finalise if a third dose is mandatory for all. So what are other leaders saying? Well, premiers and chief ministers in a meeting of National Cabinet recently expressed that they expected a steep rise in daily infections when schools returned for this year. They also reported decreased pressure on the hospital systems in terms of admissions and intensive care numbers. The definition of an essential worker remains similar to the older one. The leaders have also agreed to consider any recommendations provided by the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee in Daniel Andrews State of Victoria. The number of active cases have approximately fallen by 53% over the past few days. Australia's number of active cases has dropped by 51%. Now, if you like this video, you can like, share and comment on it. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can also press the bell icon to get notifications for our latest videos. I'm Rachel signing off for Calkine Media. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. Amid the market turbulence caused by US rain hikes and inflation concerns in the UK, some stocks are shining as investor favourites. Hey, and thanks for tuning in. Holly Shields here for Calcine Media. Let's take a look at the seven most bought FTSE shares recently. The first of which is Unilever. 
a multinational consumer goods company. The market cap of Unilever stands at £98.5 billion and it's given a return of approximately negative 12.66% to its shareholders in the last one year. Next is Lloyds Banking Group. This is one of the UK's biggest financial service companies and it's expected to gain from the soaring inflation and the Bank of England's rate hikes. The market cap of Lloyds stands at £37 billion and it's given a return of about 55.67% to its shareholders in the last year. Then number three on our list is Scottish Mortgage Investment Trust. Controlled by Bally Guildford & Co, this investment trust has a holding in the American aerospace company SpaceX. The market cap of Scottish Mortgage stands at £15 billion and has given a return of about negative 19.56% to its shareholders in the last one year. Next is Canadian Overseas Petroleum, an oil and gas company that creates value through acquisitions, explorations, development and the optimization of producing assets in North America and in Sub-Saharan Africa as well. The market cap of the company stands at £49.69 million and it's given a return of 25.75% to its shareholders over the last year. The last stock on our list is THG, also known as the Hunt Group. This British e-commerce company operates over 100 international websites that takes brands directly to consumers through its proprietary e-commerce platform. The market cap of the company stands at £1.6 billion and it's given a return of approximately a negative 81.44% to its shareholders in the last one year. And that concludes our list. Now that you're up to speed, check out some of our other news to stay up to date. I'm Holly Shields for Calcane Media. Tune in to get the latest information. Whether it's about market movements or the currency graph. Sectoral coverage or industry news. We cover it all on our news segments. Be on top of the latest news with Calpine TV. Hello, I'm Rachel and I welcome you all to Executive Corner Expert Talks. Today I'm speaking with Evgeny Lekhodin, the founder and CEO of Clause Match. Now, Clause Match is an award-winning reg tech company that enables heavily regulated organizations and other regulated companies to run their businesses safely and to help them meet compliance obligations. Here at Calkine, we bring you industry leaders, successful business owners, market and equity advocates, all under one roof to help you discover the insights of the stock market and help you understand how you can create multiple passive income streams. Welcome to you today, Evgeny. Hi, Rachel. Thank you very much for having me. Good to speak with you today. Now, Clause Match has been selected as one of the world's most innovative red tech companies of 2022. And this is not the first award that you've received. What do you believe makes Clause Match distinctive in the market? Absolutely. Uh, well, with Clause Match, we worked for many years on our technology, and uh, our technology really. Um, originated from my personal experience in the banking sector, where I worked on implementation of various regulations. Um, and a compliance department is an extremely manual, um, has an extremely manual workflow. And the way they work uh, really is via documents, Word documents, PDFs, uh, Excel uh, spreadsheets, and SharePoint. Uh, we combined all of that experience into a single platform, enabling real-time collaboration, creating structured data, a governance process around those doc around the content in those documents, and then applying machine learning and natural language processing to understand how that compliance content links and interacts within the organization. 
And as financial institutions have been dealing with the rising tide of regulatory changes brought about by remote working and increased use of digital channels after COVID-19, how has the RegTech industry performed through these changes? Well, we, we have seen a huge um, demand for RegTech technology. Um, it's been driven by people suddenly working from home remotely and suddenly departments that don't have any tools uh, to track uh, the work and to track what they're working on um, and to interact with each other. Uh, in those departments, communication broke. And in compliance, it's extremely important because uh, obviously with compliance, this is something that makes or breaks an organization. Um, and regulators are demanding more data. Regulators are demanding to see how processes work within the organizations. And without collabor co collaboration tools, it's very difficult to show. It's very difficult to show how an organization is complying uh, with certain obligations um, and how they're enforcing those uh, obligations and how they're communicating them to employees. So the whole cycle of mapping your obligations to internal policies, procedures, controls, checking that they're effective and actually communicating them to employees is extremely difficult without technology. And obviously innovation lays the road ahead for any business in the present world. How far has ClauseMatch come in terms of innovating its technology and techniques? Well, on the face of it, our technology it can be seem simple. Uh, we enable real-time collaboration and content with governance layer on top. Uh, but we applied that technology specifically uh, in compliance and regulatory field. Uh, so compliance officers, regulatory uh, teams can work in real time together on documents, keep the audit trail. Um, and then once we realized we have a lot of structured data behind those documents, um, suddenly we, we can see how a particular obligation from a regulation relates to internal policies, procedures, processes, how they are communicated to employees. We can use that data to train the models um, and then to start understanding what are the obligations in a 2000, uh, 2000 page regulatory document and what the impact of that regulatory document is on internal uh, processes, policies, and procedures. Now, for people who haven't embarked on their journeys of the new era of policy management, what would your advice be on how they can streamline their policy management? I would say it's a journey uh, for many of our clients. Um, one of the analysts actually uh, created a maturity model of policy management. It goes from one to five. And we find that a lot of our clients are on level one. And to reach level five is actually quite difficult. But uh, we see where the organizations which are prioritizing compliance and specifically they understand that policies are at the heart of the organization. Policies show how the organization behaves. They show the culture of the organization. They, you know, they uh, that's how organizations enforce compliance with uh, employees. Um, so prioritizing those projects and then centralizing policy management uh, because in most companies that process is not centralized. Every department is using their own tools and they're creating policies in a very different way. So if I'm a new joiner in a company how do I know where to go and what applies to me and how, how am I supposed to behave in, in, in the organization? It's very difficult. Um, and no matter who I speak to, uh, they typically say, I have no idea. So centralizing that entire process, that's a step one, really. And then creating a project and then really prioritizing it. And then finding a technology which will help to streamline that process. Um, it's not enough anymore to send a word document to 50 people saying, can you please comment and then get approvals on that document and then somehow communicate it to employees once it's approved in six months. You lose all of that audit trail behind the process of creating that document um, and communicating that document. And then also 
not tracking engagement uh, with those documents means that when the regulator wants to see, well, actually, has that employee read that particular policy as it was applicable at that particular date? It's very difficult to recreate that audit trail without any technology. And just finally, what do you expect from the performance and growth of the regtech industry for this year? Well, this year is going to be a big year for regtech. Uh, we have seen a lot of changes in the industry, not just financial industry, but generally globally. Uh, we're seeing that uh, ESG policies across the globe are now being implemented. Um, they're implemented across the supply chains as well. So we're feeling that as well as a tech company, we're servicing large global banks and they're now, all of them have asked us, what are your ESG policies? How often do you update them? Do you comply with them? Can you show us compliance? Do you have evidence? So all of this is forcing uh, a lot of industries to start complying with regulations which were only previously applicable to uh, large global organizations or large global banks. Um, and another trend is obviously uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, we're seeing cryptocurrencies are here to stay. We're seeing that uh, large financial players are entering the market and we're seeing that regulators and governments are very interested in regulating that industry. Um, and we're, we are going to see a lot of changes with that industry specifically driven by regulatory changes. Well, it's been great to have your time today. Thank you so much for the chat. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you. And with that, I will sign off for today, but watch the space for more. Till then, stay apprised and invest wise with Calkine. Tune in to stay updated while on the move. We will tell you where the crypto craze has reached. Where the property market is headed next. What the world is doing to become more environmentally friendly. Apart from tracking the daily market charter. Be on top of the latest news and announcements with Calkine TV. The TGA has approved the use of the Pfizer booster dose for 16 and 17 year olds. Australian health authorities are urging people to get a third dose of the vaccine as soon as possible due to the increasing threat of the Omicron variant of the coronavirus. However, not everyone is on board. Vaccination clinics across New South Wales are reporting record low appointments for the booster jab, reflecting a dwindling interest in additional shots. However, this decision of the TGA is the first step of the two-stage process. The regulator has advised a particular time gap as well between doses, which has also to be approved by the Australian Technical Advisory Group for Immunisation. Nevertheless, with the new green light, Australia has joined the US, Israel and Britain in approving a Pfizer's booster shot for a younger age group. The majority of the adult population in Australia, that is more than 93%, are double vaccinated, while nearly 35% of those above 18 have received a booster dose. Earlier this month, health authorities began administering vaccines for children aged 5 to 11. They claim that a booster dose will ensure the protection from the first two doses is stronger and longer lasting, which will help prevent the spread of the coronavirus and its new emerging variants. The TGA has also advised that Australians who are qualified for the primary course of immunisation or the booster dose should make a reservation as soon as possible to get vaccinated. As it stands, Australia has already secured more than 151 million booster doses to be delivered in the coming year. More updates will follow. I'm Holly Shields for Calcine Media.
Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Holly and you're watching Kalkine TV live from Sydney. This is the last show of the day, the last trade. Well, first up, the S&P ASX 200 closed up today, gaining 81.7 points or 1.17%. Top performing stocks in this index were Champion Iron up 5.99% and Auckland International Airport up 5.22%. Over the last five days, the index has gained 1.81% but is still down 4.79% for the last year to date. Today, the Australian shares opened on a higher note though as the central bank held its cash rate at a record low in a meeting on Tuesday while ending its bond buying program. The market held steady throughout the RBA Governor Philip Lowe's speech at the National Press Club, where he indicated that it was plausible that the interest rates may just rise this year. Then the positive closing of Wall Street also supported Aussie investors' sentiment in today's opening session. The benchmark ASX 200 index was trading 0.58% or 40.5 points higher in the morning trading session. Maintaining the uptick, Australian shares stayed up 1.3% one hour before the closing session as well. And today, Champion Iron climbed 5.3%, while Pilbara Minerals as well, 4.5%, I should say, and Alchem 4.4%, and Fortescue Metals as well, 36 Computer Shed jumped 5% as well. But then on the flip side, shares in Block fell 4.7%, and Zip as well dropped 3.6%. Now, to crude oil prices, where they were nearly stable yesterday upon expectations that OPEC and its allies can boost supplies for the coming months, which could ease the ongoing supply crisis in the market. April delivery Brent crude oil futures were up 0.06%, whereas March delivery WTI crude oil futures traded 0.31% up as of the 2nd of February at 12.46 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time. Oil watchers are eagerly waiting for the OPEC Plus monthly meeting scheduled on Wednesday to decide the further increased output. Crude oil prices reached their seven-year high levels on Friday upon a supply shortage and political tension in the Middle East and as well between the U.S. and Russia concerning the Ukraine. Now for a look at some stocks that are making headlines today and first is Amcor which reported an increase of 12% in the first half of financial year 22 and net sales to 6.9 billion US dollars. The spike in sales was majorly attributed to price owing to a higher cost of raw materials. The company also announced a 12 cent US dividend and for CDA holders in Australia, they'll be entitled to 16.85 cents in Australian dollars. A bit as well for the reported period was up 5%. And then moving on, Energy Resources of Australia has revised the total cost of rehabilitation of the Ranger project to 1.62.2 billion Australian dollars. That's of course a significant upside revision from the previous estimates of 973 million. Costs associated with the additional water treatment, supplementary project management, and as well as scheduled delays were some of the key factors contributing to the cost overrun. Meanwhile, Janice Henderson Group has appointed Nelson Peltz and Ed Garden of Tree and Partners as independent non-executive directors, effective today. Peltz is CEO and founding partner of Tree and Partners, while Garden is Trian's chief investment officer. Trian is a significant shareholder of Janice Henderson and owns about 16.7% of its outstanding common stock. And then in other news, Hastings Technology Metals has received approvals from Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility for a $140 million loan. The company requires funding for the construction of the Yangabana Rare Earths Project in the Gascoigne region of Western Australia. Then the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility loan forms part of the $300 to $400 million total debt funding required by the company. And then moving on, Genworth Mortgage Insurance Australia expects the financial year 21 net claims to be between 5 to negative 15 million. The company also confirmed that unaudited total investment income was at a loss of 10.6 for 2021. 
So that Genoa is expected to release its final 21 results on the 25th of February. So that is coming right up. Well, that is all for now on the last trade for today. But tune in next time only on Calcine TV. This is Holly Shields signing off for the day. Hi, I'm Sage, and get ready to take the crypto ride with me on Calcine TV. Watch the crypto buzz every Tuesday and join the excitement at Calcine TV from Bitcoins to NFTs to Dogecoin and DeFi. We have updates about everything around these digital currencies. Understand the investing rationale and the risks involved in the space with me, Sage, on Crypto Buzz. Keep watching Calcine TV.